everybody. I now call this meeting of the Anchorage Assembly to order. Tonight is August 8th, 2023. It's 5.04 p.m. Madam Clerk, would you please take the roll? Mr. Myers? Yeah. Mr. Martinez? Present. Mr. Rivera? Present. Could Mr. you say Rivera? that again, Mr. Rivera? Present. Thank you. Ms. Bronga? Here. Mr. Johnson? He's excused. Mr. Constant? Here. Ms. Zalatel? Here. Mr. Cross? Here. Mr. Boland? Happy to be here. Ms. Brawley? Here. here. Mr. Salt? Here. Mr. Presbyria? Here. You have a quorum. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, next, Mr. Salt, would you please lead us in the pledge? Yes. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Martinez, would you please read the land acknowledgment? A land acknowledgment is a formal statement recognizing the indigenous people of a place. It is a public gesture of appreciation for the past and present indigenous stewardship of the lands that we now occupy. It is an actionable statement that marks our collective movement towards decolonization and equity. The Anchorage Assembly would like to acknowledge that we gather today on the traditional lands of the Denina Athabascans. For thousands of years, the Denina have been and continue to be the stewards of this land. It is with gratefulness and with respect that we recognize the contributions, innovations, and contemporary perspectives of the Upper Cook Inlet Denina. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. I'll roll back <coughs> up the calendar to the roll, Madam Clerk. Mr. Tyrell. Here. Thank, Thank you. you. The youth member is also present. Next, we'll go to item number four on the agenda, minutes of previous meetings. We have minutes uh, from several meetings. It's items 4A, 4B, 4C, 4D, 4E. Regular meeting March 21, 2023. Continued regular meeting March 21, 2023. Continued to March 22, 2023. Special meeting April 7th, 2023. Regular meeting April 11th, 2023. And special meeting April 18th, 2023. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. We have a motion by Ms. Zalatel, seconded by <clears throat> Mr. Cross. Any discussion? Hearing none, is there any objection to adopting? Hearing none, those items are adopted by unanimous consent. Next on the agenda, Mr. Mayor, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, everyone. It's great to see you here tonight. I want to begin with my thoughts on AO 2023-65S. I am an avid bicyclist and support improving safety and making our streets more accessible to all road users. I believe this AO would help make Anchorage more friendly to all road users. And I am encouraged that safety has improved in states that have implemented the Utah Red and other elements of this measure. So many residents and families in Anchorage so many residents and families in Anchorage enjoy riding bikes to work and for enjoyment, and it makes sense to look at ways we can improve safety and make our roads friendlier to all users. I look forward to seeing what action the Assembly uh, takes, and we'll consider it carefully after hearing from APD and the, and the public comment. Now, last week I got an awesome opportunity out at the Anchorage Fire Department Training Center to participate in some training with firefighters on the newly arrived 100-foot-tall Rosenbauer Commander aerial ladder trucks. There's two of them. These units represent the cutting edge of fire apparatus technology and are, key investment and are a key investment in our public safety infrastructure. The units are specially designed to support firefighting and rescue efforts at fire scenes. They will go into service later this month after crew training and the mounting of tools and equipment into the units. And finally, last week we had a U.S. Congressional delegation come to Anchorage where I was able to meet with six Congress members to include Representative Trent Kelly from Mississippi, Representative Scott Desjardins from Tennessee, Representative Ronnie Jackson from Texas, Representative Robert Adderholt from Alabama, Representative Vincent Gonzalez from Texas, and Representative Claudia Tenney from New York. 
this bipartisan delegation and I were able to talk about the Port of Alaska and the importance of securing federal funding to keep us on track to restoring it to be operational and seismically resilient for years to come. We are going to host another congressional delegation visit this week at the Port of Alaska where we will take them around in the boats to show them the repairs that are needed. I know the Anchorage Assembly stands in agreement that funding and repairing the port is crucial to the people of Anchorage and Alaskans across this state. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Alatel. Thank you. Um, thanks for the report, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm excited to hear the congressional delegation is coming up to view the port and its um, desperate needs. Um, is there any opportunity for assembly members to join you in um, providing information and advocacy with that delegation? Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Um, Colby's not here, but um, if, if you want, yes, certainly. We would be happy to do that. Uh, 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 Secretary of Transportation, um, Buttigieg is going to be here as well. I think he's got several meetings set up. And so, uh, yeah, anything you need, we'll make that happen. Thank you. All right, next on the agenda is the chair's report. <clears throat> so I will start again with the Port of Alaska. I want to celebrate this major step forward that we took at the last meeting. Uh, those of us who've been on the assembly for some years have been working for a long time to get this project back on track and it's rewarding to see all that is now on tap to be accomplished. I want to thank particularly the port staff and the users who've been there every step of the way as well as the mayor and new assembly members who've joined the team more recently and have had to really drink from the fire hose to try to understand and grapple with the issue. I also want to thank the Alaska Legislature for their strong financial commitment and also Senator Lisa Murkowski personally for her stalwart support. This once in a generation project will be a legacy that we give to the future and we can all be really proud once it's built. And next, you may see in the news, we recently gathered to celebrate the new and soon to open housing facility at the former Barrett Inn. In only a few short years since 2021, the Assembly has invested a lot of funding to provide assistance to keep renters and homeowners housed during the pandemic and to open up new housing facilities for extremely low income people. Thanks to these investments of federal COVID relief funds and alcohol tax dollars paired with private and nonprofit support, we've added 330 new units of low income housing in the past two years and literally kept 60,000 people in their existing homes. Think about that. 60,000 people were helped with those funds. This unique work was recognized by the, with the 2023 HUD Secretary's Award for Public Philanthropic Partnerships, which recognizes excellence in partnerships that have been transformed, that have both transformed the relationships between the sectors and led to measurable benefits in housing and community development. So while our community continues to struggle with the issues in our streets and in our neighborhoods, and the effort to find a vision forward that we can all share and build towards. It's excellent to identify the fact that we have been putting online new housing units for people across the community and that we are now working on figuring out solutions for a permanent year-round low barrier shelter. This is a reminder that when we work together we actually can make a big difference. So next I could take this part of my report and I could be angry or I could be kind of mocking, but instead I'm just going to read. Mr. Mayor, we want to thank you for taking the opportunity over the last two to three weeks to meet with the media and for the first time since you've been in office, really make an op opportunity available to the reporters to cover the work of the city from your perspective. But there have been a few things that have to be clarified. So. Effectively, you have said to the media that you're waiting for the assembly to produce a shelter plan. Quote, that's a question for the assembly. What are their plans for a shelter in the winter? The source of this story is an article titled, Two Years in His Tenure, Anchorage Mayor Reflects on Homeless Policy, Shelter Plans, and Assembly Relationship, Alaska Public Media. I want to make sure everyone understands, per AMC 16.120.010 Part B, it's not the assembly's job to come up with the plan, it's the mayor's. The Assembly's job is to set the policy and to approve funding. Without a viable plan or viable funding source, there's nothing for us that we, to approve. Another statement was made about the port. 
quote, I took that project and the engineering and the designing and the building of it and kind of reassigned it to a different group, to an engineering firm actually that's built ports before. That would be Jacobs, and they've got a lot of experience and that's got us back on track, I think. Source of that article is also two years into his tenure, Anchorage Mayor Bronson reflects on homeless policy, shelter plans, and assembly relationship, Alaska Public Media. So Jacobs Engineering has been on board as the project manager for the Port of Alaska project well before this administration was sworn into office in July of 2021. In fact, even before they became Jacobs, they were CH2M Hill, and they were working on this project with us since as far back as 2014. And so, uh, be, be, great for the record to reflect the fact that while there is great progress on the port, the engineering has been managed by Jacobs. Also, there seems to be some rewriting of history going on. Thankfully, the public record exists. Here's what the facts have to say. The mayor sometimes says he supports housing first and other times not but at a press conference for the Barrett Inn opening as extremely low income housing, the mayor was quoted as saying, I've always supported these kinds of efforts. The record of these meetings shows that the mayor actually vetoed the funding for this project, that the assembly funded the purchase of the hotel to convert the housing with ARPA funds in summer of 2022, and this body had to override the mayor's veto of the project to keep the investments in Housing First alive. And in fact, this project was successful despite the efforts of the administration. Also, the mayor said, it's the law that we have a big shelter. Quote, we've got to build a large shelter because the law compels us to do that. That's also in an interview with Mayor Bronson acknowledges some missteps, conveys confidence in re-election Anchorage Daily News. Anchorage Municipal Code 16.120.020 Part D requires the municipality to provide emergency cold weather shelter. It does not have to be a large shelter, but we recognize that the mayor wants it to be. In fact, AR 2018-167 as amended, a resolution declaring a policy of dispersed placement in the Anchorage Bowl of services and programs for homeless persons. It's the policy of the municipality that small shelters be distributed across town, concentrating all offsite impacts of shelter on a single neighborhood and group of neighbors has a history of problems. Just look at Centennial Park, the Sullivan Arena, or now Third and Ingra. There is a lot I could continue. I won't at this time. I just want to say that I am grateful, Mr. Mayor, that you are now engaging with the media and we are here and ready to work. And when the need arises, we will correct the record as necessary, but it's not the best way. The best way is what's been happening now with the administration staff who have demonstrated a clear and compelling desire to work with the assembly. And so the tide is changing. Let's move forward. So I would also like to express in my report on the next topic that the congressional delegation this week sent a joint letter, all three members, Senator Murkowski, Senator Sullivan, and Representative Paltola, to Secretary Marsha Fudge, the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. And I want to again thank the Senators and our Congress member for taking a strong lead in helping us to right the inequity of what's happening with the funding streams that are coming into Alaska so, so sorely under-resourced compared to other jurisdictions with the same problem. We will definitely post this letter that the Senators and the Congress member sent to Secretary Fudge up on our website soon so you can see what they had to say. It's an amazing letter. I'll also say we are looking very much forward to Secretary of Transportation, Secretary Buttigieg, coming to town. This is a conversation that has been happening between the Assembly and the Secretary's office since 2020 when he was confirmed, or 2021 when he was confirmed into office. And the last thing I'll speak to in my report is this. This is the week that the Anchorage School District goes back into school. Teachers and students across the municipality will be filing in and education will begin happening again in our amazing school district. And I want everybody to think about that when they're driving through neighborhoods, contemplate slowing down, start practicing and making sure neighborhoods are safe where kids are walking to school. And to all of the teachers and students who are coming back to school, we wish you the very best of years. We hope you're able to get the most out of your education and the educational experience. So with that, 
I will move on to committee and liaison reports. We'll start with Mr. Martinez. Thank you, Chair. The Community and Economic Development Committee last met on August 3rd, and we had a presentation from the Heritage Land Bank, and we had initial discussions around uh, data dashboard for the committee working with staff. Our next meeting, it will be held on no uh, August 17th. We expect a couple of presentations from community groups, including the Anchorage Community Development Authority, who will be presenting on uh, expanding land trusts and uh, concepts around infrastructure development. We will also be continuing our discussion of vacant and abandoned properties. That meeting again will be held August 17th, 9 a.m. at the Permit Center. And I also would report that as the uh, liaison to the Anchorage Chamber of Commerce, the board meeting of the chamber just happened on uh, August 4th, and I've been requested to provide an update to the next board meeting for the chamber on our, the Assembly's housing initiatives and the uh, up-to-date on the alcohol sales tax spending, which is good news is we have all of this information available to us and the public via our website today, and I look forward to bringing that to the chamber. And lastly, we also had a discussion about organizing with the business communities of the Muldoon Corridor, and hopefully over the next few weeks to months, we will have uh, the first meeting of a Muldoon Business Advisory Group happening. So thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, all right, so uh, Mr. Myers, I should have started with you on the phone. Sorry, say that again, Chris. Uh, this is committee reports, Scott. Nothing to report. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rivera. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I am at the Alaska Municipal League Summer Conference this week and am attending today's meeting from was sunny Homer to now slightly overcast Homer. I look forward to reporting back to the body on the conference during a future assembly report. Um, the Housing and the Homelessness Committee will be meeting on Wednesday, August 16th from 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. at City Hall, room 155. There will be two main topics on the agenda. First, the 2023-2024 Emergency Cold Weather Shelter Plan will be the main topic. We've been working through this plan since June, and I look forward to seeing the results of the Anchorage Health Department's work. Uh, second, we're going to be getting a presentation from OCS and um, the Child Wel Welfare Academy at UAA about foster care and homelessness. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Rivera. Ms. Bronga. Thank you, Chair. I met um, with the Visit Anchorage Quarter 2 board meeting and market update on July 27th. Biggest takeaways is that our brochures, travel guides are nationally recognized. And this is exciting, uh, along with our hotel bookings being up by 32%, we have the most convention bookings in Anchorage, the highest level that we've had ever. Um, so that's great news. Government Relations Committee will meet next um, for Visit Anchorage on August 9th. Um, also on August 2nd, the Health Policy Committee met. We had a special presentation by Beth Rose and Jenny Loudon from Alaska Eating Disorder Alliance. They presented on eating disorders in teens, which can be exemplified by use of social media which displays unrealistic body images and pushes muscle building and diet pill supplements. Um, out of kids' hands is legislation which is being passed um, nationwide, which can put such supplements behind the counter. And we will look at the possibility of moving forward with something, uh, some similar legislation. Um, we also had a presentation from Ax um, APTA Alaska, which is providing physical therapy services for all Alaskans uh, despite uh, their income. And um, if you want more information about that, you can go to the Health Policy Committee on the Assembly page, and they have a contact number and email. Um, again, uh, our K director, Kim Rash, wowed us with all the facts, figures, and things that that amazing department is doing understaffed. Thanks so much. Thank you, Ms. Bronga. <clears throat> Mr. Johnson is excused, so we have Ms. Alatil. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this Thursday from 1 to 3 in City Hall is a Rules Committee meeting. Um, uh, and um, the following week on the 17th is an Enterprise and Utility Oversight Committee meeting of the whole from 11 to noon in room 155 at City Hall. And from 1210 to 110 will be the budget, budget and Finance Committee meeting of the whole. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Cross. Uh, thank you. Um, the Public Safety Committee meeting of the whole was actually delayed until tomorrow at 9.30 a.m., run 55. Uh, we'll be getting updates from APD, fire, as well as um, the Office of Emergency Management. Um, and I just want to uh, welcome Cameron perez Verdia. It's great to have you back. And so uh, as his co-chair, we'll, uh, if you're in attendance, that'll be tomorrow again, 1.55 at 9.30. Thank you. Mr. Volland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Nothing to report. Ms. Bronco. Brawley, the bees. It's okay. <laughs> um, so uh, I have two reports. Uh, first is the uh, Legislative Committee report. Um, so the Legislative Committee met on Thursday, August 3rd. We had our first meeting um, of this year getting organized. And um, the big topic of discussion was making sure that uh, we're, we, the Assembly, are working with the administration to streamline and improve um, our development process of the Muni's legislative program, which is what we use. Um, we adopt it every year in December, and that's what forms the basis for communicating the municipality's overall priorities to, uh, to the legislature. Um, and so we have a lot of great work to, to build on, um, good priorities already in mind, and so we're going to be working collaboratively with the administration uh, to develop those shared priorities. And then our next meeting is on Thursday, September 21st. And the second report excuse me, second report is um, for the Budget and Finance Committee. The next meeting will be uh, Thursday, August 17th from 1210 to 1 p.m. in City Hall, room 155. Uh, we will be continuing to monitor the city's financial status, including uh, looking back hopefully to um, the closeout of the 2022 financials and understanding where we ended at the end of last year, as well as looking ahead um, because we'll be starting the FY24 budget process very soon. And then um, another thing to note um, on the topic of finance, um, there will be a work session on Friday, August 18th uh, at 11.10 a.m. Uh, to discuss um, and answer some questions regarding AR 2023-182-S. Um, and so that is the, um, the proposal for the Navigation Center. And I just want to flag it because um, there were some important fiscal questions raised in uh, the S version of that um, uh, resolution as well as the work session that was held on that topic and on June 16th and so um, this is a request um, again from the fiscal perspective to the administration um, to uh, be prepared to answer those questions as we really want to evaluate this as a capital project in a future muni facility from that fiscal perspective um, so that includes the capital funding the ongoing operating budget that would be needed and operating plan for running that facility and I believe that is my updates. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Salt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, real quick, AEDC had the three-year annual outlook last Wednesday. Uh, mixed news as far as the Anchorage economy and where we're headed, but there are some silver linings in, in front of us with the uh, oil industry projects that are going to revitalize the industry for the next several years. The next meeting will be Thursday, September 7th. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Salt. Uh, Mr. Presidio. Thank you. Just a reminder that the Anchorage Equity Committee of the Assembly will be meeting um, on Thursday, August 31st at 4.30 in room 155. I encourage people to join. Thank you, Mr. Presidio. <clears throat> so next we have um, the addendum to the agenda. The addendum includes items to be added to the agenda and is prepared Friday before the assembly meeting. The assembly formally does this through a motion to incorporate the addendum as well as possible laid on the table items consistent with assembly rules of procedure. So before we get to the addendum, we're going to address the laid on the table items which incorporate any laid on the table items into the agenda. For the items that are not supplemental like an A or an S version or an AIM to an item that's already on the agenda, uh, an affirmative vote of at least eight members and an explanation that imme immediate assembly action is required or justified due to financial necessity, natural disasters, or when time is of the essence for assembly action on an item. So next, I'm going to go ahead and read into the record the supplemental items that I have, and then we will um, go through the motions on one item that uh, is not supplemental. So the first one, the 
we made a mistake when we were preparing the agenda and accidentally left someone off who had signed up for an appearance request and had the request granted. And so um, we're going to read the appearance request title into the record as Supplemental 9B, Michael Patterson. So that will be added to the agenda. Next we have what will be item 11C7, which is an AIM unnumbered to AO 2023-65S. Then under the 14s, we have 14A1, assembly information memorandum unnumbered regarding AO 2023-82. Okay, so just give me one second. Um, that's the new item. So the unnumbered AIM to item 11C, this will be 11C7, is AIM unnumbered 2023, AO 2020, Assembly Member of Holland, AO 2023-65 as an ordinance of the Anchorage Assembly amending Anchorage Municipal Code Title IX to promote safety, equity, and access to infrastructure for bicyclists and other vulnerable road users. <clears throat> so the next one under item 14A, so this will be 14A1, Assembly Chair Constant, AO 2023-82, an ordinance of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly formally dedicating approximately eight acres of municipal land, commonly known as the Upper Bench, and shown as a buffer zone located within the property legally described as Port of Anchorage Subdivision, Edition Number 2, Track J, as municipal parkland and subject to certain exceptions. So I believe those are the only items that are supplemental. Then we have one item that we'll need to take action on. So this is an unnumbered AM. This one will fall into the 10D section. I believe it will be 10D22 if members agree from the mayor's sole source contract with Alaska Department of transportation and public facilities for the planning, design, and right-of-way and construction of the Campbell Creek Trail Crossing at Lake Otis Parkway Parks and Recreation Department project not to exceed $160,085. So this one is not supplemental. Um, Move to lay on the table. Okay. Second. Motion to lay on the table by Mr. Cross, seconded by um, Ms. Alatel. Ms. Alatel? Um, thank you. Um, this is laid on the table because it's time sensitive um, and needs action prior to our next meeting. Thank you. Right, any discussion on this item? Hearing and seeing none, members may proceed to vote on the question. Shall we lay this on the table? Mr. Myers, how do you vote? Yes. Mr. Rivera? Yes. And the youth member? Yes. So on 11 to 0, that item has been introduced, and the youth member votes yes. So um, not introduced, has been laid on the table. Sorry. All right. Yes. So now I would ask for a motion to incorporate the addendum as printed and distributed and the laid on the table items. So moved. Second. Moved by Ms. Zalatel, seconded by Mr. Walland, I believe. And I would like to ask for unanimous consent. Is there any objection? Hearing and seeing none, the item has been adopted. So next we will move to appearance requests. Appearance requests. First one we'll have is uh, Pastor Marbury. Come on up. So there's a green button on that microphone. Or maybe it's yellow now. Changes sometimes. Welcome, Mr. Marbury. You'll have three minutes. 
All righty. Um, thank you for allowing me to come and speak. Um, if you have any prior information about our task force, uh, this brochure will show you, give you an idea of the history and the amount of groups that are related to this task force. And it started and founded in 1981. There was an incident with a black, person, black male that was shooting from his apartment and the police arrived and, and he was shot and killed. And the community got together and they uh, entered into an agreement uh, with the APD and the Department of Justice and come up with the Minority Community Police Relations Task Force. In 2007, it was changed to Anchorage Community Police Relations Task Force due to the diversity of Alaska. Okay, so we have additions to, on the back of the brochure of the groups that were involved, but additional groups is the South African Sudanese, along with the American Black, uh, African American, Hispanics, Alaska Native, uh, Thai, Hmong, Hmong, Polynesian, Korean, but the groups that were attending the meetings are Anchor School District, Police Department Chief, or uh, Deputy Chief, uh, Anchorage Fire Department, Equal Rights Commission, Alaska State Trooper, Federal Bureau of Investigation, Municipal of Anchorage, Attorneys, State of Alaska District Attorneys, U.S. Attorney's Office, UAA Justice Center, Division for Juvenile Justice, NAACP, uh, Interdenominational Minister Alliance, uh, NAACP, and um, uh, let's see, uh, Alaska Together for Equality, Identity, and Polynesian Association of Alaska, and Hispanic. So we have an agreement with a mayor every year, the mayor comes in, and we have history with each mayor, and Pastor Green is here, to verify some of the agreements that went on at that time. But when I was present from um, Mark Baggage and um, Dan Sullivan, when a mayor wanted us to deal with something that involved the community, also along with APD, we would get involved. But uh, this agreement has been breached and we want to come back and see how we are established with the assembly and the mayor again so we can go forth because there's some issues that, that have been brought and happened with the APD and the relationship has not been as close as it should have been and um, I'm looking to improve it. Okay. So uh, were you able to review any of the records prior to this meeting? Okay, I guess not. Well, we'll see next time. We'd like to have another meeting to solve any issues. Okay. Looking, looking forward to it, Pastor Marbury. Thank right. you. Thank you. Uh, Next, uh, we have 9B, uh, which will be Michael Patterson. Welcome. You'll have three minutes. I think, okay. Yeah, it's on. on. And of course, my phone dies right when I get up here. Hello. My name is Michael Patterson, and I'm an organizer with the Party for Socialism and Liberation. And I'm here today because for the past three years, PSL Anchorage has been organizing around police reform since the George Floyd uprising in 2020. And fr from the past three years, our experience has been this, that APD does not want to be held more accountable or be more transparent with the public. It was pretty obvious that when the voters approved body cameras and that APD was given control over the public process, it was shoddy, it was not very transparent, and it was just bad. Furthermore, recently, it's, I know today we're talking about purchasing some body cam or purchasing body cameras and talking about integrating the body cameras into the facial recognition ordinance. However, we still don't have a public timeline for when we're actually going to get these. There's nothing wrong with actually publishing an official timeline for us. And so, our past experience, so for the past three years, we've been working with family members who have had uh, their loved ones killed by APD. We've talked to other community members, and so in conjunction with PSL and these family members and community members, we've come up with three demands that we think will actually make APD more accountable. One, respect the vote. We need a public timeline of when 
all police officers will actually get body cameras. It needs to be published. The fact that it's been going on almost three years and we don't have it, and it keeps changing back and forth, is really just unacceptable and frankly anti-democratic. Two, respect the intent of the vote. The current policy around the, uh, the release of body cam footage when it comes to critical incidents is also anti-democratic and not what the voters wanted. There needs to be an automatic process for when body cam footage, when it involves deadly use of force, non-lethal force, the public has a right to see this footage. Three, we want an independent police review board that is totally divorced from the police department. It needs to be comprised of uh, residents and citizens of Anchorage that reflect the diversity of Anchorage. This board should have the authority and mandate to investigate criminal complaints against APD officers. It should also have the authority to terminate employment and also refer criminal complaints to the state of Alaska. You all have the ability to make these changes. I understand the administration lies with them to do a lot of stuff, but you all have the moral responsibility to do something because if you don't think a Ferguson or uh, a George Floyd or uh, Nicole Tyree or any of those things can happen here, you are not paying attention. People do not trust the police for very good and valid reasons, and you all have the ability to do something about it now because when something does happen, it's, all, it's just going to be on you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next on the agenda, we have the consent agenda. Consent agenda items number 10A through 10F are typically routine or non-controversial items such as bid awards, new business, information and reports, ordinances and resolutions for introduction. The items on the consent agenda may be approved or accepted by the assembly by a single vote on a motion to approve the consent agenda. Prior to approval, items may be polled by an assembly member for discussion and separate vote on each of those items. Under the assembly rules of procedure, all ordinances and some re resolutions will have an opportunity for public hearing on a future date. So now we'll go down the dais. <clears throat> so, uh, Mr. Presvordia. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to poll 10 Bravo 3, 10 Bravo 4, 10 Delta 1, and 10 Delta 9. Thank you, Mr. Salt. Oh, let me go through that again. It's 10 Bravo 3, 10 Bravo 4, 10 Delta 1, 10 Delta 9. Okay, thanks. Mr. Salt. I'd like to poll 10 Delta 17. All right, that's 10 Delta 17, Mr. Salt. Next, uh, Ms. Br Ms. Brawley. Yes, thank you. Uh, one item was already polled, so um, 10 Delta 18. Member Volland. Uh, oh, okay. Um, 10 G1. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Ms. Cross. My items are pulled. Thank you. Ms. Alatel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 10 Delta 14. And I believe my, the remaining items I had were pulled. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, Ms. Branca. Mine have been pulled, thanks. Mr. Rivera. Thank you, Mr. Chair, my item has been pulled. Mr. Martinez. Nothing further. And Mr. Myers. Nothing to pull. Mr. Terrell. Uh, no items. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to go back through the list now. We have 10 Bravo 3, Mr. Presverdia, 10 Bravo 4, Mr. Presverdia, 10 Delta 1, Mr. Presverdia, 10 Delta 9, Mr. Presverdia, 10 Delta 14, Ms. Zalatel, 10 Delta 17, Mr. Salt, 10 Delta 18, Ms. Brawley, and 10 G1, Mr. Wallant. Did I miss anything? Okay, thank you. Mr. Chair, may I, may I add a, one additional item? Yes, Ms. Brawley. Uh, thank you. Uh, could I pull uh, 10 Delta 22? Thank you. Mr. Chair. Yep. Uh, could somebody pull 10 Bravo 6? Mr. Coyce, yeah, please. 10. I'd be happy to pull that, Mr. Chair. Thank you. All right, so we added uh, 10 Bravo 6 by Ms. Zalatol on behalf of the manager. Okay, anything else? Nope, okay.
So I'd like to ask for a motion to approve the consent agenda minus the polled items. So moved. Second. So I have a motion by Ms. Zalatel, seconded by Mr. Bond. Uh, <clears throat> is there any discussion? Hearing and seeing none, I'd like to ask for unanimous consent. Seeing and hearing no objections, the consent agenda has been adopted. So for the public's information, the assembly has now passed or accepted all items in 10A through 10F, other than the items that were just pulled, which we'll take up next, or they've been introduced for a future public hearing, which are all of the 10G items. If you're here to see action on any item listed on the consent agenda that wasn't pulled, those items have now been passed or accepted by the assembly. It's an unusual night tonight. We don't have any recognition resolutions. So we'll just get straight into the business. <clears throat> First item is 10B1 AR 2023-247, a resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly stating its wave of protest to the renewals of State of Alaska marijuana licenses for marijuana manufacturing facility, the Frost Frontier M29054 retail establishment. Raspberry Roots M10097, the Frost Farms N10162, Midtown Roots M10190. Uh, what's the will of the body? Did I do the wrong one? Oh, I'm sorry. That one has passed. Okay, well, since I screwed that one up, I will say something kind of amazing that our licensing clerk pointed out today. Um, this is the first year since legalization that all marijuana licensees got their applications for renewal in on time, and there will be no special meeting at the end of August to fix that problem. And so a big celebration goes out to all of the licensees who conducted their business and got their documents in on time. Um, we're grateful and it shows responsibility. So I'm sorry, now it's 10 Bravo 3. Okay. AR 2023-259, a resolution of the Anchorage Assembly requesting the administration relocate the Navigation Center project materials currently stored in the Eagle River Chugiak Parks and Rec Service Areas Warm Storage Building. Mr. Presvidia. Uh, move to approve. Second. Moved by Mr. Presvidia, seconded by Mr. Cross. Mr. Presvidia, you pulled this I'll, I'll, I'll defer to the sponsor to, to speak on it first. Thanks. All right. Mr. Cross. Thank you. Um, this resolution was requested um, by my district, uh, by many people within who've been inquiring. Uh, it was brought to uh, my attention back in February, March. It was during the winter that um, the uh, a large quantity of materials that were purchased for the intended construction of the Navigation Center on Tudor, and regretfully we know that that has been laywayed and, and, and its future undetermined at this point, uh, are sitting in a newly constructed uh, warm vehicle storage warehouse for our Parks and Rec. And um, I've been asking for months on if there's an alternate location, and um, I, I'm, I'm confident that the administration and our parks department is working on it, but the residents in my district are getting frustrated in that they still sit there. Meanwhile, the vehicles are sitting outside. And last year, last winter, when we had 20, 30 inches of snow, they were, our employees were out there shoveling snow and clearing snow off vehicles and dealing with it while construction materials just sit in our warm storage warehouse. So the humble request is that uh, we uh, distribute those and move them and find alternate spaces for them so that our our, our loan garage for our parks equipment can be stored in, in preparation for winter so that they're not struggling to get snow off them, our employees aren't dealing with frozen vehicles, and that we can use that building for the millions of dollars it was constructed and purpose for. And it looks like most of those materials are not necessary to be kept and heated, so my anticipation is we can find some connexes or just make an intentional effort here since summer is winding down, sadly. That was quick. Um, so that we can start utilizing that warehouse again. It would, I'd prefer not to do this for a resolution, but it's been many months and, um, and my community is requesting so. so. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to jump to Mr. Presverdia. Oh, well, somehow they switched in the queue. Mr. Presverdia, <laughs> and then I have Ms. Brawley and then Mr. Myers. Thank you, and thank you to Ms. Brawley for rearranging. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd just like the administration to, to speak to this, uh, speak uh, to the, fee the fee feasibility of this, the cost of this, um, and um, and whether they, they support this resolution. Uh, through the chair to Mr. Perez Rodilla and, and the body. Um, when, uh, when we were looking last year for a place to store this, I know that the, the, the then director of maintenance and operations looked long and hard across the city and talked to a number of directors and, and we at that time were not able to find 
other storage. However, I have talked to uh, Director Braniff, and um, at a minimum, we can rearrange some of those materials in that building to provide better use of the building, and we will continue to look for other storage. Um, it, I don't have the dollar number, but it's a significant investment, and we wanted to protect that equipment. But we will continue to, and we'll, we, we'll, we will reemphasize looking for a, an alternate storage, but I can't guarantee we'll find one. Thank you. All right, next we have in the queue, Ms. Brawley. Yeah, thank you, and I appreciate the intent of this, and I see that it's really written, um, I guess not aspirationally, but generally. I just wondered if there's um, any discussion about a um, timeline or, you know, contemplating if we should, um, you know, put some kind of date on this just to give it more uh, weight. And I'm not, I don't have a date to propose. I just wanted to raise that question. Thanks. One of the sponsors want to speak to that. I, you know, as long as I know that there's intentional effort being made, and I'm sure that our, I mean, uh, you listen, you put a date on it, um, and, and I agree that the materials there are very valuable and should be secured, and so that's definitely something to take into consideration. As long as we have uh, their commitment to it, and I know that it's moving forward, then um, I, I don't feel a date is, is necessary, although before snow flies. But... Um, you know, it is important to notice that, you know, we're storing these materials for the Parks Department and uh, warehouse space goes for about $1.50 a square foot on a triple, you know, uh, plus utility. So I would say that cost to the Eagle River Parks Department is around $7,500 a month plus utilities to store those materials if they were to have to lease another warehouse. So there, there is an unintentional cost being contributed and what I would consider to be a un an expense against the Parks Department to house navigation equipment. And so, you know, that, that's part of the other thing is I don't look at it as just a storage. I look at it as it is a financial loss to our parks department and they deserve to, uh, eat, rather than seek reparations, just seek um, uh, correction. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Mr. Myers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to echo everything Mr. Cross has said. I've had multiple um, comments from constituents who live in Chugach and Eagle River and they do not appreciate the Parks Department building being used to store goods for the Navigation Center. So if we could figure something out for that rather quickly, it'd be better. I know Mr. Cross didn't have a timeline on, timeline on it, but I would think 90 days would be sufficient if we could make that happen. Thank you. Ms. Zalatel. Yes, thanks. Um, so thanks for bringing this resolution because you've educated me about something I didn't know we had, which was a bunch of stuff related to the Navigation Center out in Eagle River and storage. So a lot of questions. What did we buy? When did we buy it? What was the approval for buying it and who did we pay for it? Uh, through the chair to members, Alatel, I don't have the specific list of equipment and supplies, but this was this was equipment that was delivered to the municipality during the term of the Roger Hickel contract, and it was paid for as part of the, I guess, ultimately as part of the settlement with Roger Hickel. So did we offer to sell it back to Roger Hickel? Not to my knowledge. No, we did not. Okay. Um, and I would um, move to amend on line 38 um, after the last sentence, just with the words before 10-15-2023. Second. So a motion to amend has been made after line 23 to add a date before 10 15 23. So um, you want to speak to the motion? Um, it just makes sense to try to put a deadline on it if we're going to be moving equipment. It'd be probably cheaper to move it before the snow flies. I hope the snow flies much later, but this feels like a safe hedge. Yeah, when I first joined the assembly, we had a different assembly council. It was Julia Tucker, and one of her parting words to me was, always get a date. Always get a date. Anyhow, so I had Mr. Colhase, thank you, but now you're not there. You know, okay. So, um, any discussion? Hearing seeing none, members may proceed to vote on the amendment. Mr. Myers? Yes. Mr. Rivera? Yes. So, um, and the youth member? Yes. So on a vote of 11 to 0 with the youth member voting yes, the amendment has passed. 
Now we have the main motion before us. Now I have Mr. Cole Hayes in the queue. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to follow up uh, briefly on whether we did approach uh, Roger Hickel Contracting and, and, and request they buy some back some of the material. I'm recalling that we did work with them on um, some equipment that they were able to return to the manufacturer, um, but this was equipment, and, and I apologize, I don't recall the specifics, but this was equipment that was not able to be returned to the contractor. Thank you. All right, Mr. Cross. Uh, yes, having gone out there and inspected it, it, it looks like it's very specific. It's uh, some heat exchangers, electrical panels, electrical components, uh, some light poles. Um, a lot of the, you know, you have the sprung structure and then you have the, um, the, the applications. I think there might even be some refrigerators out there, like, like stainless steel, but um, they look very purpose-built or purpose-delivered around the sprung structure. So I would, I would anticipate it would be very difficult to return them, and, uh, but th that's, that's what's there. It's mostly just the electrical components and, um, uh, and other building materials. Thank you. Thank you. So are you back in the queue, Mr. Weiss? Okay. Uh, thank you. I don't want to wear out my welcome, but I'm informed by the Director of uh, uh, Community Development, or, or Lance Wilbur, that HLB, or real estate, is actually currently looking for alternate storage space. They've been doing that for a little while now, so we will continue to endeavor to find alternate storage space for that. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, Mr. Coyce, I would ask, so from all of this, if it would be possible for someone in the administration, probably Mr. Wilbur, to conduct an kind of I don't want to say an audit, but a kind of a generate a list of what is where in this process. So we have a sense of in Tacoma, in this place in Anchorage, and what materials exist where. We will do that. That would be very helpful. Thank you very much. Okay, so now we have the main motion back before us. Anyone else wish to speak to the item? Hearing and seeing none, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Myers? Yes. Yeah. Mr. Rivera? Yes. And the youth member votes? Yes. So on 11 to 0 vote with youth, youth member voting yes. Um, item 10B3, AR 2023-259 as amended has passed the body. Next we will have before us item 10 be for AR 2023-260, a resolution of the Anchorage Assembly recognizing the community's diverse lived experience, experiences of housing in the municipality of Anchorage and adopting general principles for future housing policy. Um, this one was pulled by Mr. Presidio. I think I'll, I'll defer to, to one of the sponsors to, to, to approve. All right. And then ask questions. Thank and you. What's the will of the body on this one? Move to approve. Second. So this is moved by Ms. Brawley and seconded by Mr. Voland. Um, so why don't we go ahead and have the sponsor speak to it and then Mr. Prisrita will yeah, put you in the queue. Ms. Brawley. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I'll just um, make a kind of a brief statement about this. So this resolution is intended to shift our conversation around housing to the big picture and attempt to find some very basic common ground in the why. So that's W-H-Y. Uh, why are we talking so much about housing? Why do things need to change? And really to think about that, you know, because we have this opportunity before we get into the discussion about the substance of what changes to make at a future meeting. I see a lot of alignment among the assembly members about the need to act, why we need more housing, but I also still see a lot of division among the public um, on, on kind of that core, like why, why do we need to make these changes? Um, why, why should we consider changing the way things are now? And um, really about how these current problems are impacting our community as a whole. So here's the short version um, of, of what I'm proposing <laughs> in this ordinance. Um, I believe we want to be and have been a community with ample opportunities for working people to make a good life here and for many to own a home. But it's increasingly clear that we are a community where many working people can't and are unlikely in the future to have that opportunity for home ownership. And we're becoming a community where even working people cannot afford our housing or are barely getting by and are able to, unable to save for tomorrow, which again directly relates to people's ability um, to become homeowners in the future. So if we truly value home ownership, we need to close the gap between our values and our policies. 
So the affirmative statements in the resolution are a first attempt to distill that why into some short forward thinking guiding principles that the community can support and which we can use to evaluate specific policy choices which I know we'll continue to work through um, on multiple fronts. And so really the, the intent of this is to start that conversation, um, see what members would like to add or change, and then seeing if this is really um, a, something that resonates with you as well. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm, um, the thing I'm, I'm really appreciative of this and, uh, and, and supportive, particularly because it lays out um, some language that can be used that, that potentially we can all get, get behind. What I'm curious about, and maybe this uh, goes to our, um, our assembly count, council, um, because I'm always curious as it relates to re resolutions, uh, how can this be used to, to hold us accountable to using these gu guidelines? That's what I'm most curious about is, um, are these in resolution form something that can be used as to hold um, both the assembly and the, and the administration accountable for, um, for approaching our housing work in a way that is aligned? Um, if not, is there, once this is passed, if this is passed, is there another step that we can take to actually establish something that is, um, um, allows, allows us to hold those parties accountable? So the, the question really is, is, is the effect of this that it does create some um, accountability for the administration and the assembly to be aligned on our future work in housing? Um, thank you, Mr. Press, for the, uh, that's a good question, and I think this resolution would lay out, like you said, some sort of guidelines to guide future decisions related to housing for the Assembly Administration, but it doesn't have sort of the teeth, I think, uh, and that might be what you're asking, and I would compare this to, for example, conference of plan elements. We have legal requirements that rezonings and other actions are consistent with these plans or adopted district plans. This resolution is different because it sets out um, guidance and policies, but if you don't follow them, there's no real consequences, but it does show that, I guess, um, decisions made didn't follow what you adopted today, or they did follow them, or this can be used as a basis for justifying whatever actions might be taken in the future. Um, and I guess with that said, uh, perhaps as Ms. Bry's um, resolution, what she thinks it might mean for, I guess, the assembly administration going forward would be helpful. I think that that's a helpful, just I'll, I'll make another statement and then I'll, I'll hand it off to others. I, I think this is a great first step. I think that um, I'm curious about how, how this can turn into um, um, a requirement around re re reporting, how this can in influence future uh, policy development. And so, um, but I'm curious uh, whether other members of the, of, the, um, of the assembly and the administration um, agree with it, this language or not. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. We have quite a lively queue at this point, Mr. Salt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'd like to move Salt Amendment 1. Second. So we have a motion to amend by Mr. Salt, seconded by um, Ms. Alatal. You want to go ahead and describe your amendment, Mr. Salt? Yes, thank you. So this is just to create alignment with the comprehensive plans. So I'll read it. It adds a new bullet four under section three. Housing policies will align with the public's goals, objectives, and expectations as shown in the adopted comprehensive plan elements in AMC section 21.01.80. <clears throat> so the amendment has been moved and seconded. We have a lively queue, so I'll just walk briefly through the queue. And I'll leave you in the queue if you don't wish to speak to the amendment, uh, Mr. Wolland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was in the queue for, for the underlying item, but I will uh, speak on this amendment. Um, I appreciate the intent of this, but I, I want to move to amend the amendment um, to make the, the language a little bit more concise. What I would like to do is, is strike um, public's goals, objectives, and expectations as shown in the... So that would read housing policies will align with the adopted comprehensive plan elements in 
Anchorage Municipal Code, section 21.01.80. Second. So we have a motion to amend the amendment by Mr. Vaughn, seconded by Ms. Brawley. Uh, yeah, if, if I could speak on it briefly. Um, I think it's a little bit more succinct, and I also think that, um, you know, the language as it is now is a little bit squishy. I think um, sometimes there are uh, different interpretations of our comprehensive plan elements. And um, one thing that I'm learning is I'm, um, you know, looking through some of our adopted plans in contemplation of uh, other legislation that the assembly is currently considering is um, sometimes the things that the plan actually calls for um, are different than arguments that the public is currently making. And I think part of our job as policymakers is to weed through all those arguments, fully process them, have a, a, a public process, um, and, and create opportunities for feedback and for listening, but also um, to do our due diligence in, in, in truly um, looking at those plans for ourselves and making sure that the policies um, are aligned with the actual elements of the plan, not um, talking points that can be circulated via email or, or email chain letter, et cetera. Thank you. All right, so again, this is the main cue. You'll stay in if you don't want to speak. Ms. Zalatel, to the amendment. No, nope. okay, um, Ms. Brawley. Yeah, thank you. I, I would support that amendment to the amendment. Um, the word that was giving me pause was expectations, um, because I and I and I appreciate the argument that Mr. Bowen made um, regarding keeping it focused on the plan and in the code. And I think that speaks to Mr. Perez Verdia's um, comments earlier as well. Thanks. All right, Mr. Salt. So maybe in excess of time, I'd propose that I could amend my amendment, as Mr. Bowen said, if my second would agree. So I think we're close enough. We should okay, just fair vote. Enough. Um, yeah, if no one else wants to speak on the amendment, let's just make the vote happen. <clears throat> uh, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Myers? Yes. Mr. Rivera? Yes. And the youth member? Yes. Okay, on a vote of 10 to 1, the amendment to the amendment has passed to the youth member voting yes. Now we have the amendment back before us. And is there anyone in the queue for that? Mr. Rivera, were you, you weren't on the amendment to the amendment or the amendment, so you're waiting for the main motion? Yes, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. So seeing, hearing none, no one else on the amendment. Members may proceed to vote. So. Mr. Myers? Yes. Mr. Rivera? Yes. And the youth member? Yes. All right, on 11 to 0 vote, the amendment has passed. The youth member voting yes. So we have the main motion before us. Um, I have Ms. Zalatel at the top of the queue. Thank you. Um, so thanks for bringing this resolution. Um, I have some pause because there was recently um, in December 20, 2022, a housing policy-based um, resolution adopted by this body. And this doesn't reference that prior resolution um, or other resolutions where we've stated housing policy. And what I don't know or don't want is that something overrides others like we need to look at this comprehensively um, where it's not one resolution simply replacing another resolution um, so uh, with that in mind because i would like us to have a comprehensive housing policy that has teeth and actionable items i know the one from december 2022 has some very specific direction um, to real estate to um, the land trust to cook in that housing like really calls out specific items for action um, is probably lighter on some of the general principles um, 
I would prefer to try to work toward marrying the two or adopting both somehow through reference. So with that, um, I move to postpone to the meeting of August 22nd. Second. So we have a motion by Ms. Zelotel, seconded by Mr. Cross to postpone to the meeting of August 22nd. So I have a bunch of people in the queue on the main motion. Uh, the question isn't the queue, uh, isn't what's the main motion, so I'll just walk down the queue and see if folks want to speak to the, the motion to postpone Ms. Bronga. No, uh, Mr. Rolland. Ms. Brawley. Yeah, this is to the motion to postpone. Um, I would certainly welcome that. Um, I, I view this as a first draft and really a first attempt, and I know that, um, that there's opportunity for more discussion about that. I did review the, um, the 2022 resolution, um, and so I don't think it's in conflict with this one, but it was really trying to take um, a different approach. Um, and, but I do see that, there, um, that there's opportunities to, to take the time and work through that, um, as well as opportunities for other members to offer additional comments or input or perhaps a work session. So I would certainly work on, uh, sorry, welcome postponement. Mr. Martinez? Yes, thank you. I'll speak to this, at, uh, to the postponement. I appreciate the language in this uh, um, starting point, and my thoughts were also around the values and language that we have embedded in some of our comprehensive plans. Similarly, so I think that pausing is a great idea to be able to both have those references that create the alignment to what has already been described, but also not only in terms of what the body has passed before, but also in terms of those comprehensive plans and those values that are embedded there as well. I wouldn't want us to, to overshadow them, and I would love those references as, as, as clearly drawn out as possible. Thank you. Thank you. So next in the queue, I think Mr. Cross. Yeah, I support the postponement just simply because it seems like, from my recollection, in the only 15 months that I've been here, we've done multiple housing resolutions, and I don't want to do doing resolutions for the purposes of resolutions. I make sure you're in alignment with past actions that have taken place and our housing efforts. And so, um, although at the surface I don't see anything in here that I would particularly disagree with, but there, if we can remove some redundancy or just make sure that we're building upon uh, previous decisions of the past, I would feel more confident. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I'll just briefly speak to this since I don't think there's anyone else in the queue and call to everyone's attention, whoever might be working on, if, if this postponement passes, whoever might be working on the marriage of these two documents that we are still, oh, okay, I'll let you go after me, Mr. Barrett. We are still in a process moving towards a housing summit in October, and I would like folks to keep that thinking in context when drafting this resolution uh, because I think that it should inform that process, it should be informed by that process, and should probably, um, the, the movers should think about how this dovetails into that workflow, because there are things happening right now and prep for that, and that's coming pretty soon. So, uh, Mr. Rivera. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, I think I'm gonna pull a Branga here, and I say that with love and respect, Ms. Branga, and I think I'm gonna vote no on the postponement. I, I think all of the resolutions and work that we have done really build on each other. I think if, to get to Ms. Altel's concern, if we wanted to add a, re a section in here that simply references and reaffirms our support of a prior resolution, that's simple. We can draft to that floor amendment and we can do that later in today's meeting. But otherwise, I, I don't feel the need to postpone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, anyone else wish to speak on this item? A motion to postpone. Members may proceed to vote. Mr. Myers? Yes. Mr. Rivera? No. And the youth member? Yes. All right, on a vote of eight to three, and the youth member voting yes, this item is postponed to the meeting of August 22nd. Next, we have item 10B6, Resolution AR 2023-262, a resolution of the Anchorage Assembly approving the continued temporary delegation of the acting Anchorage Health Department director position to Kim Rash. Will the body? Moved to approve. Second. Moved by Ms. Zalatel, seconded by Member Cross. Ms. Zalatel. Um, thank you. I would yield the floor to uh, Mr. Colhase as he asks for this to be pulled. Mr. Colhase. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Ms. Zalatel. Um, I'm not sure of the exact procedure, but I would like to propose a floor amendment to the item. So um, the procedure would be, since the mayor's not here, asking a member to move your amendment. So why don't you go ahead and just tell us what you'd like and see if you get a fish on. All right. Uh, what I would like to do on line 29 is strike uh, the word 60 and the number 60 in parentheses and insert or replace it with the word 90 and the number 90 in parentheses, if a member would um, move that. So moved. All right, moved by Mr. Cross. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Salt. Um, I want you first go ahead and speak to that, Mr. Coyes. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Chair. Um, a, a, a few reasons for this. One, we are actively interviewing candidates. Um, we have yet to, to uh, uh, select a candidate or make an offer. But uh, Ms. Rash has been serving uh, uh, very well, extremely well, in her role as acting. And um, since we're actively recruiting, I would like to avoid, right now, we are asking for approval of the, the underlying AR in, um, to make it retroactive because we missed the renewal date. And it's a challenge for us to stay on top of this. That's my, I apologize for that. It's my responsibility to do that. But we are actively recruiting, and um, we would offer that a 90-day window allows us a little more breathing room to continue that recruitment. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Alto. Thank you. Um, question to Mr. Colhais, which is 90 days would take us to what date? Because you have this retroactive to June 17th. Uh, through the chair to members Zalatel, I guess there's a couple of answers to that. One would be doing the math that would be in the mid-September range. Alternately, um, if it were possible to make it 90 days from today and retroactive to whatever the June 17th date was, that would that would allow us a little more a little more time. Thank you. Thank you for answering that question. Um, <clears throat> I would support making it 90 days starting with the June 17 day. Um, I'm not comfortable with 90 days. The code contemplates 60 days and then put somebody forward for um, confirmation. I realize we've had a series of extensions um, and I um, have been really thankful for Ms. Rash in this acting position. Um, and frankly, I think the 60 days kind of keeps the pressure on to keep, get this position filled. This is a key position within the municipality. It sounds like you're close to um, possibly making that happen. Um, so if, um, if the 90 days um, is it's the way it reads now then with the proposed amendment would be 90 days from the effective date of this resolution. And so I believe with section two saying the resolution shall be effective retroactively as of June 17th, this is something I could support because I believe it is written to be effective from the June 17 date. Um, but I wanna make sure that that's how everyone's reading it because we haven't done one of these retroactively. So, okay, thank you. Mr. Gates. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to mention what the code says in regards to this and acting uh, assignments for department head. In section 320.20A5, since it was mentioned, it's the 60 days is the, uh, the limitation on a person being signed or delegated, the authority for a position subject to assembly confirmation, unless, so unless is the exception. and. One of the exceptions is a resolution like this one, but the exception doesn't say anything about how long the exception should be for. So the assembly could do zero, 10, 60, 90, or indefinitely. Um, so there's no uh, like code requirement for it to be a certain number of days when the assembly's, uh, when the resolution's approved. So here, let me hand this off. Mr. Constant. Thank you. I think that I would like to meet Mr. Colhay somewhere in the middle and offer that, propose that we move it either towards the October 10th or the October 24th meeting, um, just so that there is time to get the work done and um, we don't have to just come back here in 30 days to do this again. And so I don't know if a member would make that motion, but I think that that's a reasonable date. I think we could dispatch with the amendment on the floor and then we can make a subsequent amendment. Okay. Uh, OK, 
Okay, oh, we could dispatch with it in a number of ways. The vice chair makes a very good point that we have a motion to ex change it to 90 days, but probably we should just eliminate the 90 days reference because that's kind of arbitrary and it's hard to tell which way it goes. And so we're gonna have to take a minute to wordsmith this. So do the mover and seconder of that amendment agree to withdraw it? Yes. Mr. Cross says Withdrawn. yes. Withdrawn. And the second, I think, was Mr. Salt. You agree to withdraw? Yes. Thank you. So we're back to the main motion. It'll be just a minute. Ms. Alatel. So to um, create this to a date certain, I believe the amendment is on line 28 to take out the clause that says comma or for a period no longer than 60 days from the 60 days and then to add in section to um, have it read um, the resolution shall be effective from june 17 2023 and in effect until 10 10 2023 upon passage and approval by the assembly we hand that note off to the clerk So before we ask for a motion or a second, we're gonna get the language up there. On just on behalf of the manager, they asked for help on figuring this out, and um, I gave them ham-handed advice, and they did exactly what I advised, which is why we're now um, taking time to figure this out on the floor. So I apologize to everybody for the delay. All right, the language above, does someone wish to move that? So moved. All right, so the amendment moved by Ms. Altel is to amend line 33 to read, this resolution shall be effective from June 17, 2023 and in effect until 10, 10, 2023 upon passage and approval by the assembly. Uh, the so second, does it need a second? Moved by Ms. Altel, seconded by Ms. Brawley. Any discussion? Hearing and seeing none, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Myers? Yes. Mr. Rivera? Yes. And the youth member? Yes. All right, thank you. On a vote of 11 to 0 and the youth member voting yes, the amendment has passed. Next, uh, we have the main motion before us, Ms. Alatel. Thank you. Um, I move to amend to strike lines 22 and 23. There's a motion to strike lines 22 and 23. Is there a second? Second for purposes of discussion. All right, so Ms. Alatel is moved. Um, Mr. Cross has seconded. Ms. Alatel. Thank you. Um, the current whereas um, says the administration recommends approval. That's actually more appropriate for an AM, and frankly, we don't need 
the language that's there, that it's in the best interest of the municipality. It's implied by the resolution under the section of code. So it's just cleaner to take out those two lines. It's odd that an AR would have the administration recommends approval in a resolution we're passing. Um, it would typically be in a supporting memorandum. So I think it's cleaner and it's more in line with our practice to just take those two lines out. Thank you. Any discussion? Hearing and seeing none, members may proceed to vote on the amendment. I should have asked if you're ready. Mm -hmm. Mr. Myers? Yes. Mr. Rivera? Yes. And the youth member? Yes. All right. On a vote of 11 to 0 with the youth member voting yes, that amendment has passed. We have the main motion back before us. Anyone wish to speak to the motion? All right. Uh, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Myers? Yes. yes. Mr. Rivera? Yes. And the youth member? Yes. All right, thank you. On a vote of 11 to 0, and the youth member having voted yes, item 10B6, AR 2023-262, as amended, has passed the body. Next, we have item 10D1 before us. Um, what, Mr. Presbyterian, you, you pull this one? Yep, move, move, move to approve. Second. Moved by Mr. Presbyterian, seconded by Ms. Alatel. Mr. Presbyterian. Thank you. Uh, I have uh, just a couple of questions, and I'm assuming these would go. You know what? Hold on. The, the vice chair reminds me I should have done my work before yeah. I handed this off to you. Item 10D1 AM. 558-2023, amendment number two to sole source non-cumbering contract with Dietra NSPO 2022003229 to provide professional services to the Legislative Council. Now, um, we have a motion by Mr. Presverdia, a second by Ms. Salatel. Mr. Presverdia, I'm sorry, you now have the floor. Thank you, and I think I'll direct my, my um, questions to, to Assembly Council. Two questions. One is on the dates of this. It, it appears to be backdated uh, December 15, 2022 through December 31st, 2023. I, I'm, I'm curious why um, and whether that, whether we, it's possible to, to enact this and, and go, go backwards or whether that's standard practice or is that's a, a rare thing that we do. And the second item is just uh, the, me understanding the relationship now DNS has with the municipality, so I'm I'm I guess I'm I'm confused as to so how I, we can be. Might, let me jump on the first yeah, part. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, and I'll let council take care of the second part. Maybe uh, I think that's just a reading thing. This is an amendment to a contract that was established from December 15, 2022 to December 31, 2023. Right. And so this is just an amendment adding funding to the same contract. So it's not changing the term or time. It's just adding additional resources. I see. And so j just to make sure I understand it, uh, is she not an employee? I see. Okay. That, that, was, that was the confusing piece that I had. Okay. All right. So she's, she's a contractor and this is simply amending that, that, that contract. Got it. Thanks. That, that clears it up for me. Thank you. Sorry to take it away from you guys over there, but this is one I've been managing. So thank you. And any other questions on this item? Hearing and seeing none members may proceed to vote. Mr. Myers? Yes. Yeah. Mr. Rivera? Yes. Yeah. And the youth member? Yes. On a vote of 11 to 0 on the youth member voting yes, AM 558-2023 has passed the body. Next we have before us item 10D9. 10D9 is AM 616-2023. Assembly Memorandum Recommendation of Award to Axon Enterprises Incorporated Axon to provide body-worn cameras for the Municipality of Anchorage. Um, Mr. Presbyterian. Yeah, move to approve. Move to postpone to the meeting of August 22nd. Okay. Second. Uh, who's seconded? I'll second the, the motion to postpone. Okay, so it, it appears then the motion to approve has been um, overrun by a motion to postpone to the meeting of, was it 822? Seconded by Mr. Presverdia. Ms. Uh, Zalatel. Thank you. Um, later, um, actually one of the items for introduction is the appropriation for this contract, which is set for public hearing on 822. So the contract should run with the appropriation, which is our common practice. Um, I did check in with um, 
Deputy Chief Case, and he said this doesn't create any problems. It does, though, make it a kind of must-pass or an item of particular um, interest to pass on the 22nd meeting. Thank you. Mr. President. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. And, um, and I, I have a number of questions, about, but I, I can take them offline and, and have, them, have them addressed directly by, by, by the chief. So thanks. All right. Thank you. So um, I think I'll just leave it at that. Anyone else wish to speak to the motion to postpone? Ms. Alaton. Thank you. Um, with the additional time, I guess my question is, is there a desire by the body to have a work session. I also have a number of questions and I, about the contract in particular, and I'm wondering if it's just going to overlap and if there's room on the 18th to um, just do that or if you plan to take it up at the Public Safety Committee meeting tomorrow. Yeah, it is on the agenda tomorrow, and um, and I guess I, I guess I would I would defer to the chief if he would be prepared to answer questions at that point, knowing that it, that it's tomorrow. Um, that would be fine with me. That would be a good uh, sort of venue for, for us to, to do that. Chief, or do you? Yes, I got the thumbs up. Great, thank you. All right. So um, the 18th is looking to be a blockbuster day of work sessions, but I do believe there's a little bit of time there should the need arise still, um, and I think that. Um, one opportunity for tomorrow's presentation would be the timeline conversation that was um, a little bit uh, confusing. So that might be very helpful as well to be prepared to talk about that because I think the public will be pleased to understand uh, when these things are coming on. There are also some challenges not related to the purchase um, that are um, relating to a conversation we've had the, um, the radio shop might be the bottleneck in this conversation after this is approved. So that's a conversation we'll need to have. But I have now a number of people in the queue. Ms. Brawley. Yeah, just briefly, I would speak in support of a work session and making time for that, uh, recognizing our other priorities. I know this has been a community discussion for at least three years now, and so I think it's, it behooves us to really be clear and help the public understand you know, where we are and where we're going. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Cross. Yeah, I support the work session, and given us more time, I would just ask is to be cognizant because the last two meetings we've had we've shoved a lot of stuff to August 22nd so I'm beginning to think that that is a uh, five gallon bucket with 10 pounds of stuff in it so thank you Ms. Bronga I would support a work session but we just had one where we didn't actually work on this so I find that kind of frustrating right so I think my answer to the question of a work session will be what it was a minute ago is um, there is a committee meeting tomorrow and hopefully the committee meeting can surface specific questions that need to be answered. And if the need is there after tomorrow's process where the body that's delegated the authority to review public safety matters, they tell us, tell the chair leadership and we'll schedule a work session. Um, it's just gonna be on the 18th if it happens. And so just everybody be prepared for that day to be one that is as busy as the 22nd. So anyone else? Hearing seeing none, members may proceed to vote on the motion to postpone. Mr. Myers? Yes. Mr. Rivera? Yes. And the youth member? Yes. So on a vote of 10 to 1 with the youth member voting yes, that item has been postponed, been postponed to the meeting of August 22nd. So next we have item 10D14. Um, AM 608-2023, Anchorage Women's Commission. It's a well body. Move to approve. Second. Moved by Ms. Bronga, seconded by Mr. Salt. Anyone wish to speak to this item? Anyone at all? Hearing and seeing none. Oh, Ms. Bronga. I did have a conversation with Ms. Maddox, and I found that she would be a good choice for this. All right. Then, anyone else? Hearing and seeing none, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Myers? Mr. Myers, how do you vote? Yeah. We might have lost him. 
Mr. Rivera? Yes. On a vote of seven to three, how does the youth member vote? Yes. On a vote of seven to three and the youth member voting yes, that item has passed. So on the previous item, can you can you say something, Mr. Myers? <laughs> so we can't hear you. I'm not sure what's going on with your phone. There was some noise, but no signal. Can you try again? Mr. Chair, can you hear me now? Yes. So why don't you go ahead and uh, speak your vote, and we'll. I voted. Yeah, voted. In which way? I think my ear pods are dying. Sorry about that. So you voted in which manner? Yes or no? Mr. Myers, how did you vote? Yes. So, Madam Clerk, I don't think so. We haven't moved on to the next item. I think the item effectively is still open because I think he did attempt to vote. I don't know. I, if there any, is there any objection to that? No. Hearing no objection, then I think we'll proceed in that manner. We'll just record the vote as um, eight to three. The youth member having voted yes on AM six zero eight dash twenty twenty three. So sorry, minutes, clerk. Okay. Next on the agenda, we have item ten D seventeen. Before we take that on, um, I'll read it first. 10D17 is oh, AM 587-2023, 2023-2024, alcohol license renewals, beverage dispensary license, Manhattan restaurant license, LL 814, Double Muskie Inn, LL 1551, Chepo's Mexican restaurant, LL 3765, St. Coyote restaurant lounge, LL 4350, restaurant eating place license, Bella Vista Pizzeria and restaurant, LL 107, Peggy's restaurant, LL 1821, Mark's Brothers, LL 1422, Gallus Mexican restaurant number two, LL 3572, Jin Mi Korean Restaurant LL5483, Package Store License In and Out Liquor Number 1, LL156, Bears Den Liquor LL1011, Recreational Site License Hilltop Ski Area LL5982, Distillery License, Brewery License, Girdwood Brewing Company LL518, Bayshore Clad, Eel River, Wait, Tucker, Campbell. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Salt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I wish I would have said this in the very beginning. So I because I know people probably waited for this one, so I have a conflict. I'm on the board of Hilltop Ski Area. So uh, having ruled on this previously, it is a ruling of the chair that as a member of the board of the Hilltop Ski Area, which is under consideration, uh, Member Salt does in fact have a conflict. Don't go too far, Mr. Salt. What we're going to do is bifurcate the item and take up that one, and then we'll come back and take up the rest. So for now, we'll call you back in a minute. Yep. Okay, let's hold the body. Move to approve. Second. Moved by Ms. Zalatel, seconded by um, Mr. Cross. And then I make a motion to bifurcate that we take up um, all, our, that we take up Hilltop Ski Area license separately. Second. So you step out for now, Mr. Salt. We'll call you back in a minute. So the motion to bifurcate to take up Hilltop Ski Area is moved by Ms. Zalatel. Who is the second? Mr. Volland. Okay. Right. So I move to approve the oh, Hilltop Ski hold Area. On, we have oh. to take a vote on the motion to bifurcate. Um, I'm just going to ask, is there any objection to the motion to bifurcate? Hearing and seeing none, that's approved unanimously, but for Mr. Salt. So now we have the bifurcated motion. Before us now, Ms. Zalatel. Move to approve the Hilltop Ski Area license. Second. Moved by Ms. Zalatel, seconded by Mr. Volland. Probably need to slow down enough the clerk can track this. I could feel her.
Okay, the bifurcated motion is now before us. Anyone wish to speak to the motion? Hearing and seeing none, members may proceed to vote. And on this one, we will not have the youth member vote. Mr. Myers? Yes. Oh. Mr. Rivera? Yes. On a vote of 10 to 0, the bifurcated um, item from AM 587-2023 Hilltop Ski Area Liquor License 5982 has been approved. Again, 10 to 0. Um, Mr. Salt? All right, welcome back. Now we have before us the remainder of AM 587-2023. What's the motion? Moved to approve. Second. Moved by Ms. Alatel, seconded by Mr. Cross. Again, the remainder of the bifurcated items for AM 587-2023. Anyone wish to speak to the item? Hearing and seeing none, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Myers? Yes. Mr. Rivera? Yes. Mr. Salt? Yes. On a vote of 11 to 0, the items remaining of the bifurcated memorandum AM 587-2023, all but Hilltop Ski Area, has passed the body. Thank you, everybody, for the, the little complex one there. Next, we have item 10D18. I'll read the clerk's note. It's the assembly leadership's intent to hold over the decision on this item until the August 22nd, 2023 regular meeting. We have before us AM 619-2023, MOA Trust Fund Board of Trustees. What's the will of the body? Move, move to, to postpone. Oh, go ahead, Anna. Uh, move to postpone to the meeting of September 12th. Second. Uh, okay, so um, the motion is to postpone to the meeting of September 12th, moved by Ms. Farley, seconded by Ms. Zalatel. Uh, anyone wish to speak to that? Ms. Zalatel? Thank you. Um, so this gives us time to have a confirmation hearing or a work session with the proposed board. Um, it also is in advance of the time um, that they're hoping to seat for their first meeting, which I believe is in October, um, and gives us a little bit of buffer um, should... Um, one of the members brought forward or several someone not make it on then we can take up any additional meeting or any additional members um, on the 26th so they can hopefully convene a full board in october thank you Ms. Brawley. Yeah, thank you. Just speaking in support of that um, to, and reminding the public that this is an important board. Um, it is something that um, we are just standing up after passage of um, Proposition 12, I believe, <laughs> um, uh, which created the Municipal Trust Fund Board um, to oversee the municipal finances. So, um, so again, it really is important. This board has more responsibility than a typical advisory board, and we just want to make sure that we uh, get it right and that we set up our new board members for success. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak to this item? Hearing and seeing none, members may proceed to vote. The motion is to postpone to the meeting of September 12th. Mr. Myers? Yes. Mr. Rivera? Yes. Right. And the youth member? Yes. So on a vote of 11 to 0, and the youth member have voted yes, that item is postponed to the meeting of September the 12th. Next, we have item 10D22. 10D22 is the from the mayor. It's an unnumbered AM. Sole source contract with Alaska Department of Transportation and Public Facilities for the planning, design, right of way, and construction of the Campbell Creek Trail Crossing at Lake Otis Parkway Parks and Recreation Department project, not to exceed one hundred seventy-six thousand eighty-five dollars. Uh, what's the will of the body? Move to approve. Second. I heard echoes there. I think I heard uh, Zalatel 
moved and then Brawley seconded. Okay, I heard it like in stereo, so it's hard. Yeah, harmony. Okay, so we have the, the item before us. Um, Mr. Collins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would again ask that a member um, support a floor amendment I'd like to make for this item. So uh, go ahead and speak what you'd like to do. Uh, thank you. Uh, line 28, I'd like to strike the words purchasing director and replace that with chief fiscal officer and municipal manager. And line 34, I'd like to strike in its entirety. So moved. Second. Moved by Mr. Cross, seconded by Ms. Zalatel. The clerk is uh, capturing the essence of the amendment now for the record. Please, Mr. Goyce. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as you're all aware, this was a laid on the table item and there was a flurry of versions going back and forth within the administration today and I missed uh, an important email and neglected to um, consult with all the appropriate directors. So this addresses those concerns and um, pl really places the responsibility for moving this forward on myself and uh, the acting CFO Alden Thurn. Thank you. Yeah, it was, um, yeah, the amendment was Mr. Cross, Ms. Alatel, second. So, um, Ms. Collis has made the case, Ms. Barley? Um, this is to the main motion. To the main motion, okay. Ms. Alatel? Thank you. If the mover would agree, I think we need to add the word acting in front of CFO so that it's factually accurate. I agree. Thank you. Clerk is capturing that. All right, any other discussion? Members may proceed to vote on the amendment. Mr. Myers? Yes. Mr. Rivera? Yes. And the youth member? Yes. All right. On a vote of 11 to 0 with the youth member voting yes, the item has been amended. The main motion is before us, Ms. Brawley. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I did not actually pull this with the intention of making that amendment, so I'm glad it worked out. Um, but I just wanted to um, really uh, share support for this. Um, as I understand it, this is a part of the, the general city project to create the Moose Loop or to, to finish the Moose Loop. And so this is, if you're a, a biker and you've um, been in the, the Midtown area over by uh, Lake Otis and just north of Waldron, um, and you've been biking along on the Campbell Creek Trail, all of a sudden you get to a very busy street and you have to either choose to cross illegally or um, go all the way to the next light and so um, this is as I understand it one small piece to connect that and so this is a great opportunity again to uh, continue our commitment to building out the moose loop well, uh, thank you mr. chair um, so I want to provide a little bit more of a, a local flavor to this project so um, I used to live on the street where this trail ends and I watched countless people take their bikes or run or walk across Lake Otis there at East 47th Court. And it's terrifying to watch. This is a considerable public safety project. Um, and it's been one um, heavily supported um, by the community. My predecessor, Dick Traney, is a huge supporter of this project and tried to get it moving for a really long time. And so we were very excited to see it go into um, the tip. And so getting this local contribution match um, forward so that it can move into design is really um, exciting. So. Um, Big thanks from the Campbell Park area and Midtown. This has been a high priority for a really long time for them. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bronga. Uh, for Scenic Foothills Community Council, this has been on their CIP wish list for years and kind of completes the from the mountains all the way to the ocean without a major road crossing, and we're very in support of it. Mr. Terrell. Yeah, I would just like to... Uh, speak my wholehearted support for this. I've biked this area frequently, and I think this would be a massive improvement. I have myself in the queue now. Um, Mr. Constant. Thank you. Just, you know, Mr. Traney, right at the end of his very, very long several term of service, uh, said, Chris, I only ask you for one thing. See that this project done. And that was years ago now, and I'm very excited to be part of the assembly body that moves forward 
uh, the match funding that moves the tip forward and that gets this thing moving onto the ground because this is a key link in connectivity. People talk about how our city has great trail systems. Well, this is literally a broken link, and so this fixes a break. And there are a number of others, but I agree that this is probably the top priority on that network, and so I urge your support. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Anyone else? Hearing and seeing none, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Myers? Yes. Mr. Rivera? Yes. And the youth member? Yes. So on a vote of 11 to 0, with the youth member voting yes, the unnumbered AM-2023, as amended, has passed the body. Next item, we have 10G1. Hearing anyone? Oh, yeah. I'm ready for dinner. <laughs> 10G1 is AM 603-2023, Zoning Board of Examiners and Appeals. I'm not hearing a motion. Move to approve. Second. It's for introduction. Move to introduce. Oh, yeah. What does it require? It takes uh, first, a second, and a third. So moved by Mr. Cross, seconded by Mr. Salt. Excuse me, I would like to withdraw mine. All right, thank you. So I remember that email. Thank you. So this item dies for lack of, of a motion. So with that, we have concluded our consent agenda and uh, we will take our regularly scheduled break. And- Mr. Chair. Ms. Qualice. I apologize for the, I couldn't get the button. Would uh, would Mario Bird be able to say a word about this, please? Mr. Bird. No. Uh, well, you know what? The item was only set for introduction, um, so it didn't get introduced. The only action that was available was a move a second and a third, and so there's no deliberation on this item. The vice chair is is correct. So we can talk offline, and if we want, there's probably an opportunity. We can make some comments after dinner. Thank you. We will come back after our dinner break. Just about ready to come back to order. All right, we're coming back to order now. We have, now have item 11A. 11A, Assembly Memorandum AM 571-2023. Executive appointment confirmation hearing, Tiffany Briggs. What's the will of the body? Move to approve. Second. Moved by Ms. Zalatel, seconded by Mr. Bond. Anyone wish to discuss the item? Anyone at all? Ms. Brawley. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, we had a work session um, to speak with uh, Ms. Briggs on Friday and um, also had a chance to learn, at least for, for my purposes, to le learn more about uh, Heritage Land Bank as well as the real estate department. So I just want to say thank you um, for a good conversation um, in both, both of those work sessions. Um, and I look forward to supporting um, the confirmation of Ms. Briggs. Anyone else? I'll just say for myself, the position has been acting far too long or empty even, and I'm glad that we have a willing candidate and one who has demonstrated qualification. Um, if there's no one else, I would say members may proceed to vote. Mr. Myers? Yes. 
Mr. Rivera? Yeah. And the youth member? Yes. On a vote of 11 to 0 with the youth member voting yes, uh, AM 571-2023 has passed the body. Congratulations, Ms. Briggs, and we'll now take the opportunity to swear you in. Come on down. Desiree, would you turn that mic on? Yeah, good work. Yes. Okay, you ready? I'm ready. I drew my hand. I solemnly swear. I solemnly swear. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the State of Alaska. The Constitution of the State of Alaska. And the Charter of Anchorage. And the Charter of Anchorage. And that I will faithfully perform the duties of real estate director to the best of my ability. And that I will faithfully perform the duties of real estate director to the best of my ability. Yay, congratulations. Thank you. Tiffany. Yes, yes, yes. So, Ms. Briggs, you have an option. It's not a mandate, but an option to say something if you like. You got it. One more time. There you go. It's very touchy. I just wanted to say thank you um, to the Assembly and to the Administration, and um, thank you for your support, and I will do you all proud. Thank you. Mr. Turner. Thank you. Next, we have AM 579-2023 Anchorage Equal Rights Commission. Lucy Bauer, action was postponed from 725-2023. Uh, Mr. Rivera made a motion to approve, seconded by Ms. Brawley. The motion to approve is on the floor. Mr. Rivera. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I had a opportunity to talk with Ms. Bauer uh, about her interest in serving on the Anchorage Equal Rights Commission. And um, I came out of my conversation convinced that she met my two criteria uh, of one, qualifications, and two, the idea of doing no harm. Um, I had a good conversation with her, and I look forward to supporting her appointment to the commission. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Anyone else wish to speak to this item? Hearing and seeing none, members may proceed to vote. Oh, were you? I'm sorry, you didn't pop in. There you are. Ms. Bronco, go ahead. I just want to say that I, I exercised some caution last meeting at, because of large co campaign contributions. Um, when I spoke with Ms. Bauer, I just really had a pleasant conversation, and she put me at ease. She said she would feel the same way looking at someone who made very large contributions to a certain party, but she um, checked all the boxes for making sure she was going to be a free thinker. And um, so I'm very happy to support her. All right, thank you very much. So anyone else? All right, seeing and hearing none, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Myers? Yes. Mr. Rivera? Yes. And the youth member? Yes. 
So on a vote of 11 to 0 with the youth member voting yes, AM 579-2023 has passed the body. Next, we have what I believe will be the main event of tonight, AO 2023-65S, an ordinance of the Anchorage Assembly amending Anchorage Municipal Code, Title IX, to promote safety, equity, and access to infrastructure for bicyclists and other vulnerable road users. A public hearing was closed, 7-11. Action was postponed from 7-11. There is no motion pending. What's the will of the body? Move to approve the S-1 version. I have a motion to approve second. the S-1. Is there a second? Second, this is Brawley. Moved by Mr. Volland, seconded by Ms. Brawley, the S-1 version. Mr. Volland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, well, uh, first, I, I want to... Justice for Bashar! Justice for Bashar! Justice for Bashar! Security. Justice for Bashar! Justice for Bashar! Security. Can we summon APD? Would you pause the meeting? Thank you. So we have before us AO 2023-65S1 that was moved by Mr. Volland and seconded by Ms. Brawley. Um, Mr. Volland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, yeah, I, I want to acknowledge those that helped um, in the process of drafting this ordinance, uh, including our municipal traffic director, Brad Coy. I um, also want to thank members of Bike Anchorage who contributed. I want to thank the Alaska Black Caucus for re reviewing the ordinance and submitting comments, <coughs> and um, the Equity Committee of the Assembly uh, for doing the same. Um, and I want to thank my co-sponsors for, for all of their work and feedback and input um, into this and how they helped uh, improve this legislation. So leg legislation <coughs> has a few purposes. Number one is to set groundwork, to set a, a framework and a shared language for active transportation terms like protected bike lanes, cycle tracks, vulnerable road users, etc. Um, many of those are terms that are used <coughs> by <coughs> transportation um, um, officials nationally, uh, including U.S. DOT, um, and so I think that that will be helpful. Uh, and, and then the other purposes of this uh, legislation are to assert the rights of vulnerable road users to use our public roadways when appropriate, and also to use uh, protected bike lane infrastructure when appropriate. Um, additionally, the what we are calling the Anchorage Stop, our version of the, the Idaho, Idaho Stop, which has been um, adopted by many other uh, jurisdictions and has been shown to increase uh, safety for vulnerable road users and reduce crash rates. Um, so there's a safety purpose. And then lastly, to address equity component, an equity component. Um, as members may recall from the work session and the presentation that we gave um, and also the citations uh, that are in the ordinance itself, um, there are national reports that have demonstrated that often uh, there is a trend nationally uh, for non-motorized uh, laws to uh, maybe not be evenly applied. And so as Anchorage makes a mode shift into more active transportation. And, and what I hope is that as we continue to build out a, a high safety, high comfort um, bicycle network um, and a, you know, work through the AMATS process and, and other, other processes to make our non-motorized infrastructure safer, um, that we maybe take a long, hard look at some of our, our rules and code for non-motorized travel and think about are they serving us and um, how are they being enforced? Are they being enforced? Should, um, should they be enforced? Um, and how are we creating um, accessibility for, for all of Anchorage uh, in order to safely use non-motorized travel? Also just want to make it very clear that my overarching theme is transportation choice. So this is not about cars versus bikes or cars versus pedestrians. This is about you should be able to choose your method of navigating our city safely, get from point A to B, point A to point B, get to your destination safely, however you choose to travel. And I personally think we have a long way to go when it comes to um, to ensuring the safety and accessibility of non-motorized travel here in our city. 
Um, with that, we have received feedback. One of the more controversial um, components in the ordinance that we've heard about from the public was our um, idea to repeal uh, the requirement for um, for Anchorage residents under 16 um, to wear a helmet and its associ associated citation. And I think that there are, you know, we have to very carefully weigh trade-offs of, um, you know, of sometimes, you know, what does safety mean, right? Originally, my thought was, well, I don't know if, if a kid's not wearing a helmet, should that potentially risk a, a, you know, an encounter with law enforcement that might be intimidating or they would get in trouble or they or their family would have to pay a fine. Um, but I do appreciate um, the memorandum that was submitted by the chair um, in terms of the CDC's recommendations and feedback about helmet law. I also, um, we laid on the table earlier tonight a memo um, that kind of speaks to that as well. And that was something that I submitted and I think that it actually supports um, the chair's memo as well. But I, I do want to point to this conclusion really quickly. Um, and this is, a, this is a paper from Injury Epidemiology. And it talked about, the, the title of the article is Bicycle Helmet Laws and Persistent Racial and Ethnic Helmet Use Disparities Among Urban High School Students, a Repeated Cross-Sectional Analysis. Um, and it talked about helmet use um, the conclusion essentially helmet use increased across racial ethnic subpopulations with bicycle helmet laws. So they, bicycle helmet laws do generally increase helmet usage, um, but they saw greater increases among white students, um, which increased disparities. And they, they suggest that policymakers should couple laws with other approaches to reduce helmet disparities and cycling injuries. And I say all that just to say that I think that if we can, if we keep a version of a, um, a helmet requirement uh, in municipal, co municipal code, we also need to make sure that lower income families have access to helmets. And so I hope um, that that is work that we can do as a body is to um, do some education and maybe some funding um, for, for helmet donations. Because I just want to make sure that if we keep this as a requirement, then I, I also think it's incumbent on us to make sure that uh, we can get helmets in the hands of our kids and do everything we can to, to ensure that they, they can um, bike safely and meet that requirement. Uh, with that, I would like to move amendment number two, which I feel like is a good compromise between the S1 and some of the feedback that we've heard from the public. Second. And so uh, what this would do... Amendment two uh, go by ahead, Mr. Sir. Bowen. This is moved by Mr. Bowen and seconded by Ms. Brawley. Mr. Bowen. What this would do is rework the helmet requirement. It still obviates the fine, the citation. Um, it would insert new language that you can see before you uh, that, that would say wearing a bicycle helmet is mandatory for any person 15 years of age or younger when on a bicycle in public places. Public places include, but are not limited, limited to, streets, sidewalks, pathways, trails, parking lots, and skate parks. Failure to wear a bicycle helmet or other protective headgear is a traffic violation, which shall result in a verbal statement of the legal requirement and encouragement to obtain and wear a bicycle helmet while cycling. A monetary fine shall not be issued for a violation of this section. And as you can see in the, uh, the purpose and summary of the amendment, um, we feel like this is more in line with our goal to shift public safety policy away from enforcement and punishment and instead focus on better street design and injury prevention. All right, so thank folks you, Mr. in the queue, uh, Ms. Brawley. Yeah, thank you. Just briefly, um, I will first echo what uh, Mr. Bolin said. I think it was well stated and reflects the um, intent of this uh, amendment. And then I also just want to acknowledge, um, you know, as somebody who's worked in public health um, for the, since the time that I moved here, um, I do have to respect the CDC and the evidence base. However, I also know um, that there are areas where um, over time there's, there's reconsideration of that evidence base. And I'll use the example of alcohol control. There are many policies designed to prevent and reduce underage drinking that essentially rely on law enforcement to do that. And those, some of those have had unintended consequences in this state. Um, and that, it, that is a separate topic, but I think it's related just to 
say that um, the evidence base is an evolving, um, evolving piece, and I think we really do need to take an equity lens to some of the assumptions that were made maybe 20, 30 years ago in developing that evidence base. That said, um, certainly wearing helmets is an, is an evidence-based practice. It is good for folks, um, and having such laws is also good. And so um, I also want to point to the CDC report, though, because you know they are not necessarily saying that enforcement alone is the answer, but it says the effectiveness of bicycle helmet laws will be influenced by their implementation. And it talks about pub uh, public education campaigns, uh, free and discounted helmets, you know, really other programs again to encourage behavior. And so, um, and so in the spirit of that, this amendment is offered, and um, at least it's it's my intent, and I believe the other sponsors as well, to continue exploring how to make helmets more available to kids um, in in a positive environment. So we don't have a specific policy to bring on that point beyond this amendment, um, but that is something that we want to look at, especially looking at our 2024 budget. Ms. Zolotol. Thank you. Um, so with regards to amendment number two, I guess my concern is I, I appreciate the intent, but shall result in a verbal statement of the legal requirement and encouragement to obtain and wear a bicycle helmet and a monetary fine shall not be issued. How do we track those verbal warnings? How do we know if we have re blatant repeat offenders? How do we, how do we <coughs> keep track of those things, right? Like, I believe, and the chief can correct me, um, if I am pulled over and I get a verbal warning for something I've done in my car, I feel like there's some record there, at least that I was maybe pulled over. Maybe, maybe not. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm worried about this idea that it's just, what, verbal statements, like over and over of the legal requirement, and, and what is that going to look like? Um, versus just requiring it to be what it was. And the fine, it sounds like, is pretty discretionary as to whether it's actually issued. So then the APD would be able to determine, oh, well, we've cited you, you know, how many ever times for not wearing a helmet, maybe the $25 fine, you know. I don't know. It feels like it should be more of like a fix-it ticket get a helmet and get rid of the fine. It is. It is currently. If it, oh, great. It currently is. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm, I'm more in favor of amendment number one, which just takes it back to how it was. Because I don't see practically how we make this happen with any kind of effectiveness. Otherwise, you might as well just say a helmet's required, period. And that there's no penalty or um, consequence to not wearing one because the consequence actually needs to be something I think that can be documented and um, possibly progressive in nature for habitual offenders. Um, so that's where I'm at with it. Mr. Constant. Thank you. So I align very much with Ms. Zolotel. I would add just a couple of other thoughts. And Ms. Brawley, I appreciate you made the argument that uh, policy positions can be reconsidered. Uh, in light of what I presented as an AIM. And I would offer that the AIM that I presented from the CDC was published in 2022. And the AIM that's coming forward relating to injury epidemiology is dated 2016. And so it, it, it is possible that policy decisions can be reconsidered or studies in science. I agree. Um, you know, I am very sensitized to this idea of kids rolling around without helmets on. It does happen in neighborhoods of low income that kids don't have helmets, don't wear helmets at a much higher proportion. And that's not good. And the question is, is our intervention to make it so that there's less motivation for them to have helmets or to come up ways to motivate them? Because I'm a firm believer in motivational um, processes, not just punitive processes. But we have learned, at least in one case since I've been on the body, quite a little bit about the function of a de minimis fine and how it can make a policy effective much more effective than a policy with no fine. And so what comes to mind is the discussions we had and the policy we made on the bag ban. And science shows when they study these processes, when uh, people are asked do you want to spend five cents or 10 cents for a plastic bag or paper bag? They will opt to not have a bag 
But if there's no fee, they will take the bag, even though they know it's not a great thing for the environment and for all of the reasons that go down that line of policy. And so for my part, I think that having some form of concrete message that says this is our policy is that if you don't have a helmet on in your child riding there will be a fine and then it can be fixed by getting a helmet and I agree 100% with the argument that we should come up with a new program where kids get bike helmets because that's happened in this town many times since I've been here it's usually the fire department that is the one providing those helmets that's been my experience that and and children getting their car seats checked out and that kind of thing so I want to support amendment number one, and I'm not gonna support this amendment only because of that feature that removes a small penalty that's rarely used that is the hook that gets parents recognizing that their kids need to do this. Thank you, Mr. Cross. Thank you. Uh, yeah, actually I support the uh, volunteer amendment of waiving the $25 fee. Ultimately, it's gonna come back to our police officers and their interaction and just trusting that they're gonna have a good relationship with the public. Uh, I'm born and raised here. I used to ride a dirt bike to elementary school back in the 70s and early 80s and there wasn't any helmet law. Um, it, was, it was just uh, wild, reckless abandon on anything in two wheels for all over the hillside. But I remember Officer Mike, who knew me, my brother, too well um, for violating a lot of the keep your, bi keep your dirt bikes off the roads, uh, you know, and keep them in the ditch. And, and, and his encouragement for us to take care of ourselves and his stories that he would tell us about accidents he had seen, how important it is for us and how much he, you know, he knew our dad and stuff. And I just remember that feeling of like, you know, I could trust this gentleman and I knew that he wanted what was best for me. And I think that's really what makes a difference in kids. Not an authoritative, like, look out, this guy's going to come to cite you. But this is a, this is a, our police officers are representatives. They come up from our community. The representatives of our community, they have a special place, I think, if, you know, um, in, 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 in what they do in order to keep and maintain safety. And it was just that trust that we had that Officer Mike was looking out for us that said, you know what, wear a helmet because I don't want to let this guy down. And then uh, every once in a while, I can't remember if he had McDonald's ice cream coupons and stuff like that, but he'd see us and say, hey, yeah, good job keeping your dirt bike off the, tra off the road. And uh, it was just a different relationship. I know we don't, it's, we've come a long way and things have got convoluted, but you know, I think ultimately what I'm saying is I just trust our officers that when they're, when they're, when they're addressing children, my concern is citing them for not wearing a helmet or whatever like that doesn't, doesn't solve the problem. It doesn't make a child trust law and authority. What it does is it comes back is that you have meaning, you have value. I, you please wear a helmet because you're too precious to cause harm and how can we help you? And when that's the message, you get kids wearing helmets. So I don't think it's about the 25 bucks. I think it's about a relationship of our law enforcement and how they impact children when they have, that, when they have those, those unfortunate run-ins. Thank you. So uh, Ms. Brongo. I really, um, as a former elementary health teacher, I was a bit conflicted with this by saying helmets are not required. And so I'm really happy to have helmets in here. I'm also happy that there is not a fine. Um, I don't think that affects change. Uh, no matter how many lessons we had, how much we told kids how important their brains were, I live in the neighborhood of the school I taught in, and it would just drive me bananas watching those kids zipping all around the neighborhood. No matter how much they seem to get the message about helmets, it's up to the parents. And if the parents don't make them wear them, you can't do anything about it. And I know from at both of my schools, the fire department would give helmets to any kid who came to the fire department with their parents to get fitted. They also brought a whole pile of them to the school and the nurses passed them out. And the same kids that you'd see marching off with a helmet one day would ride to school without one the next. So it's, it's really a hard thing to enforce. And I love that the police officers in our town will give out ice cream coupons, some positive reinforcement. Uh, I have a, a quick story about one year I was going to try to really be the, the health teacher and I said anytime I see you wearing a helmet 
in the neighborhood riding around, I'm going to give you $10. And it happened to be the summer that I was painting my house, and um, these kids were going round and round the block <laughs> with their helmets on, and uh, I, had to, I had to stop painting for the day. I'm like, I didn't see you. <laughs> anyway, I think this is important, this ordinance. I think the helmet is good to leave in, and I appreciate all the work um, that Member Boland and Member Brawley did, and our legal counsel. Yeah, hope it all passes. Thank you, Ms. Brawley. Yeah, thank you. And I'll keep this brief. I know folks want to um, discuss. Um, so to speak to the current practice, um, we did reach out to APD, and they explained, um, and also the, the uh, numerical data bore out that there, there aren't many tickets being issued for this, and it is pretty primarily verbal warnings. So granted, those are not necessarily tracked in our system, um, but the data does speak to that point. Um, second, I just want to um, raise issue with the idea of a fee versus a fine. Um, I do certainly see the value of, of fees, and then um, I do want to just stress that fines are, are punishments versus um, you know, a fee for service or a fee for a particular use. Um, and then I also just want to acknowledge you know, the different um, communities in our town have complex relationships with law enforcement. I, and so I think that's a conversation that we're going to continue to have on a lot of different fronts. Um, and it's one that I, you know, I struggle with because I, um, I think all of the points raised so far are, are good ones. Um, but what it comes down to is I don't support issuing tickets to kids. Because um, what we're talking about, granted, it does go to the parent, um, but essentially the person violating the law is a person under the age of 16, so not really even old enough to work, or just barely. And so um, just for me, philosophically, the other work I've done in public health, the other work I've done in, um, you know, really how do we encourage or how do we mandate um, positive behaviors? You know, mandates don't, don't always go as far as we had hoped. And so I really see the value in, in questioning some of those things and stepping back from our approach of punishment. Thank you. Mr. Volland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I forgot to say some, something earlier, and that is this is partially also birthed out of the fact that um, we did hear from APD at the work session, um, and one of the things that Chief Curl shared was um, it, it's helpful for APD to be able to back up the parents. You know, parents want to be able to tell teenagers, you have to wear your helmet, it's the law, and then if a kid were to ask the police, well, you know, we, you, I think we want, we do want police and parents to be able to sing from the same sheet of music. Um, so I hope that having this in here, that yes, it is a requirement, and yes, the, you know, you can have a verbal um, statement that it's, that it is a requirement and an encouragement, um, that that gives uh, parents some, some reassurance too. Thank you. Mr. Martinez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. When I first uh, saw that the, there was a, a potential repeal of helmets, yeah, I strongly oppose that because my first priority is protect brains and protect our babies' brains and our children's brains by any, by any means necessary. And, and, and on that front, the municipality has done some tremendous work on children's health. So the first and foremost for me is that I love seeing this come back I, I don't support the Second Amendment. I support a full repeal, uh, similar to the First Amendment. But I want to get into why. So helmets, yes. I love that we've recognized that data doesn't show an abuse of the discretion of our, of our APD code today. There isn't any data that suggests that we have uh, uh, violations or APD is abusing their discretion today. So I don't like fixing problems that don't exist as well. That's one challenge for me. Two, when you work with labor, and, and, and especially unions, you recognize that safety rules, what they will tell you is safety rules are often written in blood of those who came before, or that, that when you, before you had the, the laws, before you had the, 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 the standards, people suffered and sacrificed. And so when I think of it from that vantage point, I don't want to see blood tell us that we made the wrong decision. I advocated for education and distribution, and I think that's a tremendous opportunity. You know, we have the, the, the Center for Injury Prevention 
They are the ones that work with the grants, with the fire departments to make sure we distribute those things across our community. So I love the equity lens in education and distribution. I think it's important because it's more than an equity lens of just race, it's also class and, 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 and financial resources. Now having said that, I scoff at the idea to say, uh, don't speed in Anchorage. It's a traffic law and we just get a warning. I, I already probably violate a five to 10 mile per hour speed limit, depending on where I'm driving today. And, uh, and I say that because you, fl you go with the flow of traffic. But imagine if there was no, no, uh, yeah, well, you know, we know what it is. Uh, imagine if there was no at all um, penalty. I think that's an interesting vantage point to say that we will encourage verbally, but there is no penalty. And I think of my 14-year-old, and what my 14-year-old will say is, well, if there ain't no penalty, there is no rule. That's how my 14-year-old will think about it. And I have to constantly challenge myself every day to make sure that I'm adequately providing the support, the education, and a framework of a penalty to my child. And so I wouldn't want to remove the language of the penalty. I want to continue to reinforce the discretion that we have in a, a, across our police force. That may require additional training over time as we, as we track the data. But, uh, but just to recognize that to in encourage behavior is not just a matter of saying, uh, you know, do better often. Sometimes you often have a code with some penalty in it. And I don't see this penalty as punitive as much as I see it as uh, uh, educational opportunity. So maybe the language potentially is to be clear that the parents get the tickets um, rather than that it's just the way it says in the code today where it's just a ticket will be issued in the event of uh, of, of the penalty or the infraction. So maybe we're just clarifying that up because I, do, I don't think there's an argument that says children get tickets and I don't think the data supports that. Um, if it was, I would be all over this uh, immediately, incredibly aggressive on this. I just want to make sure that we have the best opportunity for our young people to have protected brains, that we have a community that does not roll away every piece of enforcement or enforceable code, and that we have uh, just a better approach to this, so I will not be uh, supporting the Second Amendment. I will be supporting the, uh, the constant amendment of the full rollback and a repeal of that uh, um, action item. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Salt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'm glad to see the helmets are back, and we are aligned on that. And I agree with Mr. Martinez that we have to have a penalty. You know, the assembly is a makeup of our community. APD is a makeup of our community. They're going to behave as 99.9% .9 of us would. Those that get uh, citations or talked to by an officer for not wearing a helmet, 99.9% .9 of them are going to respond the right way. But you need that penalty for that 0.1%. We see it in Anchorage today. We see it in our school districts. I've personally experienced it. When there is no penalty, why should I listen to you? We see our security guards at Cars and Fred's that have zero authority to stop anyone. And so you walk in there, shoplifters grab something, and I've seen it. Walk right out, look them in the eye. You're not gonna do a thing to me. I'm gonna keep on walking. You have to have the penalty or that 0.1%. Otherwise, there's no authority given to that person who's trying to maintain peace and, and help, and help protect the brains of our kids. So I, like others, will support one, but not two. Thank you. So I don't see anyone else in the queue. Members may proceed to vote on Amendment 2. Mr. Myers? No. Mr. Rivera? Yes. The youth member? No. On a vote of four to seven, amendment two fails to pass and the youth member voted no. So I have myself in the queue. Mr. Constant. Thank you, I'd move constant amendment one, if I can find it. Thank you, Ms. Salatel. 
So Constant Amendment 1. Sorry, is there, oh, sorry. moved by Mr. Constant, is there a second? Second. And seconded by Mr. Martinez. Mr. Constant? Thank you. So uh, effectively what this does is it does restore the bicycle helmet requirement and maintains the fee schedule. Um, I think that Mr. Martinez, I think, spoke most eloquently to this much better than I could. So I would just urge your support of this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Constant. Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing, hearing none, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Myers? Yeah. Mr. Rivera? Yeah. And the youth member? Uh, yes. Yes, so on a vote of nine to two with the youth member voting yes, that amendment has been adopted. So this one is a little trickier. Mr. Constant. Thank you. I would, at least for discussion purposes, con move Constant Amendment 3. Is there a second? Constant Amendment number 3 has been moved. Is there a second? This one addresses lights. Second. Seconded by Mr. Cross. Mr. Constant. Thank you. So this one is a very interesting and tricky issue. I understand the principle of wanting to get barriers and burdens out of the way. I had it really plainly expressed to me that Alaskans bicycle in a majority of the year in the dark, at least at least half of the year, where it's darker than anywhere else. And I'm not strident about this, but I think that having bike lights on bikes is one very effective way for people to be seen and for them to be able to see where they're going. So I would urge your support on this amendment. Ms. Zalatel. Thank you. Um, you know, I think the middle ground on the lamp requirement is that maybe, so I'm going to support this amendment, but maybe over time code could be refined to say uh, bicycle lamp or reflective gear. I find that reflective gear or a lamp, I, I find this to be somewhat equivalent, um, but I didn't come up with that before right this moment, so I don't have an amendment that would do that, but I think that would be a refinement and an accessibility piece as well. Um, I don't know um, how you all like to outfit yourselves when you bike in the dark, but um, a, a lamp might be expensive um, proposition, but you might otherwise have reflective gear because you are otherwise walking. Um, or um, I know kids often get access to reflective tape or backpack straps or other things. So um, I could see this coming back for further refinement. Thank you. Ms. Brawley. Yeah, thank you. Um, I certainly, again, support um, the goal of, of keeping folks safe on the road, um, but also I will speak to the same point that I don't believe, and granted this is not just minors, this would be uh, adults or kids could, um, could be violating this particular piece of code, but I believe that um, that there are other ways besides uh, punishment to to achieve those goals. And I do, um, I really appreciate the comments by Member Zalatel. I think that is a good idea to think more broadly, given that technology changes. Um, and for just as an example, I saw somebody biking the other day, and they had put uh, reflective tape in each of the spokes of their wheels in a big spiral. So not only was it um, useful, but it was also just kind of fun to watch. And so, um, so again, I think we can think more creatively. Thank you. Mr. Cross. Yeah, so, uh, you know, my original hypothesis was, you know, less, you know, arduous enforcement of the safety standards because the officers are going to enforce at their discretion. But, I mean, um, you know, it makes sense, though, doesn't it, not to, not to repeal the light. If we're going to give more liberties to individuals on bikes and we're looking at an increase in biking traffic for e-bikes and everything, and we're going to encourage more people riding bikes, I don't think it's wise at the same time to repeal safety requirements for them. If you're looking at putting more bikes on the road, I think making sure that they're well lit and teaching because the biggest harm that we have, the biggest issue that we have, whether anybody's on, been on a motorcycle in Alaska knows this, come May or June when comes our riding season, all these cyclists, I mean, all these automobile drivers are not used to looking for motorcycles or looking for bikes. They roll through stop signs and stuff. So I think, um, you know, unfortunately that is just what happens. You go months without seeing two wheels on the road, unless it's a fat tire guy and they're the exception, not the rule. But 
you know, just if we're going to be encouraging more bicycle activity, we're going to encourage more uh, in, in treating yellow and treating red lights like yellows and yields, and we're going to allow more uh, malleability of these uh, of bicyclists on the roads, then it would make sense to not repeal some of our safety standards. Thank you. Ms. Martinez. Thank you, Chair. I wanted to appreciate uh, Member Zaltel's point about, you know, improving this over time um, to include other technology, uh, especially when we think of the, 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 the issues with respect to the cost and the, the, the barriers for different folks in our community for having, you know, the, the certain requirements that we have here. But I uh, support the LAMP requirements. And, you know, it's interesting as I think about the, the culture of we want more bikes and, and, and how to kind of have more people aware. When you actually have something to, to hold people accountable, even before law enforcement, just from each other, when you actually have something to hold people accountable, I, I found that that makes, that makes a whole world of, of sense in the community because, uh, you know, when you get to yell, uh, when you get to tell someone, hey, man, that's, you can't make that turn, uh, people learn at those moments an opportunity in community. And so when, uh, when you eliminate things that are high-level safety, I mean, just the amount of time that we ride in the dark, the amount of intergenerational traffic we have on the trails, the amount of activity that we want to grow, I just think the more safety and the more education, the better. So I would be supporting this. Thank you. Anyone else? Hearing and seeing none, members may proceed to vote. Oh, Ms. Bronca, sorry. You got in just in time. I'm sorry, I'm always late there. I just, you know, along this line, those of you who bike, do you have a light on your bike? Yes or no, I do not. In the winter, on my fat tire bike, but my, you know, so a lot of us don't have, well, nobody's going to answer me. Though. No, most people don't have lights on their bikes that I know of, and so I feel like the reflector, as um, Ms. Zoltel mentioned, would be more appropriate, and I know that kids, like 90% of them don't have the light on their bike unless they're, you know, from an affluent neighborhood and have power outdoor parents, they don't have that. Ms. Bond. Thank you. You know, it's an interesting night to be having this discussion. Um, I'm not going to support this amendment. And this, you know, this is something that I think is cited more frequently than the helmet thing. And as Member Brawley pointed out, this, this applies to adults as well. We're in a meeting where body cameras have been a topic of conversation. We had a protest. I mean, it's just, I hope that members had an opportunity to review the NACTO Breaking the Cycle Report, um, which is National Association of City Transportation Officials, as well as the Arrested Mobility Report, um, and just read about what are some of the trends um, when it comes to enforcement of these issues nationally. And I guess as we set the stage and we, we're encouraging active transportation in our city, um, what I will be hoping for going forward, because I think this amendment is going to pass, um, is a very high quality of data from APD on enforcement and which demographics enforcement is applied to. Because I do think that we need to be cognizant of, um, of equity um, in our community. And there is a value, there is a safety value of getting more people um, out of cars and onto bikes and on being able to travel on foot. Um, when less people are driving at any given time, that means less risk of uh, a car hitting someone. And typically, in a collision between a car and a vulnerable road user, it's the vulnerable road user who, who suffers the most damage. So um, I, I just hope that we can, we, we get some of those in enforcement metrics in the future because I do think that some of those recommendations that were in those reports are valuable. Thank you. Anyone else? Hearing and seeing none, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Myers? Yeah. Mr. Rivera? No. Oh, it, that one 
that measure on a vote of six to five fails to pass the body. And the youth member? No. Thank you. So um, we'll move on. Next amendment. Do you want someone just to jump in, Chair, or are we going one by one? Uh, sure. Um, amendment number four. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll move amendment, probably in amendment number four. Second. Moved by Mr. Vaughn, seconded by Ms. Brawley. Yeah, just, and just briefly, um, so this is actually a, a technical amendment. It's um, the description is in the amendment. Essentially, it was a, a piece that was intended to um, include a portion for repeal, and it was left out of the S1 version. But um, but I think it's also a good opportunity to highlight, um, you know, the way that our our laws and our understanding and our um, tolerance, I guess, for non-motorized use changes over time. Um, this particular section. Um, is is in the S1 version, and it is for repealing a section of code um, that allows for um, a peace officer or the hearing officer to um, to basically seize and impound a skateboard. Um, and so that was one. When again looking back through our our codes, um, it's clear that that you know. It looks like it was uh, put into the code in the 1990s, um, and if we th we think back to that time, um, I was much younger than I am now, and um, I did never not ever use a skateboard, but I very much remember um, the kind of generational divide or the the kind of subculture of skating and how it was perceived as a public safety threat, and and um, and so I suspect that that the the you know well-intentioned. Um, reason for this ordinance was to address that, but it was really coming from the place that, you know, skateboarders cause problems. And so I think it just really highlights, um, again, how our understanding changes over time, how well-meaning enforcement aimed um, uh, ordinances, ordinances can get into place, and then essentially it was allowing, um, you know, this, the, the government to take kids skateboards. And again, I, I feel that that's not um, wrong, and I don't believe that that's the best um, the best way to handle not allowing skateboarding in certain places. So this amendment essentially is a technical um, addition in order to achieve the goal that's already in the S1 version. Thank you, Ms. Brawley. Anyone else wish to speak to this? So I am going to put myself in the queue briefly. Mr. Constant. So the original language, if, if this amendment is putting it back, I'm wondering if it's just assumed or um, what the standard is, like what this says is any officer issuing a citation may seize as evidence or instrumentality of the offense any device utilized by the cited offender. Is there an evidentiary requirement? Like the cops can't just seize property Right, and I, I honor the police, but this code language seems like it's missing some. So point of clarification for you, Thank Mr. You. Chair, is this would be deleting this language. It was intended to continue to be deleted. I out see, of, okay, okay. It okay. was just missing from the S1. Understood, okay. Thank you. Thanks for the clarification. All right, anyone else? Seeing and hearing none, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Myers? Yeah. Mr. Rivera? Yes. The youth member? Yes. So on a vote of 11 to 0 and the youth member voting yes, that item has passed the body, or excuse me, that amendment has passed. Next amendment we have number 5, Mr. Salt. I'm not going to move that forward. Thank you. All right, thank you. Next amendment is I think sorry. skips. Sorry. Uh, I will I will move amendment 5 forward. All right. Sec Mr. Salt has moved. Ms. Altel has seconded amendment number 5. Mr. Salt. So what this amendment does is it replaces or reinstates the table uh, for fines, so it adds back the fine for bicycle lamp, for bicycle brake requirement, uh, and uh, let's see, I believe that was the two. That's it, those two. Thank you. And these are correctable as well. All right, so Mr. Bond. Thank you. So as I understand the amendment, this is actually um, 
reinstating more of the language that um, the previous amendment, constant amendment number three that we voted down, um, sought to do. So whereas the constant amendment number three sought to reinstate the fine for bicycle lamps, SALT Amendment Number 5 seeks to reinstate the, f the fines for bicycle lamps and bicycle brakes. Um, and so similarly along the lines of uh, my lack of support for Constant Amendment Number 3, I will also uh, not be supporting this amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Alito. Thank you. Um, so the comments on um, the prior amendment by Mr. Voland around the reports, I really appreciate that. and. What we have is, frankly, a lack of data and um, around kind of our conditions, not our built environment, but our environmental conditions. It's dark, it's slippery, it rains, apparently all the time now, um, or it snows all the time now. And so that's where I have this hesitancy. It seems like our, it, our not our, well, our built environment, yes, that, is definitely dangerous, but our environment is just more dangerous for biking. Um, so I'm just still kind of reluctant to remove any opportunity for enforcement. And, and it's really more around repeat offenders, quite frankly, because to me, those feel like folks who could be quite dangerous on the road. Um, or repeat offenders who maybe are stealing bikes and are using them. Um, so I can see how this, these fines can still be a tool that is very judiciously applied and, and takes into consideration um, the concerns um, you, Ms. Brawley, and others have raised around equity. Thank you. All right, anyone else? Hearing and seeing none, now on members may proceed to vote on the amendment. Mr. Myers? Yes. Mr. Rivera? No. The youth member? No. Again, on a vote of six to five, the amendment has failed. So I have one more amendment. It's constant amendment seven. Actually, po point of information, Mr. Chair, um, there's a vote on amendment number eight, too. I, I don't want to make sure that you all have it. Yeah, there's one more. You okay. And I don't know if you, do you want me to move mine first because yours is kind of like a summary of all of them? Sure. Does it, doesn't it matter, matter the order? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. It's okay, fine. so I'll move um, amendment number eight. Vote on amendment number eight. So this is. Um, is there a second? Oh, yeah, sure. Second. So the amendment by Mr. Vaughn, seconded by Ms. Brawley. Thank you. I was asked a very interesting question on the language about treating a stop signal, a stop light, as a stop sign, uh, the dead red. Who is at fault if a cyclist, you know, a cyclist under the ordinance is supposed to stop at a stop, uh, stop light? The stop light doesn't change because much of our, uh, many of our signals are not. Um, weighted for bicyclists so they won't change so you just have a, a vulnerable road user hanging out in the intersection for a longer period of time which causes them to be more exposed to potential collision um, in the intersection um, but who's at fault it's incumbent on the cyclist to stop check make sure they have the right of way that there's no cross traffic and then proceed but if a car has a green light and they hit the cyclist then who's at fault and so I would argue that the cyclist is at fault uh, because it is incumbent on them to yield the right of way. And so this uh, is language to make that clear. Um, it says a collision occurring under these circumstances, these circumstances being the dead red stop, shall be, and I, I'm going to have to have maybe an attorney like uh, Member Zolotel help me pronounce this, prima facie, am I saying that? Evidence of the bicyclist failure to yield the right of way if the bicyclist is involved in a collision with either a motor vehicle in the intersection or junction of roadways, or a pedestrian or other vulnerable road user lawfully within the adjacent crosswalk. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, Ms. Brawley. Yeah, thank you. Just speaking in support of this, um, and 
and I just want to paint the picture. Um, you know, the, the dead red stop is really contemplating, for example, um, if you're a cyclist, you're sitting at an empty intersection um, that, has, that has lights. It's a lighted intersection. Uh, no one's around. Do you wait multiple cycles potentially um, if the light doesn't trigger for you because you're not heavy enough the way a car is to, to trigger, trigger that signaling um, if that's the, oh, and perhaps motorcycles as well. Um, which are not considered uh, vulnerable road users here. Um, but, but essentially in that situation, what, what this avoids is that, you know, for example, a bicyclist proceeds through, you know, even though there is a red light, again, no cars at this intersection, so it is safe to do so otherwise. Um, and then they get pulled over and get a ticket for that. And so that is what it's addressing. So it is not intended to uh, give folks, you know, the green light, so to speak, um, and, and, and create unsafe behaviors on the road. And so I think this amendment really speaks to, to the fact that there is still, um, you know, certainly there's, there's determined of fault in a collision um, there you need to look at every case um, but it really makes that very clear in this instance thanks all right uh, miss Zolotel um, thank you so I have a couple of questions about this um, because I don't see and maybe it's in the chapter and it's just not in the area being amended um, do we define what's an intersection because I'm curious do we ever have signalized intersections without crosswalks because there's two different situations contemplated under this amendment. Um, so if Mr. Coy wants to start to make his way up. Um, the other question I have, which is legal, is do we use prima facie evidence anywhere else in code? That seems like a real specific thing. I, I understand what we're getting at, but is that something we typically do in code? So which, whoever wants to go first, those are my first two questions. Mr. Hurt. Yeah, as I see nobody making their way to the podium, I guess that uh, by default that will make me. Um, the term prima facie is used um, in various instances in the code. Um, however, I don't see any within Title IX itself just doing a cursory look. Um, but there are at least 19 instances of it being used in code. So it's not, ex I mean, it's unusual, but I would not say it's exceptional. Mr. Coy. Yeah, so uh, Brad Coy, Municipal Traffic Engineer. Uh, through the chair, the defini definitions section of Title IX does have a definition for intersection. It says, intersection means, A, the area embraced within the prolongation or connection of the lateral curb lines, or if none, within the lateral boundary lines of the roadways of two highways joining one another at or approximately at right angles, or the area within which vehicles traveling upon different highways joining at any other angle may come into conflict. So that's a long way of saying, when you have two roads that intersect, that's an intersection. Well. So to clarify, the reason for the question is because where this is situated in the proposed ordinance is with these particularized stops where you're going to treat a stoplight like a stop sign and yield. And so one, um, I'm curious, do we have, and, and then it proposes, well, one instance where you could be in an intersection or junction of roadways, I, I get what an intersection is. However, it also says when someone is within an adjacent crosswalk. So do we have signalized intersections without crosswalks? Yeah, through the chair. So there are some intersections that crossings on certain legs are not allowed, where you'll see a sign, you know, mm -hmm. no crossing here. Otherwise, we do have crosswalks at most legs of the intersection. Uh, one other thing that's probably helpful as well as if you look through some of the code language. The intersection is considered to start on the outside of the crosswalk, further from the center of the intersection. So the crosswalk, all vehicles and bikes as they are approaching are to stop prior to the crosswalk. Uh, and so once they cross that line where the crosswalk is, that's considered the intersection. So crosswalks are kind of part of that intersection envelope that you could you could say. Well, that's the problem I'm having actually is 
is a crosswalk distinguished enough or always marked from an intersection? Because the way this is written suggests two different ways to be at fault. So if a pedestrian was just in the intersection, that wouldn't fall within this. But they're, if they're in the crosswalk, it would. Like, I, and I know it's a little picky, but since we're saying it's prima facie evidence of fault, I guess I just want to be really clear on how it will work. So anyway, um, I'm happy to listen some more and see if it gets clearer. Mr. Martinez. <clears throat> yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, just on this, um, as I read this, uh, this, this amendment, it just highlights something that I want to repeat, which is we need robust education, uh, not only to what's going on, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think most folks are aware of any of what we're describing in terms of in the code, but we have lots of bike users. And so if we're going to change code to make things uh, different than what at least the, the kind of the, the, the general things that people have at, at, in terms of their impressions of the law, and we're going to change some real structural things. I just want to make sure that we continue to recognize that we need some strong, robust education around any of the changes that we're making, and um, especially as we want to increase and grow uh, bike use across our community. Thank you. Ms. Brawley. Yeah, uh, thank you. I actually think maybe Mr. Hurt was going to respond, but I did find one instance of uh, prima facie in Title IX. It is, um, sorry, I'll just read it off now. Um, it is a 9.52.035 presumption of violation of inspection and maintenance requirements for vehicles. All right, so Mr. Hurt took himself out, Mr. Rowland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So on page six of the S1 version, this may, I hope, get at well, at least maybe be helpful for what uh, Member Zolotel's question was. Um, so starting, well, actually just uh, subsection D there. This is under essentially how to, how to behave at a steady red indication. A person riding a bicycle on the roadway facing any steady red signal which fails to, to change to a green light shall have the right to, to proceed subject to the rules stated herein. After stopping, the bicyclist shall yield the right of way to any vehicle in or near the intersection or approaching on a roadway so closely as to constitute, constitute a, an immediate hazard during the time such a bicyclist is moving across or within the intersection or junction of roadways. Such bicyclist shall yield the right of way to vulnerable road users lawfully within an adjacent crosswalk and to other traffic lawfully using the intersection. So it, it does say that they have to yield to other traffic in the intersection. I don't know if that's helpful. So that's where I'm getting stuck because it's traffic in the intersection, but what about pedestrians in the intersection? It only applies to pedestrians and crosswalks, and there may not always be a crosswalk at a signalized intersection. And, or what if the pedestrian chooses not to use the crosswalk? So I think the question then is, does, is traffic an inclusive term? Does that include vulnerable road users, or is that just motor vehicle traffic? I think I, I would think that it would be inclusive of vulnerable road users. And then also, um, Member Brawley pointed out, can I see this, Anna? Yes. Is that the S1 version? Yes. So within the ordinance, there is, oh shoot, I lost it. There's a, uh, under general principles, so on page three, um, sort of a hierarchy of, of right of way and who yields to who. Um, I'm gonna no. interrupt everyone for just a moment. Sorry, I would like to ask for a motion to extend debate by 20 minutes. So moved. Second. Is there any objection? Hearing and seeing none, the debate's extended for 20 minutes. Thank you. Proceed. Can I come back after Karen? Karen's in the queue. I'm, I, I want to find the reference. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Bronga. I hope this doesn't muddy the water, but I was looking at dead reds and the motorcycle part. It says over 20 states in the U.S. have enacted dead red laws to give motorcycles and sometimes bicycles 
sickle is an affirmative defense to proceed if the light doesn't change. So apparently it happens as much to motorcycles as bicycles and then, you know, we could get into the problem of why are the bicycles more important than the motorcycles and can they run the red as well? All right, um, but, so we'll come back to you, Mr. Vaughan. Uh, Mr. Hurt? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to respond to member, or sorry, Vice Chair Zolotel's uh, earlier statement about the meaning of traffic. Um, Title IX already has an established meaning for traffic, which includes pedestrians, ridden or herded animals, vehicles, or other conveyances. So it's a very broad term, so long as there's no you know, modifier such as motor traffic or bicycle traffic or something like that, where the term just says traffic, it means you have to yield to herded animals, apparently. So it's it's a very broad term as the code is written. But we'll come back to you. Okay, thank you. Yep, so it is under the general, general principles on page three, subsection B. Um, it says, wherever there is doubt or ambiguity, travelers shall yield the right of way to the more vulnerable road users. So motor vehicles shall yield to bicycles and other non-motorized traffic, which in turn shall yield to pedestrians. Um, so I, hopefully um, we can have confidence bet between that and um, as um, Mr. Hurt just pointed out, traffic being inclusive of everything from pedestrians to a herd of alpacas, um, that we could move forward. Thank you. So I have myself in the queue. Mr. Constant. Thank you. So this amendment, I think, is valuable. I, I don't know how APD would enforce it, how the prosecutors would address it. I, I don't know how that actually works on their end because it feels like it's very complex. And uh, except for in intersections where there are cameras operating, going to be a judgment call, which is very difficult to apply. But that's not my point. <clears throat> my point, I'm thinking about the last time I witnessed a, a bicyclist blast through an intersection and almost cause an accident was not at a red light, was at a stop sign. And we have created under this section of code, if it is adopted, an offering that suggests that if it's safe, they can not stop at a stop sign too. And so what is the, does this principle generalized to stop signed intersections too? And if so, is it warranted to include in that section? Or am I just off base there? Because again, my ex recent experience was I watched a bicyclist blast through an intersection without any caution and nearly caused a wreck. Uh, Ma'am, please, please, you're creating a disturbance. Thank you. Do you want me to respond? Please. Um, you know, I, I think there's pretty good um, evidence, data ab about other jurisdictions who, who have adopted the, the other piece that you're talking about, treating a stop sign as a yield. Uh, when Idaho, Idaho did that back in the 1980s, cr um, crashes at those type of intersections went down over 14%. Delaware, which adopted that much later in uh, 2017, saw a 23% um, reduction in crashes with cyclists. Um, so, you know, I, I, guess, I guess my preference would just to be to make this applicable just to um, the stop uh, the stop lights, not the stop signs. I would say it at typically at a stop sign intersection, you're not going to have the same volume of traffic as you would at a stop light, a signalized intersection. And um, ad additionally, um, this ordinance does not contemplate allowing a cyclist to blast through a stop sign. It, it does require that they slow and check right away and then can proceed. Um, so I think, uh, I, I, I certainly understand your point about, you know, who, who proves who's at fault, right? Um, if it's not an uh, intersection with the camera. Um, but I think with that good safety data, I, I for me, at least I have enough um, peace of mind moving the, the, the stop sign portion forward unamended. Thank you. And it wouldn't be fair if I didn't say at that same intersection I see cars slow down and not stop all the time already doing this but with their cars. And so I'm ambivalent. Uh, Mr. Salt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So for me, the, the stop sign piece I can live with. 
Um, so if I am stopped in a vehicle at a stop sign and a, and a bicyclist or vulnerable user pauses and rolls through the stop sign in front of me, I'm still stopped. I'm not going to move forward because I see them. No one's going to get hurt. No harm, no foul there. And I think what this is trying to address is where a vulnerable user, bicyclist, motorcyclist, whatever, sits at a red light for 120 seconds, makes the decision to proceed through the intersection while the vehicle traveling, traveling in, the, in the cross direction or the perpendicular direction has a green light and hits that user, who's at fault? It's not the person with the green light. And that's what this is trying to correct or try to make clear. Thank you. Ms. Bradley. Yeah, thanks. Um, I just want to kind of pull it up to the, the big picture briefly. I think, um, as I, you know, I'm not an expert in traffic laws, but as I understand it, some of the traffic laws are really um, addressing those, the kind of determining who's at fault, right? Like when there's, when there's an incident, um, how do we sort that out? Are there general principles that applied? And then other parts of the code are really um, big picture, like this idea of, um, you know, that a car should be yielding to vulnerable road users. And then if I'm on a bike that, that I could do more harm to a pedestrian because I'm on that bike, I'm moving faster. I have a, you know, metal piece of equipment that I'm sitting on. Um, and so those are the general principles. And again, I think, you know, Part of the intent of this ordinance overall, and I think this as well, is to make sure that we're being clear in our traffic laws, but also that we're starting to elevate and understand um, how how much more scrutiny we currently put on non-motorized users. Um, and I know there's a, a serious issue of things like victim blaming. Um, you know, that's that comes up every time there's a pedestrian death in this town, unfortunately. Um, and again, it's it's. There's always different circumstances, and so the law has to address sorting out who's at fault in those circumstances. But we also really do need to think about, um, are we treating um, people outside of cars equitably as those with cars, especially recognizing that when you're driving a vehicle, you have much greater potential to do harm. That doesn't mean that cars are bad. It means that um, there's extra responsibility because you can cause an extra amount of harm. So I'll speak from a procedural perspective. We have noted over here that both <clears throat> member Vaughn and member uh, Brawley actually spoke three times, which is slightly out of order, but that's my fault for not bringing it up. And often we will allow one last go. Ms. Alatel, you're at two, but because we've allowed the other two members to go a third, we'll also allow you the floor, but two times is how many bites you get at the apple generally. So please, you have the floor. Thanks. It's kind of hard when you have questions um, sometimes to get them answered and then get the opportunity to contemplate. Um, so I'm not going to support the amendment. I think the language as it is in the proposed ordinance is clear enough. I think these are all very fact-based determinations. We should leave it to APD to figure out who's at fault. Um, and only if APD is there likely at the collision would there be the need to invoke this provision. Um, so I think this um, amendment muddies that and um, actually kind of frankly um, calls out bicyclists in a way that um, we don't often call out motor vehicles or others. So um, I'm not going to support the amendment, but I appreciate everyone answering my questions. Thank you. I have myself in for one last comment, um, and it's kind of a question, but it's, I don't think it fits here, and it's not contemplated in the ordinance, I don't think, but I hear more complaints about this in my emails than traffic issues relatively, and that is, how, how are things like this going to affect travel on the, the trails, the trail system? You know, when you come around Westchester Lagoon and you're heading out towards Linary Park, bikes ride at 30 miles an hour and people are walking and kids with strollers and dogs walking and it's kind of a wild west of traffic out there. And so um, I don't know where that fits in all this. It might not be germane to this amendment, but um, probably something we talk about when we get past the amendment to the main motion. So um, if there's no one else on the amendment, we'll go ahead and vote. Members may proceed to vote. Mr. Myers on Amendment 8? No. Mr. Rivera? Yes. And the youth member? Yes. 
on a vote of five to six of the youth member voting yes, that amendment has failed to pass. So I have one last conforming amendment before we get to the main. Mr. Constant. Thank you. I'm stealing the clerk's documents, minor wreck. Um, so I would move constant amendment number seven. I ask for a second. Second. Moved by Mr. Constant, seconded by Mr. Voland. Thank you. And what this amendment does simply allows the clerk, is authorizes the clerk to make conforming amendments to Exhibit A of the ordinance to reflect the content of the pass and approved ordinance as amended. The Department of Law will forward this to the State of Alaska Commissioner of Public Safety this ordinance in its table of provisions and variants of Title 13 of the Alaska Administrative Code and Title 28 of the Alaska Statutes. Attached as Exhibit A. This just provides the clerk with the opportunity to clean up anything that is. Um, we might have kind of not caught along the way that's in conformance with the changes that have been proposed on the floor. So um, any, anyone wish to speak to that? Hearing and seeing none, members may proceed to vote on the amendment. Mr. Myers? Yes. Mr. Rivera? Yes. And the youth member? Yes. Thank you. And that amendment has passed on a vote of 11 to 0 with the youth member voting yes. Now we have the main motion before us. Mr. Vaughn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just want to say that I really appreciate the discussion on all of those amendments and, um, you know, Title IX, wow, it is uh, transportation speak, which is often very uh, convoluted and it, it's been a fun project to to dig in on and uh, once again just want to thank everyone who contributed uh, to your question earlier mr. chair on uh, multi-use pathways um, it, it's a really interesting question and in fact it's something that the co-sponsors and I actually did contemplate you know should we make as part of this ordinance establishing um, a, a speed limit on trails and um, maybe some call for some associated signage um, in the end we we opted not to include that here, but certainly is a project that I would be interested in, in exploring in the future. Thanks. Ms. Brawley. Yeah, thank you all. And I'll echo the thanks uh, to everybody, including members of the public and, and other members and um, everybody who really um, had helped us have a really good discussion about what it means to promote road safety in Anchorage. Um, and I will observe on the point of the uh, trails and, and I think just in general, um, you know, there's a place for uh, putting things in code, there's a place for enforcement. And then I keep thinking of my friend, um, she has such a great principle about use of the trails, but I think it also applies to our roads and that's just don't be a jerk face. So I just wanna call that out. Um, so certainly something we can't put in code, but I think it's important to remember that a lot of um, the way that we um, you know, live together as a society is that we self-enforce, right? That we um, are nice to our neighbors, we are courteous and we are mindful of how we can harm others. And so um, I think that principle is, is a good one to carry forward. Mr. Martinez. Thank you, Chair. I wanted to thank the sponsors for bringing this important conversation to our community. Road safety is critical. A um, couple of things I just wanted to highlight that uh, I hope that we continue to work on. Um, speeds on the trails, something that we do hear a lot about. Signal identification on trails, also that we, we hear a lot about as well. Uh, what that means is the signals, the sound of a bike uh, and closing in on. Again, back when we have an intergenerational aspiration of our city, of our community, of our trails, we need to really be thoughtful about uh, the way we all find our way on the road, and that definitely includes speed limits. Also things like uh, the sizes of e-bikes um, on our trailways as well. So uh, on, on that front, I just wanted to highlight we definitely need continued data, uh, checking for the equity questions that are persistent. We also need data to check on the efficacy of the changes that we're addressing today. And lastly, I want to say, all this is great, um, but don't push it with a F-150. You know, so at, at a certain point, you know, yes, the, the pedestrian may have the right of way. Um, but I, was, I grew up in a place where I remember saying, well, you have the right of way, but you don't have two tons on you. So you may want to consider that, so, you know, the jerk face, concept of, you know, kind of, we all got to get along out here also means that even if you know you have the right of way, be thoughtful to your safety beyond 
the right of way that you have. So I just wanted to encourage us. Education on all of these things matters critically. Ms. Bronco. I was just going to mention the education piece myself and um, also how important it is that the current laws that we have about bicyclists being able to be on a road is, is often misunderstood by automobile operators. And I had an email that someone says, uh, this is a big problem. This gives permission to a vulnerable user to drive the roadway that is reserved for motor vehicles. <laughs> and, and she goes on to talk about how we have hundreds of miles of separated walking paths that anyone not operating a motor vehicle should be using. So we need to educate people better so that they know that we all pay for the roads and that finding alternative means to move our bodies through this city is good for us all. Thank you. I actually replied to that same person, citing the state code that says bikes have every right to be on the road. So if there's nobody else on this item, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Myers? No. Mr. Rivera? Yes. Youth member? Yes. On a vote of nine to two with the youth member voting no, AO 2023-65S1 as amended has passed the body. Mr. Chair, just want to correct. I, I don't believe the youth member voted. Did you vote no? You did. Oh, you voted no. I'm sorry. I thought you said yes. You voted yes. Yeah, just for the record, I voted yes. Did I say no? You said no. I'm sorry. The youth member voted yes. Sorry about that. Thank you for catching that, Mr. Presvardia. Next item we have on the agenda is item 11D, AO 2023-42, an ordinance amending the R4A district in Anchorage Municipal Code, Title 21, Sections 21.04.020, Residential Zoning Districts. Way of reading. Thank you. Public hearing was closed, referred to the Community and Economic Development Committee. Action was postponed from 5923, amended and approved 523. 2023 notice of reconsideration given by Mr. Vaughn on May 24, 2023. Seconded by Chair Constant, reconsideration passed 6 6 2023, referred to the Planning Department. Action was postponed from 6 6 2023. So um, I don't believe there is a motion currently, um, and the intent is to postpone just one more meeting because the Fairview Community Council is set to hear from the Planning Department this Thursday. Moved to postpone to the meeting of August 22nd. Second. second. So moved by Ms. Zelatel. Who was the second? Uh, Mr. Martinez, second. And um, is there any discussion? Hearing seeing none, uh, members may proceed to vote. Motion to postpone to the 22nd. Mr. Myers. Yes. And the Mr. Rivera. Member. Oh, sorry. Yes. And the youth member. Yes. All right, so on a vote of 10 to 1 with the youth member voting yes, this item will be back before us on the 22nd. So there are no items in continued public hearings. And we'll move on to item 14A. Item 14A is, oh, excuse me, I'll start with reading about public hearings. For testimony on public hearing items, please direct your comments to the assembly or the chair. Please give your name and neighborhood at the start of your testimony. You'll have three minutes to testify. Unless you're with the community council or other recognized group, your comments must remain on topic of the matter before us and personal attacks are not appropriate. I may interrupt you if you do not follow these rules. For testimony and in addition, audience members are asked to avoid clapping or other disruptions during testimony. So with that, um, we will open the public hearing on... Oh. I didn't read it yet. So we now have before us item 14A, AO 2023-82, an ordinance of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly formally dedicating approximately eight acres of municipal land, commonly known as the upper bench, and shown as a buffer zone located with, 
within the property legally described supportive anchorage subdivision edition number two track j as municipal parkland subject to certain exceptions the public hearing on this item is now open anyone wish to be heard this item it'll have three minutes you can speak but you just turn the microphone on there there's a yellow bar green button there you go and um but again we'll try to stay on topic for this ordinance you have three minutes please okay. state your name and what part of town you're from well first one question i have because um i've been kind of silenced every time i talk because my voice projects loudly i get passionate i'm suffering some ptsd issues so it does uh, <clears throat> When I get triggered, also my voice gets squeaky, which is loud and annoying. And I've been told already by security, if I'm annoying, I can't talk. And other people also have been removed for getting passionate and annoying. So with that being said, within the law of what is defined as, is there, a, have we actually defined an acceptable level, like an octave level that yeah. I can go over that is not considered Disruptive. So we're having a public hearing on this item, and you're allowed to testify on this item. I just item. don't want to be silenced if I talk too loud. So I was just, first, before I do speak, your, I was wondering. Your time is moving, ma'am. Well, I have two minutes, so, I mean, this is a question and answer, right? No. Do, okay, ma'am, we're having a public hearing. You okay, have, I'll just wait for another time. All right, thank you. We have audience participation at the end, when you can talk about anything for three minutes. Anyone else wish to be heard on this item? Please state your name and what part of town you're from. You'll have three minutes. Legal name, Brian Witzke. I go by Bree with she and her pronouns. Now, we're constantly talking about our port. And as uh, our lands are progressing, more and more anchorage is being looked at as far as growth in more cargo. And anchorage is always constantly suffering about budget. Do we really need eight acres to be buffered? I think we need to make sure that we look into the future as far as it goes of what we absolutely need so that way we can make our port the most accessible to bring goods through and across so that way we can find ways of lowering our cost of our goods here locally as well as finding ways to be able to use our port to be able to to be able to make more money for Anchorage and to be able to provide more jobs that are of skilled labor to promote growth through our port to promote growth through our city as more and more that's going to happen, especially as our grounds across the northern Arctic changes. So as far as a buffer is needed, is eight acres really needed that much? Or is the ability to be able to have a larger port to be able to do more services more in favor? Weigh this both ways, look at it because it is talking about the future not only of our city but our port but our position in the global aspect. We don't have enough in that as is, so let's continue to look forward to that. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to be heard on this item? Anyone at all? Seeing, hearing none. Public hearing on this item is now closed. What's the will of the body? Move to approve. Second. All right, thank you. We have a motion and a second, and if I might. Mr. Constant. Thank you. So I apologize for the late addition of the AIM that was entered into the record today, but in it there is a PowerPoint presentation, effectively a PDF that was put together by the Government Hill Community Council last October. It details basically the last 100 years of the bluff lands and the, and the kind of neighborhood and its development in photographs. It also describes uh, how track J fits into a safety buffer that was created between the neighborhood and the port and J bear. It also describes kind of the geology of the area. And it also describes how there was a terrible brownfield site that was directly abutting the neighborhood. If you were to turn to the slide that says track J history from strategic military asset to EPA brownfield site. So basically for the last 30 years, residents of the Government Hill neighborhood have been fighting to have this land restored. Before, when I first moved to Alaska in 1997, you could go right to this fence that abuts residential properties and 
you could smell the off-gassing of petrochemicals and it permeated the neighborhood. Ted Stevens worked out a major appropriation and um, effectively shut down the tank farm and caused a major environmental rehab to occur. Over the course of the years, there's an approximately eight acre buffer that you can see on the last slide in the slide deck that basically demonstrates there is a small area in the neighborhood where there is an intended buffer between industrial uses that can occur on the rest of the Track J property, which are below the bluff, and then the residential housing that exists right there. And so this proposal is a fulfillment of a promise from a long time ago that the neighborhood has been working on for a very long time. Um, I would say that, and Mr. Rebuffo is here, if folks want to ask him about this process, because he and I are kind of fellow travelers on the journey. Um, there are some questions about legal title documents and what restrictions are on the land. There are some restrictions because the land was originally given to Jay Bear. Jay Bear deeded it back to the port, but put restrictions on it. And the restrictions were that the land has to be used either industrial or commercial, but it can't be really built on because it is a one of those cleanup sites where they just kind of buried it in place. And so any excavation could cause real problems, except for on certain rights of way and easements that have been allowed. And so the, the use designation that came back from the planning department dated October 12, 2021, establishes that the use that's proposed is in line with the underlying zoning and the restrictions that are in place because a park is allowed on I zoned properties, I-2 in particular, and they do also recommend a rezone process in the near future to go from I-2 to PR, and so that's a conversation should this pass we will be engaging in over the next months and years, and in honor of the port's efforts, if you look just to uh, the downslope of what the upper bluff lands are of Track J, that's reserved for the use of the port in some innovative energy projects like a solar farm and an energy, a resilient energy grid between the port and Jaber. And then also we have before us at our next meeting an approval of a um, telecom tower that's to go just directly below the bluff of this land with some potential uses. This dedication does not extinguish any easements that exist across the land. So the parks, uh, the park will be there, but the, the port and its industrial or commercial users can if it's proper and the assembly approves, use those lands. And so with that said, if we dedicate this land, you will have fulfilled the promise of a neighborhood that's been waiting for 35 plus years for this dedication to occur. Thank you, Mr. Constant. Mr. Volland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I was gonna say the exact same thing, you know, it is a historical promise long deferred and I hope that we can honor the work of uh, Senator Stevens. Um, I'll also just say, you know, we've been having a lot of conversations recently about land use, right, and zoning. And, um, you know, looking at that and how, what is the true purpose of zoning, right? Health, life, safety. And how do we use land use to protect quality of life and, and public health versus exclusionary zoning, right? Um, and I'll just say, Government Hill is a, it's a, community, beautiful community, historic community, um, but it is nearly surrounded by industrial uses. Um, noisy, right? Um, and I, I would just say having this extra buffer and a little bit more um, park area for residents to enjoy um, and to help improve that neighborhood, I think, I think is really important. And I hope that uh, going forward, we can, you know, potentially carve out more of these types of things in all of our districts um, that can be shared by neighborhoods while also um, being able to create more housing density. Thank you. Ms. Brawley. Yeah, thank you. And I really appreciate the context, um, including the information from the Community Council. Um, this is not a project that I'm personally familiar with, but as I'm listening to you describe it, um, and I was just looking at a map of Government Hill. Uh, so, so I happen to live in a, in a neighborhood or a district that's essentially has an airport surrounded by residential neighborhoods. And it strikes me that the neighborhood of Government Hill is almost the reverse, right? That it's um, a neighborhood um, put in the middle of, as, as um, both members said, um, industrial uses. And I'm also struck by the fact that it looks like there's two small parks. There's Sunset Park. 
Um, and then there's the uh, Suzanne Nightingale McKay Park um, and described as a playground, which both of which are very small. And so I think it's also important to think about um, equity of green space. And so one question that I had had is whether we could build housing on this land. And I understand there's a lot of reasons why we can't and that it would be uh, not, not good for residents there even if we did. Um, and so I also think that it's important that we uh, make sure that our neighborhoods do have access to green space where it's possible. So, so all of that to say, I very much support this and I also very very much appreciate the story behind it. Thank you. So I would just close then by saying, no, it's not nearly surrounded by industrial uses. It is completely <laughs> encircled. On one side, we have the port. Another side, we have the rail. And on the other side, we have J-Bear. And so we are completely surrounded by steel and, and petrochemicals. And so, um, but also we do have one park that you didn't mention. It's directly in front of my property, but it's, it's a, it's a, it's not really a park per se, it's like a green space next to a road. So anyhow, um, thank you to my peers for supporting this if you do, and if there's no one else, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Myers? Yes. Yeah. Mr. Rivera? Yes. Yeah. And the youth member? Yes. Thank you. On a vote of 11 to 0 with the youth member voting yes, AO 2023-82 has passed the body. And I need to take a minute. All right, now we have before us AO 2023-78, an ordinance of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly amending Anchorage Municipal Code Chapter 3.102, Municipal Use of Surveillance Technologies to Add a Requirement for Body-Worn Camera Policy. Um, the public hearing on this item is now open. Now open, welcome. Please state your name and what part of town you're from. You'll have three minutes. Real short, my name is Brian Witzke. I go by Bree, she and her pronouns. Um, I'm pretty sure we've all agreed that this would be a great thing. Uh, as, as the demonstration was tonight, uh, any footage and all footage of what our police are doing, good or bad, can be uh, worthwhile, it's weight and gold, um, for all sides. I thought we already had the funding for this. I thought we've already pretty much all agreed that we should have this, for this to keep coming back around. It makes me wonder when are we gonna move forward on this to get them instated, get it in use, all the other cities have it. Why don't we? Let's get it done. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Please, again, state your name. What part of town you're from? You'll have three Angela minutes. Butcher. Um, as far as this goes, uh, I have, we have fake cops here. I know a lot of them, the real cops, but I'm going to tell you, I've been all over the city and a bunch of the homeless camps, and they, um, they have police gear lots of police gear and they have police cars because we've been selling them the police cars without like making them not look like police cars uh and whittier they got <laughs> fake police cars also and fake police people and i've got multiple identifiers what's a real police and what's not there's certain things that you can tell and so our police force is actually like looking really really dumb right now which makes everybody look dumb. People are afraid of the police, but I actually think it's the fake police. And I don't really know where they came from. I kind of joke around that I should just get a police car and a badge and start picking people to jail, but I'm pretty sure I get in trouble for that. So I'm not gonna do that, but um, I think that we definitely need to have it recorded. Cause how do you determine if you were arrested or you did have a problem with a real police officer or a fake one? Because this should be public record. I mean, we should be able to access this, you know? If, and what happened? I mean, the guy today, I didn't even watch the news, but I'm telling you, 20 shots is kind of excessive. I feel like maybe one shot in the knee to disable him and then, and then cuff him. Maybe he could have saved his life. That is a brother and a mother. And, you know, I don't know. Maybe that was the fake police, too. Do you guys even know? I don't think anybody, I mean, I don't know because I didn't watch it, but... Yeah, if you guys don't do this, then it's idiotic and it's just, you can't mess up that bed on purpose or on accident. Like, I mean, if you don't, you're just, it's, 
yeah, so many people are going to die and it's going to be bad by, by the homeless criminals. <laughs> That's all I've got to say about that. Good luck. Anyone else? All right, welcome. Please state your name, what part of town you're from. You'll have three minutes. My name is Lincoln Swan. Esteemed assembly members, I don't need to explain to you the importance of body-worn cameras for the Anchorage Police Department. You have already made that decision. What is at issue now is what is the result of that decision. Now, I understand that this memorandum is intended to um, assign additional budget to APD. The question that I have for this body is what has happened to the funds already allotted for the body camera program? $4.8 million of taxpayer money, as I understand it. Point of order, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Zalatel. Thank you. I think the testifier might be speaking to a different item on the agenda, which is the appropriation for body-worn cameras, which was only for introduction tonight and actually set for public hearing on the 27th, or sorry, 22nd of August. Th this one relates to policies relates to policies. Yeah, not okay. I can also speak to that and I would like to speak on behalf of the community because I think it is of extreme concern that the body who is responsible for administering the laws for our community seems to not care about the decisions of this council. I cannot speak to their actual motivations. I always assume good motivations in general, but the appearance to the public is that this body made a decision and they are dragging their feet whether it's because of the local benevolent association, doesn't really matter to me. What matters to me is equal application of law. And that's a right that we have in this country. And I think that it's something that we should all take very, very seriously. And also, uh, Manager Kolhas, I look forward to your call back. I still wait for it. Thank you. Have a nice day. All right, welcome. Please state your name, what part of town you're from. You'll have three minutes. Uh, Skyler King String, downtown district. Um, there's a lot of really good arguments for why we should not this in code. I just wanted to specifically talk about the, it, it really struck me when reading through this one. Um, the federal government has issued a standard that says that we should no longer be utilizing shall in legislation, but rather must. Um, it's been caught up in a variety. You can go to, um, there's one of the .gov websites for the federal government has said that this is the new standard because a lot of issues get caught up in court based on whether or not shall is a instructive, permissive, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this one has 19 instances of shall. I would love to see this never have to go to court over whether or not something was necessary, uh, allowed, or obligated. Uh, that's really my largest one, but I do support this. Thank you. All right, thank you. Anyone else? If you're interested in speaking, queue on up, folks. Thank you. Welcome. Please state your name, what part of town you're from. You'll have three minutes. Yes. Good evening. My name is Liz Dean. I've been a constituent on this unceded land we know as Anchorage my whole life, since 1989. Um, I actually work for a local labor union, and we focus on safety. And I just wanted to highlight how ironic it is that our local police union and, you know, other unions that prioritize safety are not actually prioritizing the body cameras that as studies have shown, benefit both parties, both the wearer and the pers person stopped in traffic or whatever the crime may be. Also, just on the note that you guys were talking about earlier with bicycles, you know, how will they be accountable if they're stopping people on bikes? Because we know those people, people biking or say people in homeless camp camps may not own their own vehicle. So, you know, we need accountability across the board. We do need to represent communities all across the board, equity. Just want to really echo some of the things that were mentioned, but also where is the accountability? Would really love to see this move forward in a timely manner. And yeah, 4.8 million. Can't wait to see that on the next agenda. Thank you. Um, Mr. Turner, I think we have one person to call. Hello, Ms. Cohen. Uh, this is Christopher Concert with the Anchorage Assembly. We're taking public testimony on AO 2023-78, an ordinance amending the code relating to um, surveillance technologies and body-worn cameras. Uh, you signed up to speak. You'll have three minutes. Thank you. My name is Emily Cohen, C-O-H-E-N, and I live in Fairview. 
I'm testifying in support of purchasing body-worn cameras for our municipality's police officers. Uh, doing so would enhance safety for both law enforcement and the general public, as well as promote justice and accuracy in courts of law. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else wish to be heard on this item? Anyone at all? Seeing hearing none, public hearing on this item is now closed. What's the will of the body? Move to approve. Second. Move to postpone indefinitely. He didn't make it through the system, so. Second. So I kind of heard something, but I didn't hear it. I don't think it was recorded. So, um, but we can do it that way. Would you start over and into the microphone? I'll defer to the phone. Okay, Mr. Rivera. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, it is frustrating that I need to make this motion to move to postpone this ordinance indefinitely. But let me explain why. There's two primary reasons. So we have First a is motion. Mr. Rivera, hold on before you continue. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Moved by Mr. Rivera, seconded by Ms. Uh, Alatel. No, Mr. Rivera, sorry. Okay, thanks. Um, so uh, first of the, of the main two reasons why I am making this motion to postpone indefinitely is that we as the municipality of Anchorage writ large have an obligation to keep good labor relations. It, it is really important for us to do this for the financial sake of the municipality and for the, all the workers, the thousands of, of employees of the municipality. I, I think second, um, I think generally, I think we also have an obligation to keep us out of useless lawsuits. I fear that if we approved this ordinance today, it would one, significantly hurt labor relations and two, would cause a lawsuit to be filed before the ink is even dry. What this ordinance ought to do was really to make sure that we will always have body-worn cameras on officers, regardless of who the police chief is, him or her, or them. Also, sought to set minimum standards and put APD accountable to meeting those standards for what a policy for body-worn cameras should look like. In effect, the ordinance ignored the current policy that was uh, adopted earlier this year by both APD and the union and gave the various parties one year from that adoption to get it right. What do I mean by get it right? I don't, I don't think that the, the policy is wrong in most ways. I think it actually got many things right, but in particular, I think it got one thing wrong, and that is the provision around automatic release of footage under certain conditions. It is weak. It just is. But as I said at the work session last week, I'm going to be working with my co-sponsors to put forward a resolution to this body to directly address that and any other um, the particular issues in the policy which the co-sponsors and I believe are frankly weak. And I'm going to be honest, I don't have any faith that a resolution is going to have the teeth that I wanted and hope to have with this ordinance, but I think a resolution is the only realistic option to make any kind of statement on this issue as the Assembly. So I very much begrudgingly put this motion forward and encourage my uh, colleagues to vote yes. Thank you. Mr. Bond. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is tough, and it's something, you know, the, the community has long waited for body-worn cameras, and I agree with my co-sponsor that on the assembly, we, we do have um, a responsibility for good labor relations, but I also feel like we have a responsibility um, to uphold the will of Anchorage residents, of, of, of taxpayers. Um, I, I do want to, I guess, you know, at what point do we as policymakers, you know, say, 
this is a priority. This is something that's being um, drug out, and it, it's not fair to the public. And I, I think, you know, the the threat of a lawsuit that that gives me pause. I, I, under, I understand that. I understand, um, you know, that we need to be able to have um, good faith negotiations in our um, municipal dealings. Um, but I, I, I guess I want to ask um, Assembly Council, is this ordinance, do you feel legally defensible? That's my question. If I could have a moment, Mr. Chair, before I respond. Why don't we proceed through the queue and then we'll come back around. Mr. Martinez. Thank you, Chair. So as one of the co-sponsors of this, I, I want to start off with um, my, rec my, my starting point for all of this is I grew up in a place where I was the victim of illegal stop and frisk and the most egregious, worst police tactics that we see across the country. I grew up in Giuliani's New York. So when I first ran, when I first ran for office and I was at the um, endorsement meeting and, and the APD asked me, uh, APDEA asked me if, uh, if I had any questions. My question was, when are the body cams coming? So I wanted to establish that this is a priority for me. It's a priority for the community that, uh, that I come from and for all of the reasons that we talk about. But just let's be clear, this particular piece of, of, uh, of code that we drafted here does not, is, this is not the, the, the approval. Um, the voters approved the body, the, 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 the special levy. So the, the taxpayers are waiting for the appropriation and the contract. That's going to be taken up at our next meeting. So that's exciting that we are moving forward with the implementation. This particular piece of legislation sought to create a, a community standards and guidelines by which we would have the APD policy have some framework. We intend to continue to do that. We believe the methodology of capturing the, uh, the intent of the community guidelines and standards can be met with a resolution of this body that gives the ability for the labor questions to play themselves out on their appropriate term, it gives us the ability to see the timeline for implementation and the rollout as the, as the chief has described, and it also gives this body the ability to have a set of community guidelines that are out there in resolution form that can be taken up at a later date if we need to go deeper into codification, depending on the implementation and, uh, and, you know, and our confidence in the, in the implementation from our chief and from our department. And the most important thing that, that, that I wanted to just highlight that um, Assemblymember Rivera captured is that we are not proposing this from a vantage point of conflict. We are introducing, and we intended to introduce this idea, and when it comes back in its resolution form, we intended to introduce this as a, a guideline, uh, a support mechanism, so that the community can have a truly vetted process with not only the implementation, the funding, but also the operation and the, and the, the, the permanent, the, the, the public process of the release of the footage that we see. So, I hope that people recognize that even if we move forward on these proposed, the, the, the indefinite uh, postponement of this particular item, the intent, as Mr. Rivera mentioned, is for us to bring back the language in a very uh, clear way to provide community guidance for the department, letting them know that the public is alongside with a watchful eye and the oversight role that this assembly has to being able to make sure that the implementation and the execution of the will of the people with respect to body cams is followed. Thank you. So we're going to continue through the queue and then we'll come back to Mr. Wallen's question. So Ms. Zalatel. 
Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'm really sympathetic to the sponsors having been here once before. Back in 2020, um, I sought to codify the use of force policy into code, and that was met with backlash from all sectors. And there was a compromise set up, and it's in AR 2020-339, and it was a resolution of the assembly setting forth a process for reviewing Anchorage Police Department's policies and procedures. And a vital component of that resolution is the Public Safety Advisory Committee. Unfortunately, in the intervening years, the Public Safety Advisory Committee has been gutted it's not a representation of our community anymore. It's all former law enforcement. And while I appreciate the expertise, it also needs to be made up of individuals who have different perspectives on policing and how their um, particular communities and their lived experience interact with police. So um, I'm hoping we can still use that resolution and that process and that procedure um, as it comes to body-worn cameras work to make sure that those who are interested in how the policies and procedures of the police department um, are effectuated and how they affect the community, that we see more applicants for that commission so that we can round out that membership. And then the other thing I would say is I don't feel like the release of footage issue is quite dead yet. Um, because if you look at our records law as are in code, they haven't been updated in very long and how we release records and they really didn't contemplate video at the time. And so there may be the opportunity to update and find some way forward. It doesn't mean that there might not be exceptions um, for public safety reasons um, because of ongoing investigations, but I think we can do it in a way that doesn't have to fully jump into police operations, but it would be more overall an arching policy position of the municipality of how we might treat releasing video as a public record. So um, again, I'm really sympathetic to the sponsors having been here um, before, and I really do hope we can revisit that resolution and put that um, system in place and make sure it's robust. Thank you. Mr. Terrell. Yeah, it is unfortunate how long this has taken. And I, I think that finding that it is legally defensible, that this should absolutely be passed as quickly as possible. This will set a hard standard for the um, cameras and which will be beneficial for both sides, both those who believe they've been wronged and police officers who can, um, who've been falsely charged or, um, but uh, no, I think this is standards that'll set a guideline for how this will be set and should be passed as quickly as possible. So I have myself in the queue. Mr. Constant. Thank you. So I think the question of is it legally defensible is two steps further than the conversation should go. So there's a practical reality in the work that we do that the administration and labor negotiate terms of contracts and the assembly has an up or down vote. We agree or we don't agree. So that's the standard by which labor agreements are adopted. And what this does is effectively changes the terms of a negotiated agreement. So that may be fine and legal. That might meet the legal standard that we can defend in court. The problem is we would have to defend it in court, not because it's the right policy or the wrong policy, but because that's the nature of how negotiations happen between management and labor and then the assembly approves. And so effectively what happens if we pass this tonight, you, those who vote yes on this, will put the pause button on the implementation of body-worn cameras until that litigation is resolved. You, if you vote yes on this item tonight to adopt it, if you vote no on the postpone indefinitely, will change the terms and you will make it so that this process goes to binding arbitration because the police have binding arbitration in their contracts. And so when they find there is a principle that doesn't align with it, they can't strike. We've taken that right from them. And so effectively, this will go to an arbitrator. Now, we've been through the arbitrator conversation a number of times. 
they're booked up, you can't get one for six months if you're lucky, and then that process takes its own time. We have no control or say on that process. And so, if the goal is to get body-worn cameras on police as quickly as possible, the argument is stay out of it right now and let the body-worn cameras be purchased and implemented, and then let's fight over these details later, soon, once the cameras are on police officers. But if we insert ourselves right now, we will literally send this to court at our own discretion, and that discretion will stop the body-worn cameras until who knows when. So that's our choice tonight. Um, so, Mr. Martinez, then we'll finish the legal question for Mr. Vaughn. Mr. Martinez. Yes, thank you. And just to follow up on that point, uh, Chair, we had a work session on this last week, on this particular item, and uh, Mr. Rivera, who was the original, the, from my vantage point, the original co-sponsor, original sponsor, um, I think this, this started in the works prior to my coming onto the body. And I think Mr. Rivera articulated that well, that when he or when this was originally beginning to be drafted, the conversations had not advanced to purchasing, to contract, uh, to, uh, we were still talking about whether or not the city was going to go into arbitration and how long that would take. So we have advanced as a city further than when this was originally, when this was originally de de uh, developing, we've advanced to a place where implementation is imminent and because of that, uh, we think that that's a, this is the right position to move it into a resolution following along the work that uh, has already been established by this body to provide those guidelines moving forward. But we want implementation now as soon as possible, and we think this is the best way forward. Mr. Vond. You, I think you have Anna in the, oh. Oh, that's okay. Um, you had a question for the lawyers. Sure. I, I don't know if they're prepared to answer. I guess maybe I can just frame it again. I'm wondering, you know, I, I just, I don't want to let the threat of a lawsuit deter us as policymakers from making good policy. And to the chair's point about, um, you know, implementation, delaying implementation, I'm not sure that's entirely true. Um, given that this has an effective date of one year after passage, and it would be the APDA essentially, I guess, choosing to, uh, to hold that up. Um, but I guess my question is, if there were a, a, a lawsuit brought forward, um, what kind of grounds do you think we have? Do you, I mean... Uh, you know, we had Assembly Council help us draft this. Um, I guess I just, I, you know, I'm on the fence here, and I, I hear my co-sponsors wish to postpone indefinitely, and I, I think I'm there, but I think there's a point to be made about um, not backing down uh, out of fear um, when something has been stalled for so long. Point of order. I'm really, I don't know procedurally quite how to do this, but I'm really uncomfortable possibly giving the legal merits of what the position of the, on the public record. I just want that said, I don't know, I'm, I will hopefully chair, trust you and council to handle that, but that this is making me really nervous that this would be the kind of thing we would discuss in executive session usually. What are the legal merits of something? and what is our potential liability exposure? So, in order to rule on the point of order, I think I would defer to counsel. What are your thoughts on that question? Uh, it's a great question. Um, on the point of order, I would say asking for us to outline the actual legal merits of a potential claim and the potential defenses is something that would probably lay the foundation for an executive session as opposed to an answer in open court or an open session however that my intent was not to do that um if i can answer mr Ballin's question i think i can at this point the point of order will be ruled out of order and we will proceed to the question all right so within the self-created guide guardrails that we've just <laughs> discussed um 
it's it's really impossible to judge the merits of any lawsuit um, at the hypothetical stage, um, not knowing what the particular complaints would be or the particular th theories um, requesting legal relief. Um, so I can't go down that road of saying how strong we think a lawsuit could be against us. I do think we can safely say that this ordinance has been reviewed by the Assembly Council's office prior to submission. Um, we do not, we haven't identified any legal insufficiencies that we think the Assembly should be aware of or has failed to be discussed. Um, so on its face, this ordinance is a legal document um, and does not violate uh, any applicable law, I guess I was, is, is where I would put it. Go Thank ahead. you. I'd like to ask a follow-up. Does this ordinance effectively change the term of a labor agreement? I think it's fair to say it places requirements on the municipality that are in addition to what they have already agreed within the published regulations um, that we've seen. So it does put the municipality itself in a position of having a established labor agreement that says one thing and now requirements that have been placed on them by the municipal code. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Brawley. Yeah, thank you. And I, um, I learn a lot at every meeting, um, certainly since since the group of us started in, uh, three months ago. And um, this is a point that I, I find very um, helpful to understand. Um, and I think it is, I mean, as we know, this is a big issue that the community is facing. Um, and so it's, it's hard to say what the right answer is. But I guess one thing I've learned just as an observation is um, that there's many ways to achieve a goal um, and that the path especially in government, is not a linear path. There's so many factors. There's so many um, um, components, com you know, competing priorities, competing legal requirements. Um, as we've said, our, our requirement to uphold labor or um, to do right by labor, um, to honor those agreements um, and allow their ability to, to negotiate them, um, and also our, our requirement to uphold public safety and accountability. And so um, I guess all of that to say, it, it sounds like this is not necessarily a step backwards um, if this if this motion is postponed indefinitely. Um, and I really think that there are, there, there's many ways to continue holding accountability and to stay committed to achieving the goal of getting body-worn cameras on officers. So the motion before us is to postpone indefinitely. Does anyone else wish to speak to this item? Hearing and seeing none, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Myers? No. Mr. Rivera? Yes. Youth member? Yes. On a vote of eight to three with the youth member voting yes, AO 2023-78 has been postponed indefinitely. I don't think this is the last part of this conversation. Next, we have item 14C, AR 2023-221, resolution of the Anchorage Assembly approving a portion of the issuance of the Public Finance Authority Revenue Bond Series 2023 Aurora Integrated Oncology Foundation. For this item, the public hearing is now open. Anyone wish to speak to this item? Welcome. Name for the record and what part of town you're from. You'll have three minutes. My name is Kyle Milkey. I'm from Eagle River. I just wanted to echo the concerns that were brought up during the work session for this ordinance uh, regarding the uh, consolidation of uh, multiple uh, practices and having them combined under one unified body and the forces that could have on the market for these kinds of services. I also am very partial to these services remaining in effect and going into these uh, charity care type services. I appreciate that this is just a small step as stated by uh, people that were 
at the work session who are knowledgeable that this is just a small step in their process, but it has been seen time and time again that the consolidation of services under private courses for many of our different types of medical issuances have led to uh, monopolistic type practices and the uh, special case that we find ourselves in in Alaska where there is so few opportunities outside of flying to another state that our options are already very limited and you know I, I just echo those concerns but I appreciate that this is moving towards a charity care type system that it's also uh, <laughs> important to acknowledge that the use of many charity care type systems is gated behind much use of paperwork and the knowledge and the time to be able to correctly advocate for yourself for types of services. But I uh, am in support of this ordinance because it seems from everything that I heard in the work session that these are going to be moving forward in the best way possible. But I hope special attention is made as this moves forward through the other parts of the process that uh, attention is taken to ensure that this will not create undue pressure on the need for these services. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak on this ordinance? Anyone at all? Hearing and seeing none. The public hearing on this item is now open or closed. What's the will of the body? Move to approve. Moved by Ms. Zelotel. Second. Seconded by Mr. Presverdia. Thank you. So um, I have an amendment to make. Mr. Constant. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I would move constant amendment one. Moved by Mr. Constant. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Brawley. Mr. Constant. Thank you. The CFO uh, reached out to me with some concerns about the financing authority that's identified in the resolution uh, that the CFO's office is not willing to put the reputation of the municipality um, behind the public finance authority. And so we have this amendment which adds a section three that states nothing, oh, it's section three. I thought it was a whereas. It says nothing in this resolution shall be construed as creating for the municipality an affiliation with or endorsement of the public finance authority, its agents or financial products. What this language does is effectively just is explicitly clear that the municipality is not backing the financial agent. Anyone wish to discuss the matter? The amendment? Ms. Barley. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, this seems to be uh, useful language to just clarify the, I guess, the lack of relationship between the municipality and this um, this this deal that's moving forward, this transaction. Um, and and just to state from our work session, um, it was helpful for me to understand that the the request to the municipality and the requirement that we are fulfilling through this public hearing is um, to provide to provide a public hearing um, so that it can move through the process that is um, admittedly it sounds like several decades old at this point, but does require a public hearing from the local uh, governing authority. And so. The organization who's doing this has approached not just Anchorage, but other, um, basically the, the jurisdictions where these other places are. And so I think this just again clarifies, um, it really clarifies what we what we learned on Friday to be the case, which is that the Muni has a, you know, th this is the extent of our involvement in this item. Mr. Martinez, on the amendment. Yes, uh, Chair, just for clarification, on this amendment, you said you worked with the CFO on it. Is that accurate? Uh, the CFO brought some substantial concern about public finance authority, which is actually a corporation in Wisconsin that would be the financial agent that the nonprofit organization works with for issuance of the bond. So yes, I worked with the CFO. So just to just make sure I'm clear, the CFO, this is a acting green CFO. light for, for the acting CFO, thumbs up on this particular amendment. Mr. Thurn. Good evening. Um, yes, this is that something that I asked to, the, to, to be put here um, 
and created with uh, in consultation with the with legal tonight um, I, I can tell you that uh, within the last day or two I've had to educate myself on this a little bit and I felt that it was kind of important to come forward and not speak pro or against but just maybe provide some information and that's uh, what I wanted to try to do here tonight so um, uh, this organization actually approached the prior CFO several months ago with this request and they evaluated it with our bond council and the recommendation of that particular time was not to bring it forward um, from a TEFRA perspective. Um, obviously they have since gone directly to you uh, rather than through the administration. Um, one of the uh, issues that uh, came up at that particular point in time was this uh, financing authority um, and some of the challenges that they've had across the country and other financings that they did. Um, I feel very strongly, which is why I, I spoke with Mr. Constant earlier, that we want to make it very clear that the municipality has nothing to do with this particular company, nor do we ever want to have anything to do with this particular company. And I know you've all been told that this is not affecting our bond rating and all those kind of things, but when you approve this, or if you approve this, it's the municipality of Anchorage that is saying they're, they're, they're okay with this particular setup that's been, been put forward. And I, um, I just want to make it real clear, and that's what we were attempting to do on this particular um, thing, that that's not necessarily the case, that we don't want it to reflect negatively upon us um, with this organization that they're doing. Now, they're obviously going to sell these bonds in the, in, out in the marketplace um, to be able to find investors to be able to do that. And this entity is kind of putting those, that bond sale together uh, in order to be able to do that. But there have been some challenges across the country, and I'm just fearful of uh, any negative um, connotations to the municipality of Anchorage. So this was just an effort to try to make it even further clarified. Um, I think you've seen me before. I want to keep just beating the heck out of every single topic to make sure it's crystal clear. So that's why I would ask you to, uh, to support this particular item. Um, I also saw the work session, did not necessarily see an administrative viewpoint on this particular uh, discussion, so I wanted to be able to have an opportunity to kind of bring this forward. Just make sure everyone is, is clear what's happening here is that it's a, basically a leverage buyout. They're going to go out in the marketplace, get a lot of money, give it to the doctors who are currently here, and then those bonds will be paid off by future clients and Medicare and hospitals and insurance and all those kind of things. Um, I think the CFO and the bond council's decision several months ago when they looked at this is that at that point in time they had not seen any, any information that showed that the people were going to pay less <laughs> by, by this particular thing going forward. So as such, that's why they uh, declined to bring the, the TEFRA um, from the part of the administration forward. Now, I know you all had an hour meeting with them on, on, on work session and so forth, and maybe the, so there were some additional things that came up. But several months ago, that was the concern that the administration had at that point in time, was, was this a benefit to the municipality of Anchorage? They weren't, there were, there were not, there's no new construction going on, there's no taxable things that are happening. Uh, did, they, did, did they see that the, the, the people's rates were going to go down? All of those kind of things. And at that particular point, they, they, they didn't see that. And that's why the CFO at that time decided not to bring that forward. So I'm not here to, to tell you one way or the other, but I did want to at least have an opportunity to express some of the information that uh, I was able to find out over the last uh, day and a half here once this came up. I did watch the work session and so forth. I do feel very strongly about this. I did ask that this be, be put into place. So yes, I'm 100% I'm supportive of this particular language. Um, and then just wanted to provide maybe a little bit of historical connotation of, of, of what had happened on the administration side in the past with, re with regards to this specific topic. Mr. Martinez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Turner. So in, in, from my estimation, this adequately and effectively hits the CYA? I always like to do that, yes. Thank you, sir. I would do more if I could. <laughs> thank you. 
Anyone else on the amendment? Hearing and seeing none, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Myers? Yes. Mr. Rivera? Yes. Youth member? Yes. So on a vote of 11 to 0 with the youth member voting yes, the amendment has passed. Ms. Salatel? Thanks. Um, so I just, now I don't want to take exception, but um, I have a little bit of heartburn about what Mr. Thurn said about no benefit to the municipality. I understand maybe no construction benefit or something like that, but this is intended to provide for Medicaid providers, which are desperately needed in the municipality. Um, and so I, I just want to say that there is a benefit to the municipality in um, helping to facilitate this, which is to um, create this opportunity for um, care for those who need it. Um, right now, a lot of folks who need this type of care have to leave the state um, because there aren't enough Medicaid providers. Thank you. Mr. Salt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I do like the idea of a nonprofit entering this field. I, I think there's a lot of benefits there. I still have the same concerns I had during the work session that I feel that this is some sort of vehicle to allow the doctors to basically cash out of the practice uh, with a cheap financing mean and then have the ongoing nonprofit basically cash them out. And I'm, I'm not sure I've seen the evidence to show that um, I think for the one practice anchorage, 120 million is a fair and reasonable price. So I'll probably be opposed to this. Thank you. Ms. Bronga. When we were in the work session, I just had this uh, feeling that, you know, if something's too good to be true, I mean, I kept hearing I'm going to be an arm length participant, nobody's going to be making any money. And it made me uncomfortable, wondering really what's going on. Um, it, to me, you've got the same businesses putting a cloak on and getting this nonprofit status. And really, in the paperwork we saw, nothing was clearly written about the 5% charitable, how it would be um, doled out, how we would ensure they were really giving this charitable um, treatment. And then um, the, the state of art state of the art equipment came up a lot. If you go to any oncology office in Anchorage, it says state of the art equipment. So what equipment is this that's, that they're getting, that they're adding to their fleet that they didn't have before? Um, I'm under the understanding that Juno denied this group um, the same uh, deal, the same bond rating or the same backing, and I don't know why they denied it, but it would make me, I would want to know why. Um, and I also was concerned that the previous CFO was very concerned with this. And so for those reasons, I, I don't want to have anything to do with this. Ms. Brawley. Um, uh, yeah, I, this is raising, I guess, a question for me, um, and it's, I don't know if it would be for counsel or maybe Mr. Thurn, but essentially, um, I think I'm confused about what the municipality's role is in this, because I understand there may be questions about the operation, um, and, and, and again, I'm not speaking in, in favor or against this at this point, just trying to understand, um, be, beyond us having held a public hearing, um, and then recognizing that this is not, we're not participating in the financing of this in any way. I, I think I just have a, I just would like to have clarification about, um, about what, what is our lane essentially. So we have the, the chief executive for the organization here. You could ask her or you could ask council who's kind of reviewed this. I think that the documents are pretty clear that we don't have a role specifically. Mr. Thurn, I think just said, the role that we have is almost reputational. What happens if this thing goes wrong and we've said we bless it? And so I think that's the gist of the argument, plus the fact that there is some assertion that the funding agency is not one that the CFO would want to do business with. And so, but I would direct that question, if I were you, to Ms. Hinshaw. Yeah, then I think I would request Ms. Hinshaw to come up and 
provide some clarity, um, not so much on the operation of this facility, but again, specifically um, this item that's before us, which is um, action by the municipality or by the assembly. It's on, you just pull it down a little oh. so you talk right into it, there you go. Perfect, thank you so much. Uh, and through the chair, thank you for the question and your time this evening. My name is Sherry Hinshaw. I'm the CEO of the Aurora Integrated Oncology Foundation. Thank you for the time at the work session last week as well. I just um, wanted to clarify one thing that the only uh, public hearing that's been held so far is in, has been in Kenai and it did pass. Um, and Juno is scheduling the public hearing for later this month. Um, and it was a delay in some of their processes they're going through staffing changes. Um, the Aurora Integrated Oncology Foundation is uh, a 501c3 with Alaskan-based board members who are looking at um, purchasing for-profit centers and combining together to be able to create additional access to care. And so we have a, um, a committee of board members that are independent that are working with Bond Council and I have them on the phone to answer any specific questions. So they're the independent group which I'm not a part of um, because it's all independent Alaskan-based board members who are going through the process of working with Bond Council, the bond offering, um, and putting together the structure for that part. Um, the uh, foundation would launch with this, uh, with the approval of this transaction and purchase of the centers, and then follow our IRS 501c3 requirements through um, policies we've adopted around charity care, uh, grants, um, and uh, billing, and making sure that our services are made available regardless of ability to pay to all patients who need um, oncology services in Alaska. So uh, as we understand, um, we're not asking the municipality of Anchorage to issue conduit bonds. We are asking for the public hearing that you held, um, which does not in any way uh, hold um, the municipality to any liability um, from any state or federal agency. And that's been the guidance we've received. And the, as I understand it, the conversation that happened many months ago um, before I started in this role with the administration. So this is a federal technical process. Um, there are parties that are un, uh, part of the bond deal that go through due diligence around uh, asset valuation and arm's length transactions. And so they manage all of that process. Again, it's not uh, anyone related to the transaction in Alaska. So hopefully that answers your question. Thank you very much. I have myself in the queue. Point of order. Uh, Mr. Cross. I, I'm really trying to give her my attention and this Thank uh, you. young lady in the front, is, I'm, it's my ADHD, you can blame me, but I'm really struggling to focus on what she's saying. Nope, thank with you. With an individual being. Uh, so I, I will address her point you. of order. Um, is it? Ms. Butcher, is it possible you take the seat on the corner so you're not right in the center of the room, please? I have to actually go outside and take a break. I think okay, I thank you. It, it would be fine if you just moved off to the corner away from the dais, but um, all right, thank you. Sorry, and so I, your point of order is um, upheld. So now I have a question for Ms. Intra. Mr. Consul. Thank you. So. Um, I've known you a long time, for good and for ill, through the struggles of trying to figure out the homeless situation for the last 15 years. We've worked together on a lot of projects. Um, so I do have that bias, I guess, if you will. We don't work together now, haven't for years, but um, the kind of question was brought up, A, about the agency that you're seeking these bonds through, the Public Finance Authority, and some question about their ability to help you achieve your goals. And then there was also a question brought up about what happens if all this money is brought down and then these practices are purchased and everything falls apart, like doesn't work. And then the community is left with paying higher bills for healthcare. And so those are the two worst scenarios that were presented to me, a bad financial agency and the potential what are your thoughts on that? 
Sure, Mr. Chair, thank you for, for the opportunity to, <clears throat> sorry, to add more on that. One of the things with having four freestanding clinics is often providers are the only provider in that community, for instance, in Juneau. And so anytime he leaves town, finding other physicians to cover the practice um, is something that he has to do independently. Um, and so the whole purpose, that's one example in that the whole purpose of this is about long-term sustainability of cancer services in Alaska. And um, looking at technology, for example, uh, tattoos are, have been used until very recently to help with the imaging equipment on locating the area of the body to um, to effectively treat as much and leave as much healthy tissue out. Things like buying uh, the newest technology in body imaging eliminates the need to do tattoos to use as the anchor points, as, a, as an example. So we're looking at the long-term sustainability of access to care by creating, um, purchasing, uh, ability to purchase for four clinics instead of one, which gives a, which we've already determined is going to save millions of dollars in terms of the technology cost, um, creating a more sustainable uh, physician recruitment and retention, and the ability to share between clinics and in smaller uh, settings where a freestanding clinic um, has been on its own up until this point. So a stated purpose of this foundation is to address the financial toxicity to patients in terms of access to care. And uh, so really looking at how do we bring down the cost of care through these initiatives. And that was something we touched on a bit at the, at the work session in thinking long term about um, both synergies in how we're operating and in um, Everything that we do as a 501c3 has to pass IRS rules in terms of having fair market evaluation, fair market valuations. The, the rates that physicians are paid, for example, has to go through a fair market valuation process under uh, as a 501c3. So really looking at what we as an organization are paying uh, for and ensuring that that's fair market pricing, that we're serving the populations, that we're following all the IRS guidelines, that we um, keep those uh, dollars in Alaska, either in investment of services and in um, the sustainability of services is really the purpose here. So, so I'm gonna re kind of get a little closer to the question though. And maybe you have someone who's more closely associated with the financial piece sure. of this who could answer this more effectively. Um, and if you want to share the phone number with Mr. Turner, he can call them. Sure, I can have bond counsel because as was mentioned earlier, using this, uh, using the public finance authority as access to investors. And, and so they're in this for a, a short process is, of this. Is bond counsel connected to public finance authority? They're advising the foundation right. on. So they're not associated correct. directly with public. Okay, then I would be interested in hearing from them. Thank you. Hello there. This is Christopher Constant with the Anchorage Assembly. Who am I speaking with? <laughs> Sorry, I just, uh, yeah. hi, uh, apologies. This is uh, Les Cruzman with Orr Carrington Sutcliffe. I was just uh, getting my, uh, my headphones plugged in. I did not catch your name. I'm sorry, it came through pretty huh. messy. Yeah, Les Cruzman? Les? Yes, Les Crucian yes. with ORC. All right, thank you, Les. So the question that was raised to us by our financial office was, um, is this company that the bonds are being proposed to be issued through public finance authority 
uh, going to be sustainable, going to be able to manage this project? Are they an asset to, to the potential foundation? So there were pretty specific questions relating to that company. And the, the issue I think that the CFO is getting to is that if the assembly, if the municipality approves this resolution, we don't take on any financial liability, but in some ways we take on the reputational liability of having said, we bless this project and want to see it happen. What happens if it all comes tumbling down? And so I know that's kind of a big question and hard to answer probably, but I want to put that to your financial team bond council because we're doing our due diligence. Thank you. Yes. Yes, thank you for the question, and, and it's a good one. Uh, and, and so taking a, a step back, uh, the role of the public finance authority is a very limited role. They are serving as the conduit issuer uh, for this transaction, and so that has a, a particular meaning in the world of tax-exempt bonds. Uh, the, the, the role of the conduit issuer is to uh, provide for IRS purposes, the ability to issue tax-exempt bonds for non-governmental entities like 501c3s. So the, the, the public finance authority's role in this transaction is, is very, very limited. They are approving the issuance of the bonds. Uh, they're serving as the conduit issuer. But uh, once the bonds are issued, uh, they primarily are, not just primarily, they are effectively removed from the transaction. They assign all their rights and interests to the trustee uh, in favor of the bondholders. One follow-up question, then I'll proceed with the, with the conversation here. So the municipality of Anchorage has had a relationship with our bond council for like 75 years, longer than we've been a unified municipality. And so our bond council tells us this isn't necessarily a good idea. They haven't spoken directly to the assembly, but they did to the CFO. So. You are bond counsel for this new Aurora Oncology Center. Is it your advice to them that it is a good decision to work with the public finance authority for them? Yeah, yeah. Uh, from, from our perspective, it is. We uh, have worked with the public finance authority for, for transactions uh, in, in various states around the country, uh, and, and they've proven to be a, uh, a, a limited but a useful partner and a, a very helpful partner uh, in those transactions. So put simply, you're willing to put your company's reputation on that organization? We, we've worked with them a, a number of times. Uh, I am unaware of, of any particular issues that have come up with, uh, with the Public Finance Authority. So that wasn't a yes or no answer, and so I would hope for a yes or no answer, but I understand if that's difficult to do. The question being, would you put your reputation? Yes, we, we have no issue on, on that point. We've, and that was the point of the response, that we've, we've worked with them around, uh, around the country numerous times. We, we don't see any, any issue with them. That's a yes, I take it. Thank you. Okay. So yeah, it is indeed a yes. Thank you. Um, then I think that's the extent of my questions. I don't know if anyone else has any questions. Thank you. Hearing and seeing none, members may proceed to the motion to approve. Mr. Myers? No. Mr. Rivera? Yes. And the youth member? Yes. On a vote of eight to three with the youth member voting yes, AR 2023-221 has passed the body. Ms. Hinshaw, I would say to your foundation, go forth and be careful. All right, thank you. Next we have um, item 14D. Item 14D is AR 2023-233. A resolution of the municipality of Anchorage approving a master lease agreement schedule and appropriating amount not to exceed $800,000 of said loan proceeds to the Girdwood Fire Department 106000 and the appropriation of those funds to the Girdwood Fire Department Capital Improvement Project Fund 406800 and increasing the Girdwood Fire Department 2023 CIB by an amount not to exceed 800000 for the purpose of financing the acquisition of an engine pumper truck for the Girdwood Fire Department. The public hearing on this item is now open. Anyone wish to speak to this item? Anyone at all? 
Seeing, hearing none. Public hearing on this item is now closed. What's the will of the body? Move to approve. Moved Second. by Ms. Zalatol, seconded by Mr. Salt. Anyone wish to speak to this item? Hearing and seeing none, members may proceed to vote as soon as the clerk catches up. Mr. Myers? Yes. Yeah. Mr. Rivera? Yes. Yeah. And the youth member? Yes. All right, on a vote of 11 to 0 with the youth member voting yes. Um, that item has passed. Next, we have item 14E, AR 2023-239, a resolution of the municipality of Anchorage appropriating $4 million from the Eagle River Chugiak Parks and Recreation Operating Fund. Fund balance to the Eagle River Chugiak Parks and Recreation Operating Fund as a transfer and appropriating said transfer to the Eagle River Chugiak Parks and Recreation Improvement Projects Fund to pay for the cost of Chugiak pool improvements amending the 2023 capital improvement budget. Public hearing on this item is now open. Anyone wish to be heard on this item? Anyone at all? Seeing and hearing none. Public hearing on this item is now closed. What's the will of the body? Move to approve. Second. Moved by Mr. Cross, seconded by Ms. Zalatel. Anyone to speak to the item? Mr. Cross? Yeah, just for clarification, um, the line item that says it's an amendment to the budget, originally in the 20, in 2022, when we were establishing the 2023 CIP budget, we anticipated the pool improvements to be much less. But since then, we've uh, had some uh, startling revelations regarding the condition of Chuyak Pool. It has actually been shut down, will probably be shut down for two years while these repairs. So we had to amend the budget by uh, sidelining some other projects that we had budgeted for and allotting more towards the pool. Um, it's uh, going to take several years to get it back and operating, but it's the, uh, uh, a critical piece of infrastructure to not just our schools, but to uh, uh, obviously our park system. So thank you. Anyone else? Hearing and seeing none, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Myers? Yes. Mr. Rivera? Yes. Mr. Terrell? Yes. So on a vote of 11 to 0 with the youth member voting yes, error 2023-239 has passed the body. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Item 14F. Resolution AR 2023-241, a resolution appropriating $300,000 from the Glen Alps Service Area Fund, fund balance to the GASA Fund 2023 operating budget in the Maintenance and Operations Department for year-round road maintenance within the GASA. Public hearing on this item is now open. Anyone who should be heard on this item? Anyone at all? Public hearing on this item is now closed. What's the will of the body? Moved. Moved. Second. second. <laughs> Moved by Mr. Martinez, seconded by Ms. Zelatov. Oh, I'm sorry. Moved by Mr. Salt. Mr. Salt. And seconded, by me. seconded by Ms. Zelatov. Sorry, that was again in stereo. So, um, anyone wish to speak to this item? Hearing and seeing none, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Myers? Yes. Yeah. Mr. Rivera? Yes. Mr. Terrell? Yes. On a vote of 11 to 0 with the youth member voting yes, AR 2023-241 has passed the body. Next we have item 14G, AR 2023-242, resolution of the municipality of Anchorage reappropriating amount not to exceed $16,200,000 from emergency fund transfer contributions to federal emergency management agency reimbursements when tendered or unrestricted net equity and appropriating 800000 of FEMA reimbursements when tendered or unrestricted net equity, all within the Solid Waste Service Disposal Capital Improvement Projects Fund, Solid Waste Service Department for the Anchorage Regional Landfill Shop Warm Storage Administration Building Replacement and reducing prior appropriation transfers contributions from the Emergency Disaster Recovery Fund and amending the 2022 Capital Improvement Budget. Whew. Public hearing on this item is now open. Anyone wish to be heard, heard on this item? Anyone at all? Seeing and hearing none, public hearing on this item is now closed. What's will the body? Move to approve. Second. So, moved by Ms. Alatel, seconded by Mr. Salt. Anyone wish to discuss the item? Oh, wait, there's an amendment, isn't there? Ms. Alatel. Uh, 
I would move constant amendment number one. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. So moved by Ms. Alatel, seconded by Ms. Brawley. Thank you. Um, so this, um, as it explains in the amendment, corrects a reference to an emergency order ordinance that had previously been passed and clarifies the action in sections uh, three that rescinds the prior appropriations. Um, so it just, it's clean up on the cleanup uh, resolution before us. And this is to the credit of Mr. Gates, who has the sharpest of eyes and noticed some very, very fine details that were not in line. So, oh, and Ms. Camacho as well, our financial analyst. Um, it was amazing. I couldn't even understand it. But um, so is there anyone who wish to discuss the amendment? Hearing and seeing none, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Myers? Yes. Mr. Rivera? Yes. Mr. Terrell? Yes. On a vote of 11 to 0 with the youth member voting yes, the amendment has passed. Now we have the main motion. Ms. Zalatil. Thank you. Um, so um, we asked Mr. Thurn to be here if there were any questions about this one and the next item, but my understanding is this is really just to put money in the right buckets so that we can close out last year's budget. Um, so it's moving funds around so that the books are the way they need to be to finish closing out the year. So um, that works for me. That's just a lot of words to get there. All right. Anyone else? Hearing and seeing none, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Myers? Yes. Mr. Rivera? Yes. Mr. Terrell? Yes. On a vote of 11 to 0 with youth member voting yes, AR 2023-242 has, as amended, has passed the body. Next we have item 14H. AR 2023-244, a resolution of the municipality of Anchorage reappropriating an amount not to exceed 1,123,000 from emergency fund transfers to federal emergency management agency reimbursements when tendered or unrestricted net equity for the replacement of the petroleum oil lubricant terminal number two cathodic protection anode sled POL2 and appropriating not to exceed 5,950,000 of FEMA reimbursements when tendered or unrestricted net equity all within the Port of Alaska for repairs to the storm drainage system and wharf pilings from 2018 Point McKenzie Earthquake Capital Improvement Projects Fund. Wave reading. Thank you. So the public hearing on this item is now open. Anyone wish to be heard on this item? Anyone at all? Public hearing on this item is now closed. What's will the body? Move to approve. Moved by Ms. Alatel. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Brawley. Any discussion? Hearing and seeing none, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Myers? Yes. Mr. Rivera? Yes. Uh, Mr. Terrell? Yes. On a vote of 11 to 0 with the youth member voting yes, AR 2023-244 has passed the body. Next, we have item 14I, AR 2023-235, a resolution of the Anchorage, excuse me, a resolution approving the Heritage Land Bank 2023 Annual Work Program and 2024 to 28 five-year management plan. The public hearing on this item is now open. Welcome. Um, are you speaking on your own behalf or the council? The committee council. All right, you'll have five minutes. Please state your name and what part of town you're from. You should hand those to the clerk over here. Okay, thank you. Chair, members of the assembly. Uh, my name is Kathy Gleason. I'm currently acting president serving Turnigan Community Council and I'm, I am speaking on behalf of the council this evening. Um, on June 1st at our June meeting we did approve some uh, bullet comments that um, I put together on behalf of the council 
and, and then that gave me the liberty to go ahead and look more closely at the policies. Um, and that was those uh, comments and bullet points were passed unanimously. So um, we do this every year. We look the plan over to make sure that um, the parcels within our boundaries are being looked after. And um, as, as these are long-term positions that we have had with regard to supporting the acquisition of municipal entitlement lands that fall within our boundaries, um, the long-standing issue, and hopefully someday they can get to the city. Um, also, we support the transfer of HLB land parcel number 4-45, which HLB is um, proposing to do, um, the management of that to uh, the Parks Department. It's a small parcel east of Earthquake Park and west of Hood Creek, and I, um, it's the understanding there's kind of a trespassing or some kind of an issue, and I think it belongs in the Parks Department. Um, the parcels uh, with regard to um, the Nikiski pipeline, we just want to make sure that we're notified if there's any additional easements and pipeline activity that runs through these parcels west of the airport where near the coastal trail. And we also highly support the disposal of, or the, excuse me, the transfer of parcels 4-032, 4-033A through F, and 4 0 4034 to the Parks Department as these are also west of the airport where the coastal trail runs through and uh, have a, a not nice natural open space area green belt along the trail. Um, and those that's actually supported by um, the 2021 20, 20, comprehensive plan, 2020 comprehensive plan, excuse me, and the uh, West Anchorage District plan. Uh, also by the 2040 land use plan. And um, lastly, there's the handout is with regard to a closer look at the policies. And we always take a close look at um, public notice because in past years, nothing recent, there's been issues with public notice through HLB. And so if you'll notice on the first page of the handout under um, the draft plan, public notice and hearing procedures, it's a fairly short list, but it, unfortunately it's incomplete because if you look at the second page of the handout, that's from the actual municipal code and you consider that there's a lot more provisions with regard to public notice for um, public hearings and any kind of disposal proposal. So um, don't know if you really want to take all the language out of the code and insert it into this section of the draft plan, um, which is Appendix B, HLB policies. Um, but if you don't, if you don't want to get that overloaded with language, um, perhaps you can just uh, put something with reference with regard to the AMC uh, and just say, you know, these plus all of the um, items listed within code so that there's no ambiguity about how the HLB goes ahead and um, contacts the public with regard to um, any proposal that uh, is relevant to that. So with that, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. And uh, good luck with the rest of your meeting. Thank you, Ms. Gleason. <laughs> All right, anyone else wish to be heard? Welcome. Are you speaking on behalf of yourself or GBUS? On behalf of myself. All right. Thank you, Mr. Edgerton. Please state your name. What part of town you're from in the last three minutes? C certainly. My name is Mike Edgerton uh, from Girdwood. Um, I'm a, uh, one of the supervisors on GBUS, but I'm speaking on my own behalf. I was just uh, I was slightly late up here because I was reading proposed amendment one, so I'll speak to that briefly first. Um, I think the my understanding is this appears to be um, using very similar language to the original um, Holton Hills proposal, but I'm not sure if it's, if it's anticipating a very specific um, proposal or not. Uh, I would appreciate that if that was discussed later. Um, but I think in, in principle, it's, uh, while I'm not comfortable looking at it, it's, uh, it doesn't seem that terrible. But the thing I really <laughs> wanted to talk to was um, AR 2023-40. 
um, which was passed earlier this year in February. Uh, it directed or it requested that the administration directs HLB to do a number of steps. One of those is included in the plan, but others are not. Um, and specifically, if we look at uh, uh, AOAR 2023-40, um, in section three, um, it, require, it requests the, uh, the administration to direct HLB to look at um, appropriate ways to fund um, to provide financing mechanisms, that's not included in the work plan at all, um, as far as I can tell at least. Um, and in section one, it also, uh, it also directs or requests the administration to direct HLB uh, to add an objective um, in the five-year management plan and the 2023 annual work plan um, in conjunction with GBOS um, to uh, dispose of HLB parts, uh, parcels to qualified good with non-profits. And again, it's, it's indirectly mentioned um, the AR is only mentioned in the work plan in far, as far as the very first part of the requirement was, which is listing parcels. It doesn't, the work plan doesn't cover the subsequent tasks either. Um, there are a number of other comments which uh, I know GBOS made and other community members made which are included in the appendices. I think mostly they're responded to, perhaps not entirely, um, but uh, I know there's going to be another work plan along fairly soon. Um, hopefully at the beginning of next year, so maybe we can address those uh, more deeply then. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone at all? Hearing and seeing none, public hearing on this item is now closed. What's will the body? Move to approve. Second. Second. Moved by Ms. Zalatel, seconded by Ms. Bronga. Ms. Zalatel. Thank you. Um, I move Zalatel Amendment number one. Second. So I have a motion uh, uh, a motion to amend by Ms. Altel and a second by Mr. Volland. I think that um, you should read it and then I would like to make a brief disclosure. Um, sure. So the um, amendment's intention is to add the Holton Hills project back into the proposed um, HLB work plan. And so what it does is it takes the language from the prior um, HLB work plan that kicked off Holton Hills and mimics it um, as you and so I'll stop there before we get into discussion on it so um, Mr. Constant your disclosure yeah thank you um, when we previously dealt with this matter I had a working relationship with one of the companies associated with the the owner of the CY investments but not associated with the development company the 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 CY investments, I was in the referral brokerage, but since that time, and just for everybody who cares, I no longer have my license placed at any brokerage relating to um, this party. It's now at Coldwell Banker, completely unassociated, and I just wanted to make sure that's loud and clear in the record. Great. Thank you for the disclosure. Um, I don't find any conflict for you to be able to proceed. Thank you. The amendment is before us. Ms. Salatel. Thank you. So the um, so the, while the language is from the original um, HLB work plan and just mimics it, um, what the intention here is we have several pieces moving. One is for the RFP for the consultant to protect the municipal interest through the planned unit development process. Um, process. Once that um, consultant is identified, the intention by me is to bring um, the Holton Hills ladder versions back that had been through substantial amendment um, with that assurance that we had someone who could walk through and protect the municipal interest. So that is the intention of putting this back into the HLB work plan. Thank you. Anyone else? Hearing and seeing none, members may proceed to vote on the amendment. Mr. Myers? Yes. Mr. Rivera? Yes. <laughs> Mr. Terrell? Yes. On a vote of 11 to 0 with the youth member voting yes, that amendment has passed. We're back to the main motion. Bill, you still have the floor. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just wanted to address Mr. Edgington's comments about the resolution. Um, we've started to see some progress. We had a great presentation at an Enterprise and Utilities Oversight Committee meeting. Um, so 
my intention is to let that play out a little bit more with regard to the financing mechanisms and kind of get that into a more finished product and then work hopefully collaboratively with HLB to put it in the next work plan so it's a bit more of a refined product versus um, just a big smattering of information. Thank you. Anyone else? Hearing uh, Ms. Brawley. Yeah, just briefly, I wanted to respond to the um, um, the testimony requesting um, a change in the um, essentially in the plan itself. And my understanding is, um, I'm, well, I guess that's a question. Is in, not because I'm intending to move an amendment at this point. I just want to understand from council is um, is approval of this plan. Does that mean that that the assembly would be able to make um, line item amendments to it? I just don't know the answer. So I don't know if Ms. Gibney is here to answer that question. I don't know who might be able to answer that question. Uh, through the chair, I... Mr. Coyne. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, through the chair, I believe that Emma Gaboni is on the phone and is available to answer that question. All right. Ms. Gaboni, you there? Uh, we're checking. It might be on our end. Try again. Are you there, Ms. Gaboni? I'm here. Thank you. We can hear you. Would yes, you, this is Emma Gibney. Hi. Would you ask your question again, um, Ms. Raleigh? Yes, thank you. Um, my question is um, essentially procedural, and it's not making a recommendation to do so, but I'm wondering, as, as the Assembly has this before us to approve this plan, um, does that mean that the Assembly can basically edit this plan, amend it um, specifically? Yes, to the best of my understanding, that is how, um, that, yes, you can, you can add items or remove items as you see okay. fit. And that includes um, appendices? Yeah, um, is this regarding the policy? Um, well, yeah, and, and so I think that does answer my question. And then, um, mm -hmm. again, I'm not intending to move this, but um, I just didn't understand. Um, I know sometimes we simply accept documents and other times we actually make changes to them. Um, so I think that was that was my question, um, but I, I will can say, address the the oh. issue of the policy if you'd like. Yeah, if you would actually speak to the um, the question that was sure. raised about public notice, your policy. Sure. Um, so I follow all public hearing notice code. Policy is more above and beyond, and it lays it out in in more clear. Um, you know, commonly used terms. Um, we always follow public hearing notice. So whenever we have a, um, a, a, a action item, we have a public hearing um, notification where we mail it out to the either the 50 closest uh, landowners or everybody within 500 feet, whichever is more. We post notices on the land. We email to our um, standing mailing list, which includes community council. Um, so that's what's in code, and we do that for every single item. And for the for the work plan, it's a 45 day notice. Um, so we we did that for for the plan. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And I don't have a, a follow up question, but just a, a statement that um, that I, I know HLB. As discussed in the work session, is is um, interested in in maintaining and improving relations with uh, the communities or all the communities that are served, and so um, just flagging this area for um, consideration. Are there ways to, um, you know, ensure adequate public notice and maybe enhance public notice, and perhaps that's a discussion for another work plan or another the next year's work plan. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, or that conversation can happen any time in the year. We have. Plenty of time. All right. Anyone else wish to speak on this item? Okay. Hearing and seeing none, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Myers? Yes. Yeah. Mr. Rivera? Yes. Yeah. And Mr. Terrell? Yes. All right, on a vote of 11 to 0 with the youth member voting yes, AR 2022-235 as amended has passed the body. So the rest of our items are quasi-judicial, um, and they relate to items uh, 
in particular about liquor or marijuana licenses or special land use permits for alcohol and marijuana and these items are typically public hearing items and so next we will proceed item 15 a ar 2023-249 resolution of the anchorage municipal assembly stating its conditional protest regarding the renewal of beverage dispensary license number 758 with for d-a-w-g inc dba birchwood saloon we read it thank you the public hearing on this item is now open Anyone wish to speak to this item? Anyone at all? Seeing and hearing none, the public hearing on this item is now closed. Let's will the body. Move to approve. Second. Moved by Ms. Zalatel, seconded by Mr. Volland, was it? Mr. Salt. All right, anyone wish to discuss the item? I would just note for the clerk, there's a little scrivener's detail in the, in the title there, it's with four. Um, anyone hearing seeing none, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Myers? Yes. Mr. Rivera? Yes. I thought I did. On a vote of 11 to 0, AR 2023 249 has passed the body. Next, we have item 15B, AR 2023 250, a resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly stating its conditional protest regarding the renewal of beverage dispensary duplicate license number 4317. For Rock Dance Inc. DBA Eddie's Sports Bar. Point reading. Thank you. The public hearing on this item is now open. Anyone wish to be heard? Anyone at all? <laughs> Seeing and hearing none, the public hearing on this item is now closed. Let's will the body. Move to approve. Second. Moved by Mrs. Zalatel, seconded by Mr. Salt. Uh, anyone wish to speak to the item? Hearing and seeing none, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Myers? Yeah. Mr. Rivera? Yes. On a vote of 11 to 0, AR 2023-250 has passed the body. Next, we have item 15C, AR 2023-251, a resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly stating its conditional protest regarding the renewal of wholesale general license number 5041 for bills distributing DBA avalanche spirits. We're reading. Thank you. The public hearing on this item is now open. Anyone wish to be heard? Anyone at all? Seeing and hearing none, the public hearing on this item is now closed. Let's will the body. Move to approve. Moved by Second. Ms. Zalatel, seconded by Mr. Salt. Anyone wish to discuss the item? Hearing and seeing none, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Myers? Yes. Mr. Rivera? Yes. On a vote of 11 to 0. AR 23-251 has passed the body. Next we have item 15D, a resolution AR 2023-253, a resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly approving an alcohol special land use permit for the retail sale of alcohol with brewery license number 6135 for Ship Creek Brewing Company, LLC, DBA, Ship Creek Brewing. Wave reading. Thank you. Uh, the public hearing on this item is now open. Anyone wish to be heard on this item? Anyone at all? Seeing and hearing none, public hearing on this item is now closed. What's will the body? Move to approve. Second. Moved by Ms. Zalatel, seconded by Mr. Salt. Thank you. Anyone wish to speak to the item? Hearing and seeing none, members may proceed to vote. Mr. Myers? Yes. Mr. Rivera? Yes. On a vote of 11 to 0, AR 2023-253 has passed the body. That concludes our action agenda tonight. Next, we'll have audience participation. Welcome. Please state your name in the town you're from. You'll have three minutes. My name is Ron Oliva, a 49-year resident represented by all of you. Uh, I'm here to discuss the urgent concerns regarding the homeless encampments near the old native hospital site. And unfortunately, it's right above me to the west. To the east is the low barrier Brother Francis Shelter and Navigation Center. And to the south is Carlick Street, which is now lined on both sides with the most disgusting number of tents and I suggested upstairs a reusable dumpster 
Well, they stole the lids off of four dumpsters, put three up against the fence, and used one for a lid. So the constant thefts and seeing my stuff there, I can't go and get it back. And they will retaliate, and that leads me to a dangerous and precarious position. But the Midtown Community Council, and Felix is listening, had an attorney write a six-page letter. And it pointed out some of the issues that the Midtown businessmen face, but I faced it. I faced it ever since I've been next to the shelter. And there's multiple violations of not only just injustices, but specifically related to the Constitution on equal protection. If you protected and allocated large sums of money to protect the people near the Sullivan Arena, what have you done for me or the residents like couples or anything for anyone close to that huge encampment? So there's an equal protection clause and then we have a violation of our right to life and personal security. I want you all to take a tour and see if you can do business there. It's impossible. It's too big of a threat, such a threat with the recent gunshots, even a person in jail wasn't safe because he got hit by a stray bullet and they locked on the jail. So I'm here to ask you to buy my land, as promised, or at least make up the difference from part one so I can get out of there. It's just too dangerous and it's out of control. So I hope you're all receiving my e emails because I don't get a lot of answers. Thank you. I know there's a question out there that you're saving, but it's late in the evening. But does anyone have a question Thank or you, Mr. a concern Leva. for me and your, my family? Your, your time has expired. I'm sorry, Ron. Chris, my there. time will be up when I get killed on there. You got to do something. All right, Ron. There are two people behind you. Come down and visit. Take the tour of truth. All right. Welcome. Please state your name and what part of town you're from. You'll have three minutes. Irene Quitnow, West Anchorage. Um, I wanted to talk about the biking. Um, there's many people who drive cars who don't know how to share the road with the bikes, but there's also a lot of bikers who don't know how to safely bike, and they go by no loss whatsoever. Um, I had two situations since last assembly meeting where if I would not have driven def defensively, it would have been an accident because the bikers did not pay any attention to anything. They didn't look around. They were not, as far as I could tell, not intoxicated. They were going, you know, going straight. Anyway, so I am an advocate for bringing back driver's ed in high schools and bringing in biking education even younger than that because usually smaller kids I mean, biking, they start obviously much earlier. You know, that's a good life skill. Bring that back in the schools. Um, then I was, uh, you talked about bike lights, and I don't know why I never thought of that. So the bike lights that you have here are battery operated, which means if you want the safety on your bike, you need to be able to purchase the batteries. And if you forget to switch it off, which kids do, you know, then the batteries go dead. In Germany, any bike, other than dirt bikes, is sold with a front light and a back light. The front light is white and bigger, similar to a motorcycle, not, and then a back light. And then you have a little generator that's on the front and is on the bracket with a spring. And when it gets dark, the two lights are wired to the generator. You, you flip it to the tire, there's a little wheel, and with your biking, you power your lights. There's no batteries, anybody can do it. You know, it doesn't have any extra cost, so that's a cheap way to get everybody safe with lights. 
And then the helmets. Um, I'm in West Anchorage. There is a group, a Facebook group, which is nationwide. It's called Buy Nothing Anchorage in Sand Lake. It's a gifting community. There is our helmets being gifted. There's clothing being gifted. There are round robins going around. Um, you can get coffee makers. You can ask. You can give. We have given gifts to families that needed help with Christmas gifts. I'm just a member. I'm not a uh, like an admin or something. It's a wonderful group, and our group is very active. And um, so when the kids grow, and you know, they grow fast, and you, it gets out of size, then you ask for a different size, and somebody gives it to you. And then when they are done, you give it to the next person. It doesn't cost anything. Promote this stuff more. <laughs> it doesn't all have to cost anything. Thank you, Ms. Quino. All right, welcome. Please take Actually, oh, sorry, I'm in the queue. Mr. Vaughn. Okay. I have a question for you, Irene. Irene. Ms. Queen, no. Thank you. I, I actually uh, really appreciate that testimony. And if you could follow up on, a, on an email of a couple of those things, I would be happy to take a look at yeah. some of those ideas you discussed. Yeah. Thanks. All right, now welcome. Please take your name. We'll part of town here for my life. Three minutes. My name is Kyle Milkey. I'm from Eagle River. I, through the chair, I just want to commend the assembly on the passing of the ordinance 2023-65, the S version. Uh, it thrills me to see that we are making steps towards at least having the, you know, language and on top of that, you know, additional things that will hopefully make uh, biking in our community safer. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to uh, highlight something that had come to my attention just recently that, uh, the traffic engineering department has already done, uh, we're talking about safety. The traffic engineering department is in charge of doing safety surveys regarding traffic safety in many different parts of Anchorage, uh, but that in particular there's, I believe, three or four projects in my uh, district in Eagle River that have already had the research done, have already been found that they are unsafe to pedestrians and to all road users because of increased speeds, but that due to requirements of the particular Eagle River area that they are required to be funded either through state means or through uh, particular uh, bonds that are passed at a local level. And so as we're talking about safety, that there are some of these uh, studies that have already been done that have already been, you know, most of the work has already been done to show that these are unsafe areas that they are vitally important and that need to be addressed, but that there's that additional piece of work that needs to be done to fill those, fill those gaps. And so uh, in talking with people at the traffic engineering department that that advocacy is something that they were really hoping for. So just wanted to take a moment while we're talking about safety of road users that uh, highlighting that some of this work has already been done and just needs some additional help in terms of financing. So thank you. Welcome. Please state your name, what part of town you're from. You'll have three minutes. Yes, hi, my name is Brian Witzke. I go by Bree, she and her pronouns. Transgender for 13 years. Um, I'm here today not so much as for anything, just to remember that we can talk all the safety we want to as far as it goes, but we do need to look at other things, including the fact of as far as safety is resurfacing a lot of our neighborhood roads. There are way out of control. You can't even ride a bike, can barely drive a car, can barely even walk without people stumbling and falling. 75th in Petersburg is probably one of the worst I've seen. Right next to the, there's a business entrance to the uh, female correctional center over by Leroy's restaurant. I kid you not, you need a four-wheel drive to make it through there in the summertime, let alone the wintertime. Moving into the wintertime aspects, what is the city assembly or the, also the mayor's office looking into doing to making sure that we don't have the same issue that we had last year? As an Alaskan for going on 27 years, I can tell you this one. If we do not stay on top of our maintenance as far as our roads go, on top of everything else like that, there's no amount of safety that you guys can change laws on to be able to keep us safe. I'm driving cab now, and that puts me out on the road, and I'm going to tell you, at least 13 times every 20 minutes, I'm dodging something that's going to take my life. So as far as safety goes, not only is it road conditions, but it's also making sure that our police officers are available, which we're short, to make sure everybody on the road is safe. Because without consequences, as you spoke earlier, without consequences, they're never going to change. 
we have motorcyclists that are doing 100 miles an hour. We have cars that are doing 90 miles an hour in areas that are marked 35 and 45. No cops to stop them. I encourage you guys to continue to find ways to be able to get us cops out here so that way we can save our streets from death experiences. Not only for bicyclers, but also motorists. If we cannot get our people to maintain our roads as the snow falls this year, we are going to fall into the same predicament. As well as already this summer, I guarantee you, if you travel around Anchorage, we have grass that is above my head. How are you going to see the traffic coming? When are we going to take those steps to make sure that safety is there, not only for the bicyclers, which I'm not saying is not, but I'm a driver. People in my car are my responsibility, but if I can't see around a corner, that puts me out in the middle of the street. So I asked the mayor to talk with me. Four times I've put a request. Well, we know where he's at. He's not here. So I leave it upon you assembly people to encourage that we find more funding for more police, to get them out on the street as fast as possible so that way we can be safe. The other thing I ask the assembly is, is a united front to talk to our city and uh, state, no, sorry, not a city, our state politicians so that way we can get stronger laws on fentanyl. You guys talk about the homeless situation. I've talked about the homeless situation. 4,500. And like I said in the beginning of the year, we're going to lose over 300 this year. We are well in moving into that direction. The fentanyl is a big problem. I can't even use a restroom after 7 o'clock at night in this town. You guys want to talk about safety and sanitation? We all have to use the restroom. Perfect place to end. Um, welcome. Please state your name. What part of town you're from? You'll have three minutes. Uh, yeah, thank you. My name is Gabe Shaddy Farnsworth, and I live in Spinard. Um, I just wanted to first, uh, I, I'm representative uh, with the Carpenters Union and uh, recording secretary with Carpenters Local 1281. Uh, I wanted to thank this body for all the work they've done so far and the work they'll continue to do to move forward with the Port of Alaska Modernization Project and um, just recognize the members that we have and out of both Pile Drivers Local 20, 2520 and Carpenters Local 1281 that are down there doing the work at the Port of Alaska Administration Building and also in uh, the sheet pile and all the other repair work that's required and going to be continued to be done um, in the years to come to get our port back and running for the entire state. Um, and I wanted to just go on record expressing my desire to um, have an opportunity to be a part of the tour that may take place with members of this body as well as the administration and the uh, congressional delegation and Transportation Secretary Buttigieg um, when they come next Tuesday and uh, uh, be able to continue to advocate for the, the need that we have in this state for and in this town for continued investment in workforce development if we're going to continue to if we're going to have be able to take advantage of um, the opportunity that this state has is for the next five to ten years with looking at all of the uh, the construction um, money that will be pouring into this state and uh, just want to be a voice that continues to advocate for us to do all we can to take advantage of this really unprecedented economic opportunity that we have here in the city and the state. So um, appreciate the time. Thank you, Mr. Farnsworth. Anyone else? Hearing and seeing none, we'll move on to the final part of our agenda. Member comments. We'll start with Mr. Myers on the phone. No additional comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. Thank you, Chair. I have a couple of uh, things to just mention. First, this week on August 11th, 1973, a DJ from uh, Jamaican heritage named Cool Herc organized the first block party that is now known as the start of the culture of hip hop. And uh, so this, is, this year, hip hop is celebrating its 50th anniversary. And as a former U.S. cultural envoy and hip hop ambassador for the United States of America, I'm thrilled about that. Uh, I also intend to celebrate uh, 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 Hip Hop History Month in November with other folks in the community. But again, this week is the uh, official celebration of the start of the first block party in the South Bronx. Secondly, I want to offer, offer some uh, free advice to the administration 
as the only current member of the assembly who was a candidate for mayor in 2021 and who has more who has had more time in the executive branch than the current mayor and most of the top political appointees at this point i have a unique vantage point and i appreciate the chair at the beginning of the meeting uh, helping to set the record straight my word of encouragement is to the administration specifically to the mayor Live up to the promise of the professionals who stayed to help the city move forward, despite the, what I call buffoonery, that we all saw over the last couple of years. Do not squander this opportunity to work with is what essentially a new assembly by going out there in the public and framing things with the partisan game playing that does not need to be any part of this body. I want to remind the administration that the spirit of the work here, as this is a nonpartisan body, is about the stewardship for what's best for the people of the city of Anchorage. Now, we may disagree, but we can do it with dignity. But do not mistake diplomacy and bridge building for weakness from this assembly at all. And lastly, I want to just say, that um, the issues tonight that we discussed are real issues. And not just theoretical pie in the sky. So when we're talking about road safety, we're talking about our lives. When we're talking about education and driver's education, I have my 14-year-old who's on bikes, but he's looking for a permit. So I recognize that the challenges that this assembly deals with each and every day often seem thick with jargon and on paper, hard to digest. But at the end of the day, we are dealing with things that affect the quality of life for ourselves, our families, and our community. And I appreciate the work that this body does. And I'm looking forward to continuing in that spirit of nonpartisan progress for Anchorage. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. Next, uh, Mr. Rivera. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No comment. Thank you, Ms. Bronga. I wanted to speak tonight for a constituent, Lottie Michael, who um, has Malaspina Trailer Court on, uh, next to Willowa Park. It's a small park that had some playground equipment donated by Home Depot. She paid and used her heavy equipment to put in the playground equipment. She paid for staff to plant the grass for the park. And she called me and uh, talked about how the park is full of um, people experiencing homelessness, needles everywhere, defecation on the ground, and un it's unable to be used by the trailer park children that um, it was intended for. And each meeting that we come to that we don't get closer to figuring out what to do with our parks that we've invested so much in, makes me very frustrated and sad. Thank you, Ms. Zolotel. Thank you, just in response to the public comment at the end, the road to um, safety improvements and road projects is very long. We first study it, then we find money to design it, and then we find money to possibly construct it, often in phases. So the studies are the first part, so be heartened, and then hopefully we can find the rest. Thanks. Mr. Cross. Nothing to report, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bond. No report, thank you. Ms. Brawley. Yeah, very briefly, I just wanted to give a shout out to our traffic engineer, Brad Coy. I know he is not here because uh, it's late um, anymore, but he was here earlier today. And to thank him and his staff for the bike tour that we did um, on Monday, so just yesterday, of the Turnigan and Spinard neighborhoods. Um, so it was a chance to really look on the ground at issues that I know had come up in the community over the years. Um, you know, narrow roads, um, tricky intersections, all these, all these issues that we've been bringing up. And so it was really a chance to um, get out there, have a really nice bike ride uh, right before all of, all of the rain um, and so I would really encourage members to consider doing something similar in your area because it's a really great way to illustrate um, the issues that your constituents are facing. Thank you Mr. Salt. No comment. Mr. Presverdia. Thank you Mr. Chair. No comment this evening. Right. My only comment will be thank you to the members of the administration who are despite all political pushes stewarding the city towards its future. With that I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. We're adjourned.